Yeah. Okay, the time is now 1.29 on uh, June 6, 2023. Welcome to the 1 p.m. board meeting of the Los Angeles Unified School District Board of Education. I'm going to take roll. Dr. McKenna. Here. Dr. Rivas. Mr. Schmorlson. Present. Mr. Melboyne. Here. Ms. Gonez. Ms. Ortiz Franklin. Present. Board President Goldberg. Here. Student Member Shin. Here. Okay. All right. Today's Pledge of Allegiance is brought to us by the students of Adelaide Elias and Joseph Heredia from Parmalee Elementary School under the leadership of Principal Lisa Saldivar from Board District 7. Would you all rise and join us? Hi, my name is Adelaide Elias from Parmalee Avenue Elementary School. Hi, my name is Joseph Heredia from Parmalee Avenue Elementary School. Please stand, put your right hand over your heart. Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Yo prometo lealtad a la bandera de los Estados Unidos de América y a la República que representa una nación ante Dios indivisible con libertad y justicia para todos. Well, welcome to our first, are you ready for this? Four board meetings in June. That's because budget and LCAP, and we're just, if you just plan to be here every Tuesday, we'll welcome you all and come join us. Uh, this is Pride Month in June, and I want to visit, say happy Pride Month. And I was just, just a few days ago, I found out about a book I had never seen. You know, I have a, a son who graduated from LA Unified. I have a great nephew, three, two great nieces who have now graduated from LA Unified. Well, we still got five more great nieces and nephews in LA Unified schools. So it's very important to me as their great aunt or their grandmother, oh, I have two grandchildren in our LAUSD schools. I left them out, oh my God. <laughs> so it's very important to me that we make everyone, all our kids feel safe and reg well regarded. And I was at a school the other day and they had a book called The Big Book of Families that I had never seen before. So I thought I'd share just some of it with you today. In honor of Pride Month, but also in honor of loving family. Once upon a time, most families and books looked like this. One daddy, one mommy, one little boy, one little girl, one dog, and one cat. But in real life, families come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. In this book, there are lots of families living in different ways. Perhaps there's one that looks like you, and they have nice illustrations. Excuse me. Lots of children live with their mommy and daddy, but all, lots of others live with just their daddy or just their mommy. Some live with their grandma and grandpa. Some children have two mommies and two daddies. And some are adopted or live with foster families. Who's in your family? Some people have lots of brothers and sisters and uncles and aunties and cousins and grandmas and grandpas and even great grandmas and great grandpas. But some people have really small families. You can be a family with just two people. The next section in the book is called homes. People live in all sorts of homes. Some families live in big houses and some big families live in tiny apartments and some people can't find anywhere to live. Most children, next section is school. Most children go to school, but some are homeschooled and some just won't go to school. But I've been to school already, I went yesterday, she said. Others are too young to go to school. Jobs. In some families, everyone has a job. In others, only one person goes to work, some parents work from home, and some can't get a job at all. The next section is about holidays. Some families go on exotic vacations and some stay closer to home. 
Some visit families in other countries and you don't need to pack everything and others go on day trips. Not all families can afford a vacation, but most people get some time off from work. Even a weekend at home can be a little vacation. Food. Some moms or dads are great cooks. Others prefer to buy ready-made meals. Most families get their meals from shops or markets, but some grow on their own. Clothes. Some children get new clothes. Others have hand-me-downs or others clothes from thrift stores. Some families dress up for special occasions, but some like to wear jeans all the time. And some wear dress, some dress any way they please. Pets. Some pets believe their pets are members of the family. That would be us. Some pets think they're very important members of the families. That would be my cat. Some people even look like their pets. Some families can't have pets, but it doesn't stop them from dreaming. There's ways for every family maybe to have some sort of pet. Celebrations. Birthdays are fun, but some families make more of a fuss about them than others. And then there's Christmas, Diwali, Eid, Hanukkah, weddings, christenings, Kwanzaa, bar and bat mitzvahs, Chinese, New Year. Well, you know, you, whenever you celebrate in your family, there are usually some special traditions. Hobbies. In some families, everyone has the same hobby. In others, everyone likes doing different things. Feelings. In some families, everyone shares their feelings. Other people are more shy, or perhaps they just like to keep their feelings to themselves. Sometimes not everyone in the family feels the same way about things, and feelings can change quickly. Have you ever tried to make a family treat? Sometimes you don't have to go back far to find bits of family who've come from other countries. Or if your mom and dad lives with a new partner, you might have to make a whole new set of branches. And then they show them making a family tree. Some families can be big, small, happy, sad, rich, poor, loud, quiet, mad, good-tempered, worried, or happy-go-lucky. But most families are all of these things some of the time. What's yours like today? And that's the entire book. Isn't that a great book? I recommend it to you. If you haven't got it in your library, go find it for yourself. Um, to labor partners, and the first one we have is uh, Franny Parrish from CSEA. Come forward. Miss me? <laughs> I knew you did. You know what? Um, <laughs> building connections, inspiring lives. I even wore my new. You know, we always got some kind of a new uh, phrase, right? This is an old one. But then, you know, the last time I was here for Classified School Employee Week, I made a suggestion, Superintendent, that you buy a cup of coffee and a donut for our people here in the building. I did, didn't I? Well, little did I know that you would take my suggestion and you would up the ante. I don't know how many of you know here what he did. And he served everybody who came down here in the building who are classified members. Uh, and he serves them LAUSD coffee cake and a cup of coffee. There was a lineup. Let's give him, come on. Come on, give him a round of applause. Take a bow. You did it. I, I was, I got pictures from people in the building. There was a lineup all the way up the stairs, all the way around. I heard, uh, I heard you were back there. Uh-huh. Yeah, you were out there serving coffee. Cup, and you were out there uh, serving um, coffee cake and coffee. Uh, and there was a lineup to the elevators and uh, hundreds of classified employees waited for an opportunity to be served a bit of appreciation. And you really deserve that. And I thank you, thank you for the bottom of my heart. Um, and to that end, I'm hoping that if you listen to a suggestion, and it was just a suggestion, that you might listen to something that has become the bane of my or our existence. And Mr. Melvoin, you're going to have to put up with this. Flexibility in the budget. Last year, when I was busy trying to keep the doctors from killing me, I didn't notice what was in the budget development. 
but yet this year it reared its ugly head. Historical knowledge can be good or bad depending on where you sit. CSEA has watched as the number of positions on the flexibility list has fluctuated since 2008 when the list was first created to what it is now. Now on page six, it states, six hour library aides will be allocated in 13027. And then in smaller prints it says, fully flexible with the COSIS approval. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute, didn't we just allocate 25 million for new books, computers, and scanners? Well, who's going to be then there to order, to facilitate, and take care of all this? That didn't make any sense. That's a contradiction in terms, kind of like uh, Army intelligence, isn't it? Now, library, then on page 7, it says library positions in program 13027 that were reduced to three hours in 2223 will be reinstated back to six hours in 23-24. Now what makes you think that they are available or even want to come back to the same school? Think about that. Are they really gonna, who's going to be, who's watching? Who's paying attention to that? Are they really going to come back? No. Now, and then it says on page 15, any flexibility over positions will be implemented uh, for one school year only. Really? Only one year. Now, if you're checking your email, maybe you might be listening to that. Who's going to actually go back and check to see whether they're going to be uh, making sure that they put that money back in the position? Budget items, and I love that. Libraries are an item, not even a person. Not even a person. And there are items there. Building and grounds workers, well, they, they need approval. Well, nobody's going to give you approval from that from m and But I do not understand why is it that library aides, after all these years of eliminating, kind of like the weatherman does that thing where he goes and moves everything around, why is it that after all these years and all of my coming down here and fighting and fighting and fighting for library aides, that this is the only position, only position in the budget that is fully flexible? Why? Not one person from down in budget can tell me. Why? I mean, it does not make any sense. Why is it that people who continuously go into the libraries after elongated closures and are expected to perform miracles like Harry Potter or Tinkerbell and expected to shovel out the rat and vermin droppings, dust that only a backhoe could move with a hazmat suit on, and boxes on boxes of built-up junk that everyone has dumped there only to have no security in the next year because the principal likes the room so much now that they want to turn it into something else and want the money? Did any of you know especially those of you in budget. Did any of you know when you make this decision, and I want this clear, that the California Ed Code states that the library is to be open during the course of the school day as long as there are students on campus? Did any of you know that? Are you clear on that? That's what the Ed Code says. And yet you're saying that it's fully flexible and you can just push it aside and dump the position. Oh, but you can bring it back next year. Well, who's watching? Who's watching the hen house? It's the fox. Did any of you even wonder why in 21-22 there were 150 empty positions in library aides? Oh, we, oh, we did better this past year. There were only 109, but a lot of those are leaving because there's no security. They keep asking me. I know, you want me to speed it up. Well. Uh, there's no, we keep building these connections and then you want us to move it on. Well, the funding of this position is chump change in the scheme, scheme of things. And if literacy is so important, why are you so focused on denying all these schools access to all the investment we just made in literature? Why? And about the office checks, they're also on this list. 
The money for those, once you reach above the norm, the schools can keep the money and not hire the second OT. At, who's going to answer the phones? It's more work for the one person. That's not flexibility, it's cruelty. In 2009, when we laid off the majority of the people, and one of the people who was on this board was asked by Connie Moreno why our union was taking the largest number of hits. And she says, oh, well, somebody's got to take the hit. Might as well be CSEA. We have never recovered from that. And the majority of office techs that were in those schools, all of the schools, were cut in half, more than half. They are doing the work of more people. And yet, you're sitting there putting them on this flexibility list as well. This is cruelty. This is not being a partner. And lastly, I, ha I know you have the budget is next week. I cannot come down here. I have too much work to do. The library refresh money. I know this isn't a CSEA issue, but I know that the schools had since late January 2022 to spend the money. And Mr. Atienza, I don't know if you're listening. There were a lot of problems a lot of problems with getting this money spent correctly. There were supply chain issues with our vendors. There was no training whatsoever for our library aides or for the schools except what I personally set up. What I did, nobody else, the library aid. Even with all of that and all the missteps and the principals who didn't understand, we still have at least one, uh, we have a million dollars left on the table at the schools. A million dollars. That's going to be swept back up. You guys don't need the money in the budget. You do not need to sweep it back in. Find a way to do a Hail Mary pass and leave it with the schools at least until October. Give them that money. One of the schools, not more than two blocks from here, has $113,000 that has not been spent for whatever reason. They need those books. The school has got a lot of poor kids in it. I am begging you to do a Hail Mary pass for that school and for the rest of the schools that have not been able to get their act together and let them finish spending that money. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we will hear from Gloria Martinez from United Teachers Los Angeles. Good afternoon. Um, happy Pride Month, everybody. So I am here and I will be reading because there was a lot of heart that was put into the statement we're about to make on behalf of our 35,000 members, the students we serve and the communities we work in. So we're proud to stand in solidarity with pride um, and um, residents with our members of the LGBTQ, LGBTQ plus community this Pride Month and all throughout the year. We are standing shoulder to shoulder with our LGBTQ plus siblings because not only is it the right thing to do, but because as a social justice union, it is our foundation. We have queer trans members. We teach queer trans students. We have queer trans family members and we are allies and we are accomplices. The fight to ensure the safety and the well-being of our LGBTQ plus community cannot be separated of who we are. An injury to one of our LGBTQ plus siblings is an injury to all of us. This is an especially dangerous time to be queer and or trans in this country. While we might pride ourselves on our diversity and progressive politics in this city, our city is not immune from the horrible displays of homophobia, transphobia, and hatred. In the, folk, in the face of rising fascism, our schools must be sanctuaries for educators, students, parents, and community members. No educator, regardless of their sexual orientation, their gender or gender pres uh, presentation, should have to live in fear of who they are. No student should have to fear for their physical, emotional health at school just because they are trans or gay. 
No student should be told that their family is inappropriate or should not be discussed openly because they have queer or trans parents. Our public schools are places where the world becomes bigger and are celebrated for it. It is where educators instill compassion and tolerance and their students and where the community comes together on even ground. We must fight to protect that. We must fight to protect academic freedom so educators and students can learn about our complicated world and can open their eyes and their hearts. We must fight to ensure that every single member of the LGBT plus community feels safe, cherished, and loved within our schools. So to all our organizers, all our leaders, and organizations doing this work, please know that UTLA is ready to work with you and alongside with you. We want to build power in defense of our LGBT plus community. To the leaders of the district and civic leaders across the city, we are here to prepare to be partners and work together to ensure the safety and well-being of our members, of our students, and all the people that call Los Angeles their home. Now, I also want to say a few words about an important item that will be, um, one important item that was won during our recent contract negotiations. And that's PSWs. Now, we all say that mental health, the mental well-being of our students is important. So I just want to share with you a little bit about our, what our PSWs are currently facing. And I also want to address the reassignments within our school mental health. First, none of the 75 allocate, reallocated positions work out of this building. They don't work out of Beaudry. In fact, our mental health consultants are under school-based programs, and they are each assigned to 10 or more schools that they need to support. Without the CC and S, there is no plan for the clinical supervision of the 264 PSWs who are still earning their licensure. How is LAUSD going to recruit more PSWs without providing the supervision that is necessary? If the so-called, by the way, some of you called it a form letter, but if the so-called form letter that some of you have received via email, I want to let you know that it is incorrect to call it as much. In fact, what our PSWs shared are personal experiences and narratives shared by PSWs and other stakeholders warning about the impact of these dangerous changes. This is a liability. This will harm our students. This will make it difficult for the district to recruit PSWs. This is not the solution. And this is a recipe for disaster. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I see uh, Mr. Neri Pius from AALA, but he does not wish to speak. OK. Uh, now we will come to committee reports. And first, we will hear from the Innovations Committee from uh, Board Member Ortiz Franklin. Thanks, Ms. Goldberg. Um, was glad to have Dr. Rios and Mr. Melboin with us. We look at innovative solutions to persistent challenges, this time talking about our hiring processes, which we have heard uh, for many years now how we can uh, lose candidates sometimes to how long things take to uh, get passed through the district. Um, so we heard from some great partners, some uh, solutions that the IAU and um, HR and the Personnel Commission will be looking at and sharing back with us, first by examining our data, how long does it actually take us to process folks, um, exploring some uh, new ideas even like AI and looking through resumes or uh, quick interviewing processes. Um, and I think one of the biggest takeaways was really about being proactive and customer uh, service oriented as we walk folks through our big bureaucratic system. So we'll be having some takeaways and next steps for the team to consider for next year and just appreciate our HR and our PC team um, for constantly trying to be innovative and being willing to learn from partners across the country this time. We had folks outside of California and that was nice to hear from. So uh, we'll see where things go next semester, but we have wrapped up our innovation committee this year. Thanks for the opportunity, Ms. Goldberg. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Mr. Nick Melvoin on facilities and procurement. 
Thank you, Ms. Goldberg. Um, last Tuesday, the Facilities and Procurement Committee had our second and final meeting of the year. We heard an overview from Ms. Stengel on the role of the Inspector General's Office, um, and she reviewed a recent report regarding the district's cost estimators, including her recommendations uh, to streamline two different units. We then discussed and reached consensus as a committee on a few recommendations about facilities that came up during our first meeting. I've shared those with the superintendent and Ms. Goldberg, and they include one, reviewing and revising project phasing policies to identify ways to speed up projects, including consideration of temporary student relocation and use of previously checked or PC structures. Two, reviewing and revising practices and policies that impact construction costs, which might include purchasing items off of California multiple award schedules, the CMAS, utilizing separate state and federal buying contracts to facilitate expediting projects and certainty on contract price, utilizing owner purchased contractor installed whenever practical, and advocating to increase the minimum dollar threshold for a DSA or Division of State Architect review of a project. Three, uh, reviewing current and possible revenue options that can be utilized for facilities, e.g. state and local grants or developer fees. And finally, determining how to increase the funding allocation above the statutorily required 3% for maintenance and operations. Those are the four um, uh, recommendations the committee made, uh, and we expect to hear back on those items from the superintendent and his team at a committee meeting in the fall. We also heard last week from the procurement office, which provided an overview of the procurement process. I do recommend everyone review the slide deck that was prepared for that. It explains concepts you hear at our board meetings like best value, lowest bid, uh, informally competed, uh, et cetera. Uh, Ms. Reese uh, also did a deeper dive on best value procurement, one of those procurement mechanisms, uh, and on upcoming changes to procurement that promise to reduce costs to schools, take work, work off of principal's plates, and provide better products to students. So we look forward to hearing updates on these processes and on other topics when we, we, when we reconvene in the fall. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I'll call on myself as chair of the Curriculum and Instruction Committee. The topic discussed at our May 25th meeting was the gift of my multilingualism, dual language and world language program. What the committee learned was is that there are over 97 languages besides English spoken in LAUSD. We offered world language courses in 13 different languages and dual language programs in seven languages. There will be 230 dual language programs in LAUSD in the 23-24 school year. Languages including Arabic, Armenian, French, Japanese, Korean, Mandarin, and Spanish. But Russian's gonna be added in the school year 25-26. Dual language students receive recognition along the path of multilingual journey, promise of bilingualism, universal TK gets that, and kindergarten gets that. Elementary pathways to biliteracy is awarded in grades five or six. Middle school pathway to biliteracy in grade eight. And then the LAUSD and California Department of Education seal of biliteracy in grade 12. Dual language programs are promoted in many ways, including through the United Enrollment uh, site. Ford Boulevard Elementary in Board District 2 received the 2023 CABE, that's the California Association of Bilingual Education, Seal of Excellence. It is the first LAUSD program to be recognized with this prestigious award for exemplary dual language and emergent bilingual programs. Various schools performed spoken word, musical, and dance. It was quite an excellent meeting. And I thank uh, my colleague uh, Ortiz Franklin for co-chairing that meeting because my granddaughter was giving her final presentation at her elementary school and I had to leave early. Okay, so our final meeting of the year, June 15th was canceled because of the four board meetings that we're going to have every week. We figured people would probably be busy enough taking care of what has to be done before June 30th. All right, that takes care of that. Next, we come to something which, you know, we, we, we love and we hate, and that is recognizing people who've been with the district a long time and who are leaving us. I don't know why anybody would leave us, but there you go, they're leaving us. Some of them think they're ready to retire. I don't get that myself personally, but I understand. <laughs> How 
However, I want to say, I want to say that these folks that you're about to meet, if you don't know them already, are really stars and heroes themselves. And so I'm going to turn this over to our superintendent uh, so that we can recognize some wonderful people who are retiring. And after that, we will go to the consent calendar. Thank you, Jackie. Before we go to the consent calendar, uh, I want to announce the last Family and Community Engagement Committee meeting will be tomorrow, June the 7th, 5 o'clock, right here. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I didn't have that on No problem. Schedule. No problem. Thank you very much, Madam President. Uh, indeed, it is both a happy day for those who are beginning yet again a fantastic journey, uh, but it's a sad day for all of us, uh, for we recognize the talent, the time, and the treasure that they brought not only to our community of learners, but to all of Los Angeles Unified. What I will do is I, I will actually briefly introduce, introduce each one of the retirees, and as I'm speaking about you, please come to the front and then we will bring uh, the celebratory toys and trinkets that you will leave here with today. You know, you will leave with a piece of paper recognizing the great work with beautiful words signed by our board president, our board members, and myself. And obviously, you will leave with something that anytime you have the urge to celebrate LUSD, you may pull on it and make as much noise as you wish. First, remarkable leader, Esther Solomon. Esther has been uh, with our district for over 30 years. Uh, she began in 1993 as an English teacher. She is our esteemed link learning administrator as well as career and technical education. Esther, thank you so much for the remarkable work you've done. Bennett? After 30 years, you can use more thank than 30 words. Thank you very words. much. <laughs> So it has been an honor and a privilege to teach and work with the students of LAUSD, they're pretty spectacular, to also work with teachers and administrators in LAD, LAUSD, to work with uh, the team that I got to work with in CTE and Link Learning, to work with DOI and our leader, Fran. Dr. Baez has been amazing, and it's just been a really great time, and I have a quick David Tukovsky. I'm gonna live in LA, and I promise not to be a David Tukovsky continually, but a moment of David Tukovsky. And that is, I'd like to advocate for our CTE teachers to become uh, credentialed in the same kind of way our teachers who are single subject. And I would also like to advocate we are preparing our students for college and career. I'd love to see that career part. I'd love to see our students in the past they've required. They had a requirement to take a CTE class. We should be looking at and, and preparing our students for careers. So thank you very much, and we'll see you around. Don't go away. Don't go far away. We got stuff Mr. Carvalho, let me just mention that Esther and I worked together at Virgil Junior High School many, many, many moons ago. Yes. Congratulations, Esther. And you're better for it, right? <laughs> I am. There you Thank go. you. Uh, next up, um, so number one, Esther, uh, we heard from uh, career and technical education teachers this morning. This is something that resonates strongly with us. We're going to advocate uh, in Sacramento. We're going to do what's right. Next, uh, Karen Ryback. And um, Karen began with LUSD in 1982 as a bilingual classroom teacher uh, at Heliotrope Avenue Elementary School. So after 41 years, uh, Karen is leaving us. You know her more recently as the executive director of federal and state education programs. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. I just wanted to say I've enjoyed every day that I've worked here, and um, my only regret is not to see this through, this to st your strategic plan, but know that I will be cheering from the sidelines for sure. Thank you. Karen, next. 
As someone whose heart uh, certainly competes with her mind in every decision that she has to make when it comes to kids in our school system, particularly the most vulnerable. Of course, I'm speaking about Pia Escudero. was one of the very first people I met uh, when I arrived in LAUSD on a field trip with uh, board member Schmerlson. And uh, she is dedicated, as I said, her passion and compassion uh, are unmatched. She's leaving us as the executive director of the Division of Student Health and Human Services. And in a very noble and able way, she served our district for 32 years. Yeah. Pia. Thank you. My colleague, Ileana, said she's not speaking, but I'm going to speak also for her. <laughs> a Cuban never quiets down. Um, this is family. I truly love so many of you here in the shoe, behind me, in the schools. Uh, I have met many of you board members and leaders in good times and in really difficult times. I cannot tell you how much it's in my DNA, that passion and the heart, because our children are the future. And I know that um, we're all here for a purpose. I'm so proud uh, of my legacy. Eliana and I were uh, at Florence Avenue Elementary, I believe early 19, well, it was during the civil unrest. She was a kindergarten teacher, best dressed teacher, and I was a PSW. Um, and we survived a very difficult moment for our community. But one of the proudest things I, I'm walking away with is how SHHS, every individual that works for us, has not stopped 24 seven to serve and meet the needs of our children and has become an integral part of the educational team. When I started in, in school mental health and SHHS, people didn't know what a PSW was. They didn't know what school mental health or behavior health and now we are part of whatever success is in the classroom, it's because our staff are there to lift and protect children. So I thank you. I give you a tremendous um, grace for the work that you do. And I will be continue to be a pushy angel from outside. I'm gonna be pushing and supporting you and making sure we lift our children and our families who often get forgotten in the political system. So thank you. Thank you, Pia. Next up, uh, someone who is retiring from LUSD after 20 years of dedicated service. First, uh, beginning as an administrative analyst in uh, MNO technical unit. She held a number of other uh, positions, including senior contract, administration manager, deputy director of facilities, director of procurement. She's leaving us as uh, the chief procurement officer. Of course, I'm speaking of none other than Judith Reese. <laughs> Judith. Thank you. Um, I have enjoyed working with everybody. Um, it's been uh, a, a great journey and uh, it's, I appreciate all the support that I've had from all the divisions, from the board, from the superintendent's office. It's been a good, good journey, thank you. And uh, I'm going out to play. <laughs> so some organizations have, uh, you know, Bob the Builder, we had Mark the Maker. Um, Here's someone uh, who's retiring after 20 years of remarkable service to LAUSD. I cannot think of someone across the country who built more uh, in the space of education than Mark Hovatter. He came to us as a senior resident construction engineer. He was the director of facilities planning and development. He was the director of facilities maintenance and operations. He's leaving us uh, as our chief facilities executive a position uh, that uh, he's been in over the past 11 years. I have to say that um, I almost begged, since I started as superintendent, it was one of the very first conversations and Mark told me he was retiring. 
And um, I didn't take it personally, but I did beg him to stay a little longer. And then he stayed a little longer yet, but his dedication to family, to his kids is strong. We appreciate you, Mark. I heard right before this meeting started that now that he's retiring, he's, he'll stop giving himself haircuts. <laughs> Mark, our Chief Facilities Executive, thank you. Thank you. You know, we, we've all heard that if you can do what you love, you never have to work a day in your life. Those jobs are kind of hard to find. It's kind of hard to find a job where you love every single thing about your job. And, this may be a surprise, but there's some things I didn't like about this job. <laughs> Explaining to the parents who just raised $10,000 they can't build that $100,000 shade structure. I, I don't like committees. I don't like board meetings. <laughs> but uh, I tried to take the approach of don't uh, d do what you love, but love what you do. And, and that's my whole attitude, and that sums me up. I, I love every part of this job, even the things I hate, and hopefully it's reflected and it's rubbed off, and I'm the luckiest man in the world because I've got the best job in the world. No one could have a better job. Thank you for letting me be part of it. And Madam President, I did say at one point to Mark and to the Cabinet that it's not within my power, but uh, we, we should name something after Mark. Um, I, I cannot think of another leader across the country, and I know many, that has built as much as what Mark has done in this district. So once again, thank you, Mark, for all that you've done. Uh, and now, a heartbreak personally for me, because this is someone um, who could really be like family. You know, I met her when I arrived, but she always has a snarky remark a criticism, she has natural debonair, natural intellect, and is as ethical as the day is long, and never sugarcoats anything. And um, I put a big challenge uh, ahead of her when I arrived. I said, you know, I want every single classroom in LAUSD, however we get there, uh, staff with a credential teacher. Let's worry about everything else after that, let's at least deliver that. She did it. And then she did more than that. She led an absolute renaissance of recruiting and hiring into LAUSD with over 2,300 teachers hired just over the past year. Putting us in a position where we will open next year with every single classroom staffed with a certificated professional. This is someone who's retiring after 34 years in a district. She was an elementary school teacher. She was a school site coordinator, an assistant principal, uh, an instructional director, a, direct, a principal, director of professional learning, learning and leadership development, deputy chief human resources officer. And she's leaving us and leaving me as our chief human resources officer, Ileana Davalos. Secret. I, thank you, thank you. I do want to be remembered as someone that does sugarcoat messages. Come on now. So thank you. It's been an incredible, incredible, incredible journey. Sorry. Um, I have sat in many seats, so um, it was interesting that I ended up in HR. Um, I came to this country when I was five. I didn't speak English, and I learned to speak English here. So thank you for that Los Angeles Unified School District. And thank you for allowing me to serve students, staffs, and families. And yes, boss, you gave me a very hard time. I think the last things were uh, Cuban. I leave Cubans. Cubans don't leave me. <laughs> now there's a first time for everything. Sure. <laughs> Madam President and members of the board, on behalf of a caring community of educators, the entire LAUSD community, to Esther, Karen, Pia, Judith, Mark, and Ileana, a grateful, grateful heart 
elated over your accomplishments. And in this moment, we celebrate you, not only for who you are, but for the legacy you've built and leave behind. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Behind here for you. <laughs> we're gonna name all the shade structures after Mark. That's what they're gonna be called. Uh, let me get more.
For those of you watching at home, there is a little bit of a hubbub as people who came here to congratulate the people they're working with are seeing them out of the room. So we're gonna give them a little time to get moved out and then we'll continue with the meeting in about five minutes or less. Mr. Superintendent, we are uh, waiting for you to come on. Oh, there he is. Hello, sir. Mr. Superintendent, I think you have another recognition you'd like to make. Ladies and gentlemen, I know it's been a hubbub, but let's have some quiet, please. Thank you. We're resuming. I know it's been some hubbub. We'll Wait a second. We have another presentation, Mr. Superintendent. We do. Uh, we like to recognize extraordinary individuals who really step it up and in the process, not only educate our children, but some actually save their lives or the lives of our colleagues at LUSD. I'd like to welcome uh, up Mark Hovatter, who we just recognized, as well as our chief, uh, our chief facilities executive, as well as uh, Chief Zipperman our chief of uh, LESPD for a special recognition of um, three facilities and m and employees and five LESPD employees who collectively were involved in a life-saving endeavor to an LUSD facilities electrician on March 23rd of this year. Before I turn it over to these gentlemen, I wanted to take the opportunity to highlight the importance of uh, automated external defibrillators, better known as AEDs. AEDs are readily available in all of our school sites. Many schools, in fact, have several of these depending on the size of the school. But they're also available in all work sites, including Beaudry. An AED is very easy to use. Anyone can operate it in a life-saving situation. Much like a GPS system, an AED gives step-by-step -step instructions so you can provide life-saving treatment. Our ADs are managed by a number of vendors along with our nursing team to ensure that all of them are up to date and functioning. Now for the heroic feat and life-saving timely action, Chief Zipperman. Well, good afternoon, Superintendent Carvalho, Madam Board President, Honorable Board Members. First of all, let me say how heartwarming it is to see us celebrate all of the employees that just served so many, so many years in this district, that we continue to celebrate the amazing work that our employees do. I'm humbled and honored to celebrate MNO and some school police officers who did save a life on March the 23rd. I'd like to read a little bit about uh, what occurred and then we will recognize them. At approximately 10.20 a.m. on the morning of March 23, 2023, four M&O electricians were performing electrical work to a panel on the second floor of the Beaudry building. M&O worker Rodrigo Martinez observed his coworker on the ladder 
working on the electrical panel and suddenly became stiff and shaking, recognizing signs of a possible electrocution. Mr. Martinez quickly grabbed a hold of the victim, kicked the ladder away, and placed the victim on the floor. Mr. Martinez noticed the victim was not breathing and non-responsive and yelled to his colleagues, David Medina and Frankie Tornado, both of MNO, to get help and call 911 as Mr. Martinez began a life-saving CPR measures. LA School Police Department personnel assigned to the second floor of Beaudry Command Center became aware of the medical emergency and the adjacent room where the MNO workers were working while additional LASPD officers who were working nearby also responded. Sergeant Leonard Bowen and Safety Officer Sergeant Robert Albert immediately left the command center and made their way to the location where they came across the MNO electrician, Mr. Martinez, performing CPR to the unconscious victim. Sergeant Bowen retrieved a nearby automated external defibrillator, AED, and over the course of the next seven to 10 minutes, Sergeant Bowen, police officers Rami Alawar, Sergio Salas, David Yamas, and Armando Rodriguez, who relieved Mr. Martinez on the CPR functions, worked as a team with the AD, AED in switching positions, performing chest compressions, and breathing to the down victim. Just prior to the paramedic's arrival, the victim began breathing, but semi-conscious. The victim was transported to a local hospital where he was treated for a massive electrical shock. After a lengthy recovery period, we are happy to say the victim, a maintenance and operations electrician, has returned to work. This afternoon, we are here to recognize the amazing teamwork coordination, communication, and extraordinary life-saving actions of various LAUSD personnel. The initial rescuer and initiation of CPR, MNO electrician Rodrigo Martinez, LASPD personnel Sergeant Bowen, Police Officer Rami Alwar, Officer Sergio Salas, Officer David Yamas, Officer Armando Rodriguez, and all of whom performed life-saving CPR measures to the maintenance and operations electrician. We'd also like to recognize MNO workers, David Medina and Frankie Tornado, as well as police officers, Anthony Bryant, Joe Saravia, Yesenia Cifuentes, David Yamas, and SSO Albert and Wilson, who worked as a team in coordinating various tasks with logistics and coordination for the emergency paramedics arrival an amazing life-saving endeavor to all involved. I would like to have Mr. Rodrigo Martinez please come forward as we'd like to present a life-saving certificate and plaque to him for his life-saving mission. I like to read the plaque, and this is a Los Angeles School Police Department Citizen Life-Saving Award presented to Rodrigo Martinez. The Los Angeles School Police Department proudly presents this esteemed award as a tangible expression of our appreciation and gratitude for your courage, selflessness, and unwavering dedication to duty of your her heroic life-saving actions on Thursday, March 23rd, 2023, whereby you successfully performed cardiopulmonary resuscitation on a critically injured coworker. Your dedication to the preservation of life is to be commended. Thank you. have a uh, life a certificate of, of appreciation as well along with the plaque. Thank you.
If we can get the other officers who are involved in the life-saving mission, please come forward. We'll take a photo as well. Now, I do want to say that... Um, I want to say one thing that uh, our officers will be given a life-saving uh, medal as well, but that will come forthcoming in a LA School Police Department separate event that we have for the summer. Again, congratulations, sir. Thank you. Thank you, board members, for allowing us the time to recognize this. And I know that uh, Superintendent Carvalho also mentioned um, the AEDs that are district-wide and the team effort that was uh, utilized in getting these devices city uh, district-wide and to reiterate that it doesn't have to be somebody who's trained. If you run across somebody who appears to be in a situation that requires some type of CPR, they're not breathing, okay, anybody can grab that AED and it will tell you step by step how to use it. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you to the officers and to our employees for the incredible life-saving work. We really appreciate your quick action, and I know that the gentleman whose lives you saved has been profoundly affected by your work. Thank you so very much. Now I'm going to go to get uh, uh, an idea about what will be on our consent calendar. The consent calendar is an opportunity to put items that are on the agenda onto one calendar and take one vote for all of them at the same time. Uh, I'll first read through the board actions and we'll either place them on consent or set them to a time individually if a board member has a comment or a question or on a consent item that will not affect their vote, please let me know and Mr. McLean will mark it down and return after public comment on that consent item. The items that are before us today are a variety of issues that we will be voting on. Uh, announcement number one, we don't vote on, so I won't call about that one. Item number two is the CSEA, that's uh, California School Employees Association, Chapter 500, just the 2223 Memorandum of Understanding and Compensation for Confidential District Employees Comparable to CSEA Classifications. Consent. Consent. Item number two, approval of procurement app actions. I believe that's item three. I'm sorry, excuse me. Item three, I forgot number one, approval of procurement actions. Questions. All right, questions from Mr. Schmerlson, Mr. Melvoin, and from myself. And I'll, I will. But that will still be on consent, is that correct? Correct, correct. Okay. And I have a brief statement to read Go about ahead. tab three. In accordance with regulation section 18438.8, board member Melvoin is disclosing receipt of campaign contributions in excess of $250 from parties interested in the following contract actions. One. Board of Education Report Number 250-2223, Procurement Services Division, Item D, Vive Concierge, Contract Number 44000-11263, uh, Source Dwayne Hall, Chief Executive Officer, Vive Concierge Incorporated. And Number 2, Board of Education Report Number 250-22-23, Procurement Services Division, Item P, Kokomo Solutions, Contract Number 44000-11585, Source is Daniel Lee, Chief, Chief of Ex Executive Officer, Kokomo Solution Solutions. Further, Board Member Melvoin is disqualified from participating in the previously stated contract actions. All right, so for people to understand, when people run for office, if a contribution to their campaign could potentially cause a conflict of interest, board members recuse themselves. That means they do not vote yes or no or participate in the conversation about that item that's on the agenda. Nothing illegal, completely legal, but we disclose so that the public knows where campaign money comes from. Item number, and that's on consent for three, right? Uh, con item number four, approval of facility contract action. Consent. Consent, I have a couple of quick questions. Um, yes, go ahead. Actually, 
um, discussion, because I do have a question. I don't know. We might have a follow-up from the team on item T on this, which was the disposal of hazardous, weight, hazardous okay, waste. Okay, and that's on four, so we'll, we'll, we'll yeah. put that on consent. We'll put that on discussion. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, discussion. Uh, when we put an item on discussion, it means when we take the one vote on the consent calendar, that item will be voted on separately and not with that one vote. Uh, item number five, approval of LA Unified District Representatives to the Regional Adult Education Consortium. Question. Question, but on consent? Correct. Okay. Anybody else questions? No. Renaming of Christopher Columbus Middle School? Consent. Consent. Submission of the 2324 Consolidated Application for Categorical Aid Programs? Consent. Uh, item eight is a discussion item. It's a resolution that will be heard at uh, 3.30 p.m. So that will not be on consent. And nine is a reappointment of a member to the School Construction Bond Oversight Committee. Consent. Uh, the Bond Oversight Committee is a part of us spending money uh, that from bond measures that voters have voted on. There is a civilian oversight committee that makes recommendations to the board on each and every expenditure from that taxpayer money. Uh, a reappointment of member to school construction bond citizens oversight committee, that's a different person on item 10. Consent. And item 11 is report of correspondence. Consent. Consent, okay. So we have two discussion items, number four and number eight. And before we go to anything else, uh, we're gonna take something a little bit out of order. I'm gonna ask the superintendent to do the ESSER 3 and the overview of evidence-based intervention reports now out of order because we believe that some people might be speaking on it and they'd probably rather hear the material that they're speaking on before they speak on it. So the others, there are two others. There's classroom teacher staffing update, the calendar, and uh, the uh, universal transitional kindergarten we will do at the a regular time. But just these two, if you would, thank you. Thank you very much, Madam President. Uh, let me be very brief in my introduction and ask uh, David and the team to, uh, uh, to uh, prepare for their presentation. It is a rather uh, brief uh, slide deck. Um, David and his team will provide a very high level overview of ESSER uh, funding. The next school year, the 23-24 school year, will be the last school year we have with any type of significant ESSER funding. What's ESSER? Uh, ESSER in not so many, uh, you know, to, to make it uh, comprehensible to the general community is uh, a set of federal investments tied to COVID recovery, uh, specifically earmarked and appropriated by the U.S. Congress uh, to address not only safety precautions, but also academic acceleration and stabilization of social emotional support and the workforces across America. Uh, those funds were earmarked um, in a way uh, that envisioned a timed sunsetting of the funding. Best practices will predict and dictate that there are dangers associated, if not true pain associated uh, with um, tying full-time positions with short-term invested resources. What that means is, if we know that funds will sunset in a couple of years, putting positions, as was the case here, on those funds will require those positions to be funded by another funding stream or picked up by general fund. What we do know is this. When these funds sunset, September of 2024, we probably will be well into a condition of economic scarcity in the state of California, considering the $32 billion budget deficit, with no hope that the federal government, and that I can assure anyone who's listening, there will be no substitute funding from the federal government. We know that because we know the, the political makeup of the decision makers in Washington, D.C. If anything, we may see some collection back of unspent funds that we currently are using, even though I believe that that is a remote possibility. So today's presentation provides the board and community some additional insight into the investment, the total number of full-time positions that we will have to find solutions for so that position or program are not impacted. 
I know we hear a lot of voices advocating for a whole lot. And I'm often told, wait a second, we probably can find a solution for this. I mean, we are a multi-billion dollar organization. This only costs 100 million. The problem is, alongside that 100 million investment, there are 20 other 100 million investments that we need to find solutions for. So the time is now for us to find practicable solutions to avoid the fiscal cliff. The time is now for us to build the financial bridge that will ensure that priority programs and positions are saved. And to a point made by our board president, this will mean in some instances some degree of inconvenience. We will protect jobs. We will protect livelihoods. We will protect programs. But that may require some degree of functional flexibility, meaning related work, but not necessarily in the same exact position. The alternatives are few. The old proverbial, you know, pulling the rabbit out of the hat will not work. The rabbit is dead, and the hat is small. And that's where we find ourselves. So David Hart. Pull up the slide for me. One moment. A little slower. <laughs> Thank you. So what you have here uh, depicts, if you will, um, the totality of our ESSER program over the last couple years. Uh, beginning with this year, 22-23, uh, we had budgeted, I'm going to round numbers, 1.8 billion. We expect that the actual will come in at about 1.6. Uh, our budget for 23-24, we're forecasting it to be at about uh, 900 million, and we anticipate that going into the school year 24-25, that which would be uh, before the board one year from now, will be a relatively, and I use this term, relatively paltry $65 million. Uh, we do have an expectation, uh, cannot and would not look to improve on what the superintendent offered. Uh, the only thing uh, to say about the ESSER 3 spend for 22-23, 23-24 is to remind folks that this was preceded by ESSERs 1 and 2, which we had intentionally spent down and, spent, and uh, eclipsed, if you will, those dollars uh, in the prior budget years. In fact, the beginning balance in 22-23, you may recall that some of those monies were set aside to cover any overages from ESSERS 1 and 2 coming into this year. So here's where we are. Uh, we will be coming back to this in our subsequent conversations with the board at the presentations of June 13th and June 20th. You can see here on the right side the FTE that we presume will be um, covered or, or funded from this, uh, but it is important to note that that total of rounding 2100 FTE is running against $882 million, and that is to be contrasted with the $65 million that we expect in 24-25. Of that amount in 24-25, uh, there's just simply stated no way to force 2,100 positions into that dollar amount. And so that is the challenge that we have. To echo the sentiments that were stated previously, we're trying to create a glide path. Uh, part of what's happening right now is that we are using these funds, the ESSER funds, to defray costs to the general fund so that we have a fund balance that carries us through uh, 24, 25, and uh, we'll see where we are come 25, 26, and present that more fully when we're before you next Tuesday. Questions or comments from board members? Mr. Melvoin. Thank you. Thanks for the quick presentation. I'll note, you know, we um, had a series of presentations over the last few years with the Path to Recovery expenditure or plans for path to recovery dollars and then despite some requests we have not had a real comprehensive accounting of those funds and so I just say that when we look at the budget next week you know there were slides over the course of a year or two of meetings that said we're going to spend X you know as part of path to recovery X on tutoring and Y on mental health and then we've never seen like we spent 
you know, a certain percentage of X and Y. So if there's a way to just, just so we're comparing apples to apples, because I think sometimes we see it in path to recovery, sometimes we see it in ESSER, and it's just hard to make sense of it. So that's a request. I guess if we can put the slide back up, um, the 2,094 employees, were those like new employees hired just with ESSER funds, or were those folks who were employed, and then when we got the ESSER funding, we used that for their salary or part of their salary, you know, as like a bridge funding? I mean, how, how many of these FTEs through ESSER are, were new to the district, and how many of them were existing and their funding sources were moved? I'll answer it in this way, too. One is I'll get to your more precise answer. The answer uh, is it's a mix. We had set out to make this a majority of new. If we go back a number of years when we first started to receive the various recovery monies in association with the pandemic, this was intended to all be, uh, in the purest sense, supplemental, an enhancement, too. Uh, our hiring was not as successful as we would have hoped for in a number of reasons. We've covered here numerous times. So as time has played out, well, we have been able to defray costs mm -hmm. to the general fund by moving general fund employees to these costs. Um, yes, and then the... Um, I hit the mic. The, the, oh, there, there we go. Uh, I think the, we've had um, folks come and go, and so it just depends on a timing sequence of where we were in the hiring process. Uh, what dollars we had available. Uh, part of our challenge also is um, knowing that these funds have a stale dating. We also look to no other non-general fund sources, so title funds might be part of that alternative as well. Yeah, I mean, and, and this is a, has been a national challenge. There's actually, I think, a front page story in the New York Times today about ESSER funding around the country and the difficulty. I mean, the district had an infusion of billions of dollars Many of us cautioned against the long-term, you know, ongoing expenditures, but there's also only so much you can do as a school. I mean, 90% of our budget is people. So either you can pay existing people for overtime, which is some of what we did with tutoring and maintenance and all that, uh, the acceleration days, or you, you use ESSER funding for existing employees to defray the general fund. And that's where I understand, too, where some of that spending went went to because we had to spend it by a certain date. And then we did try to hire some new people. I think what would be helpful for the public and the board to understand as we unwind some of this is um, how many salaries are fully dependent on ESSER such that when that disappears, those people in essence disappear. Uh, or how much of this is uh, going to be defrayed from, from the general fund or from the, the COLA or any of that. Because that, that's why I think it's just the, the, the presentations, there's not enough of a coherence between the presentations sometimes to understand that crosswalk. I'll, I'll, t I'll take that, and then please, David, correct me if I make a mistake. I think at the end of the day, for the benefit of, of the community, the listeners, that's, that's the most important question, right? Uh, let me begin by tackling your first point. Um, about a year and a half, 14, 15 months ago, uh, we did have an excessively high carryover of ESSER resources as a result of what you described. Huge investments, huge need, crisis, but not enough professionals ready to go into the workforce. And in some cases, as is the, the specific example of some of the mental health professionals that uh, we've been discussing, um, extremely unlikely that even going to next year you'll have the the, the necessary adequate number of professionals to staff every one of the vacant positions. That's a reality. Uh, we recalibrated, we pivoted in a number of ways, and I'm here to tell the board that we will fully spend, um, as you see, I mean, last year at this time, we had about uh, $1.8 uh, $1 billion uh, of unspent ESSER, and now we're down to uh, literally just uh, a little bit less than half of that. We will burn through that in essential priorities for this district um, through September of 2024. Currently, uh, currently and budgeted for the next uh, fiscal year, uh, the 23-24 school year, we have about 2,100 positions tied to uh, ESSER dollars. So the job ahead, as I said earlier, and I don't want to mince words or reduce or sugarcoat the expectation, there will be some degree of inconvenience. But that inconvenience is necessary to avoid job loss or significant program reduction. 
uh, we will be down to about $800 million of positions that we need to find funding homes for. And we plan to do that. Actually, we have been doing that. And some of the issues that we will explain today is to avoid that fiscal cliff that positions, people, and programs would fall into if we do not take the necessary actions. But the simple answer to your question is about 2,100 positions. In fact, 2,094 positions. Uh, and I have to say, not all of these positions are filled. The vast majority are. But the easy reductions are obviously those positions are vacant. But even some of those vacancies are priority, right? So we will need to wholesale transfer the position with body or not to a more stable funding stream. General fund will be one. Title I will be another based on match. Title III uh, and IDEA as appropriate. But that's what we have to play with. Thank you. And that was going to be my second question. It was just the how many of these positions are vacant? And you said it's a small percentage. Okay. As a footnote to uh, superintendent's comments, one of the things to note is when we received these funds, as you know, we were talking about new positions and, and they were going to supplement. And to the extent we were not able to hire new, we talked about what might we do contractually. Um, those, that was a, that was an perhaps overly optimistic view, given I wasn't aware of the article, but I gotta imagine that's a common sentiment. So now we're at a point in time where what we're looking at is defraying the expenses that the general fund would otherwise incur. And so th to give a, you know, a, a, in, in the, the devil's in that detail, we're now looking at the employees we have that we can move off of the general fund into these funding sources. So when you say who's going to not have funding next year, the answer is to anything that's funded by ESSER, none of them will because that funding goes away. Uh, we're not anticipating at this point, um, you know, as, as you'll see in the presentation, we're maintaining program. Um, thank you. Thank you. Similar questions. I agree that over time it's been hard to trace some of these decisions. Um, so when I first came on in the spring of 21, I remember the board uh, facing a student enrollment reduction of close to 3%, but a staffing increase of close to 8%. And I was arguing with my colleagues at the time that that didn't make sense to us, and I didn't want to add 6,000 more positions that we couldn't fill. Um, I think we attempted to. And so what's hard to see here in the 2,000 is um, is that 2,000 of the 6,000 that we had contemplated back in the spring of 21? Um, or has there been some shifting here? And, and I think it would be helpful to see if this is what's being funded with 882 million, what did we fund this year with you know, 1.6 or 7 billion, how many positions, sort of that, that comparison piece. So I think as we're looking to the budget, um, which we'll be voting on very shortly, it is helpful to see the sequencing of things and, and understand um, you know, how much we have actually been able to purchase and, and achieve and get towards the strategic plan with the dollars that the board has um, approved versus what's really changing for next year. What are we reducing? And I think um, the team has told us that we're going to be seeing some of that, the change from this year to next year. And that's always a request of us to really understand what uh, investments are maintaining, what are increasing, what are changing. And so that's something I'll be looking forward to both in our budget briefings and when we talk uh, next week and on the 20th when we approve. Um, but you know, as the team thinks about it and comes back, if you can help us kind of walk through where we've been, what we've filled, what we haven't filled, so that we can understand the totality of the, the federal dollars that are one-time dollars um, that in some respects we have uh, committed to more than one-time investments, so those long-term investments. Because um, I guess then other questions come up for me, like uh, we just landed these huge contracts, and um, is this going to be funding any of the uh, UTLA contract with the alternate scheduling or the special education staffing? Is that general fund or is that ESSER fund? And I think um, these will be questions that hopefully will be answered in some of the upcoming presentations. Um, but in particular, just a quick one, on the community of schools tech support, what is that? The 222 FTEs. Yeah, so, so the community schools tech, tech support are school-based 
uh, technicians that are allocated to support school sites as we've shifted to a more of a one-to-one -one device uh, deployment structure. There is a greater need in our schools for daily uh, technical support. And so we did, as part of ESSER, uh, in our ESSER plan, um, fund technicians throughout the district to support students who may um, be confronted with Wi-Fi connection, so IT application, support. IT support issues. These are, by and large, microsystems technicians. Uh, this more aggressive ratio or uh, allocation did not exist prior to ESSER, during ESSER, as Pedro says, considering the fact that we were required to go into a one-to-one -one reality, additional connectivity, additional technical needs at the schools. It was the right idea at the time. Mm -hmm. But again, what's going to happen by September 2024 is that the funding is going to dry up and any additional deployment of personnel, regardless of judgment, meaning whether it's good or bad, uh, that funding disappears. And we're going to have to ask ourselves, uh, does this now constitute a priority? Meaning, are we going to have to find a new home in the budget? Or are we going to modify or reduce or eliminate? There are no other choices. So yes, that's an example. But uh, to your point, board member uh, uh, Ortiz Franklin, what we wanted to show in this slide today is not answer all questions, just to give Radio. the community a sense of what's currently tied to ESSER. So that as we continue to speak about, and I understand, look, you know, if, if you are one of the, and I know sometimes I, I, I speak in a rather uh, blunt way. If you are currently in a position that is of high value for the system, but that position did not exist prior to ESSER funding. Our best way of protecting that position is either reinventing the position, finding a new home, or attaching new funding to it. This is an opportunity to provide the community with a 30,000 foot perspective over how big the problem to be solved is. 2,000 positions, consuming $800 million, that will disappear without the state backfilling and the federal government backfilling. That means 100% of the solution needs to come from our district. Every district across the country will be negotiating these same types of considerations. That is why we're informing the board now, and I promise you as we get closer to the actual budget presentations, those walkthroughs uh, will be provided to the board that show here's where the initial investment was at, here's what's been consumed, uh, here's what's still on the table, and here are preliminarily going into next budget year uh, some of the actions we're taking to avoid that fiscal cliff. That would be helpful. And maybe one more request for our next budget conversation is also what's our expected attrition? So we just saw some great yeah. retirement celebrations. Um, but as we're recruiting folks about how many do we lose each year, whether it's a total amount and that makes sense, or if it's a classroom position, which I know is another presentation that's coming up, um, I think the side-by-sides are really helpful for us to understand the full picture and, and do appreciate us updating the public on where the board needs to be thinking about the next couple of years when we lose this massive federal funding. So thank you. Dr. McKenna. Okay, uh, before we leave this, I, ju I just have one thing to say, and that is that Change is always easy if you're not the one doing it. And so I, I want to say right out loud that as we figure out these 2,100 positions, how to fund, and we are, this board has made a commitment to not have layoffs, to not reduce any of the income that we have agreed to in our, our contracts. There were no March 15th letters. I've been doing this for 42 years. I have never been in March 15th without March 15th letters. Those are the letters we send to people who we say may not have a job next year. That's right. We didn't send any of those because we're committed to keeping the fabulous people that we have working for us now, but the pain will not be minimal. People will not be at the same school or in the same job. Because as we reallocate this and that and figure out as a board and a superintendent the priorities of those $882 million, we're not going to be able to find $882 million to keep them all. We will keep all the people. But there will be pain. And the pain is I'm not getting to go back to my school or the office I was in. I'm not in the position I was in before. I'm doing something different. Yes. 
But that's what happens when about a billion dollars disappears. And that's what's happening. So I just wanted to say that I want to be very clear about this board's intention. We do not intend to lay anybody off. We do not intend to have furloughs on your pay. We intend to say that some things will continue as they are. Some will be cut back. Some will be revised. Some will be changed. Some will be, lots of things will happen. And it will affect people. And people will be told they have to move to do something either different or in a different location, and this is not going to be easy or pleasant because we were finally funded for a few years the way we were supposed to be funded, always. And to see it disappear is very disheartening because the things that we were doing with those 2,094 people are not things we should give up if we had the money to keep them. So I just wanted to say that because I think it's important for people to know that we do not believe your job is at stake. Not this year, not next year, not the following year. What we think is where you are doing it or exactly with whom you will be doing it might change for many people. Can okay. Yes, go ahead, Mr. McLean. Uh, um, Ms. Gomez is on the line. Oh, Ms. Gomez, I'm sorry. By That's okay. Means. Oh, yes. Uh, just, just quickly, I, I appreciate the questions that have been asked and um, the reminder about the ESSER funds um, expiring next year. And I just, I hope as we continue the budget conversations for this year, we can have more in-depth conversations about what the plans are for these various areas of investments, whether it's mental health or special education or the Black Student Achievement Plan. Um, I think it's a, it's an important reminder to, to the public and to everyone in our system that uh, these funds were temporary, but I think it would also be helpful to articulate what are the off ramps in terms of investments that will be sustained, what the funding sources will be. And for those that aren't, um, it's important to let the public know about those as soon as possible. So hopefully more detail can be provided at our sub subsequent meetings this month. Tenant for your next report. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President. Uh, the next report is obviously uh, one that um, whose topic has garnered a great deal of, of attention and debate, some of which has been well-informed, some of which has been misinformed. Uh, much of it has been covered by media, some of which, uh, some of which uh, was done adequately, some of which from where I stand or sit, not so much. Uh, for example, if I pay any one entity $11 million and they are uh, Profit making out of the school system, uh, of course, I'm going to paint a rosy picture of what I'm doing. But that's not what I'm going to talk about. We have an opportunity and a responsibility, both professionally and morally, to elevate the entirety of the school system. Not cherry pick some kids. The only pilots I like are those that fly the plane. Because right now we have in our possession across the country, enough knowledge, enough research, enough understanding of best practices to actually do something with a clear understanding as to whether it will work or not. We don't, no need to experiment. No need to experiment. So today we're going to detail evidence-based intervention and why we need to pivot and why we are pivoting why we need to reinvent in a dynamic way, why we need to evolve, not dismantle. And it's quite disheartening, despite the many conversations with some individuals, particularly those who make a living out of writing of what we do, that we say and prove that we're not dismantling. In fact, we are protecting a best practice, but it keeps being portrayed as dismantling. Let me begin by asserting that which is obvious. Any one person in this audience today, any one person sitting up here, any one person listening, whether you are trained in a science of reading or not, if you are assigned four kids and for four months you do nothing but work with those four kids without any training and you test them before they are assigned and test them afterwards, these kids will soar in performance. It's not me saying it. Actually, one of preeminent researchers in the matter, John Hattie, will say so. Anything we'll do with kids will work. The question is, 
how much do you want it to work, what is the rate of improvement, over what time period, is it scalable, is it feasible within a specific time period. And by the way, that is the criteria of any solid implementation of anything we do. So the very first uh, conclusion, Madam President, members of the board, is that primary promise, of course it works. And I'm here to tell you it works because it has worked across the country over the past four decades. It is not something new that it was invented in 2021. It is called intervention. It's when you improve the skill set of individuals, in this case, if we're speaking about literacy, but it could be true for numeracy as well, you improve the skill set in the science of reading with research-based practices. And then you significantly reduce the audience of that highly trained professional, the interventionist, and you dedicate that one individual to a very small group of students. Of course it works. And the data wouldn't lie. It wouldn't lie here. It would not lie in Miami. It would not lie in the entire state of Mississippi. Therein lies the conundrum. Do we sustain, in the way we currently have it, an approach, not a program, an approach that by its own design and funding stream will implode September of 2024. Why? Because the entirety of the funding assigned to Primary Promise sunsets September of 2024. Full implementation of Primary Promise will cost exclusive of professional development and other private sector contracts which were never budgeted or announced to the community exclusive of those contracts, it will cost $192 million. Add to that private sector contracts, some of which are in the dozens of millions of dollars. So I want to reassure those who are listening, and particularly primary promise teachers. What you do is great, what you do works. It is so great and works so well that we actually ought to do it for a lot more kids in a fundable, scalable, protected way. That's what we are doing. We are evolving, revamping this initiative to be in line with what the highest performing districts in a country in reading or states in reading have done. That's all we're doing. You will hear through this presentation um, how we will be doing that how we will target the support, how we will provide the interventionists in a more democratic and equitable way, how we will scale up beyond K3 to K5 and then K8, how we will add not only to literacy in those great levels, numeracy, since our math scores are actually worse than our reading scores. Doing nothing is not an option. Doing nothing is inviting the cessation of the intervention come September of 24. What you will not see in this presentation is a great deal of data validation. And there's a reason for that. No matter what anybody will tell you, it's never been studied. Now we have an ongoing study in place, but it's not available yet. And we do not have the time to punt, to postpone important decisions. You will also be provided with information regarding program efficacy. What is proven to have worked and what will continue to work in this district. You'll be presented with the details of the reshaping of this initiative to ensure its viability, not only short term, but for the long haul. How we will provide intervention services to a vastly greater number of students. And next, we will also provide information to you regard, regarding the equitable distribution of resources and availability of these services in a way that can be funded for the long haul. This is one of those tough conversations that our board president was just speaking about. I want to say once again, high dosage tutoring works. Interventions work. Primary promise works because it's all under the same theory of action 
umbrella. The question is, it's working for how many and for how long? And if we do nothing about it, because we acquiesce to the status quo knowing that Armageddon from a fiscal perspective is around the corner, what shall we do or say to those who never got the intervention, were never in the pipeline to get intervention, and to those who were getting intervention but we failed to do something, therefore services stop. There is nobility in ensuring primary promise to the extent it is a promise. Of course there's nobility in that. But what do we say to the kid who's in sixth grade, seventh grade, but is reading at first or second grade level? We ignore them? What do we say to kids who are sitting in classrooms right now, or were sitting in classrooms, for the better part of a year because we removed some of the best teachers in Los Angeles Unified into interventionist primary promise teachers, and for a year those kids learned every single day taught by an uncredentialed teacher. And that happened. People made choices, and today we're making difficult but necessary choices if we value intervention. So to the primary promise teachers who are listening, we appreciate your work. Of course, what you're doing is valuable and it works. It is a best practice. What we're doing is ensuring the continuity and expansion of best practices within the resources we will have into the near future. Democratizing intervention, making it available for a larger number of students and expanding it also into numeracy. Let me now introduce our Deputy Superintendent for Instruction, uh, Dr. Carla Estrada. Thank you, Superintendent. As you shared, we have an academic acceleration opportunity before us. We will take the best practices from Primary Promise as an early literacy strategy and scale intervention based on research, practice, and current database needs to positively impact K-12 students across the entire district. We must take a holistic approach to addressing high quality literacy instruction in every classroom while also providing targeted intervention to students who need additional support. The Literacy and Numeracy Intervention Model is built on a multi-tiered approach to instruction and support and will amplify the positive outcomes and benefits of research-based intervention approaches and a high-quality instruction every day in every classroom across Los Angeles Unified School District. It's important to note here that it is crucial to identify avenues for intervention growth, increased effectiveness, scalability, and sustainability. Ultimately, the goals outlined in our strategic plan and by our board require us to continuously reflect and evolve to make meaningful differences in the lives of our students. By widening the reach of intervention based on research feedback and current database needs, we can create a stronger foundation from which all LAUSC students can benefit. There's an example of some areas in which we know we need to improve. For example, last year, schools purchased interventionists but they were not part of the primary promise approach and initiative, but they will be moving forward. Why? Because we must leverage every staff and resource that we have available within the district. We need to make sure they're trained through our intervention academy. We must make sure that those students who need us most continue to be addressed, their needs continue to be addressed based on the data and performance that we're seeing. And most importantly, we have also seen that there are some lessons to be learned about the students and schools who receive this kind of support. Moving forward, we need to make sure we're realigning to those ongoing and changing needs. Building a long-term strategy requires a sustainable and scalable approach. And what Dr. Baez will present here today has been a deep reflection for us as a district about what has been working, what we could learn from in order to grow and expand what we know is an ongoing need across the district. She will, she will share details of our intervention efforts, what will continue and be revamped in our approach to intervention because intervention has been a cornerstone of LAUSD's approach to teaching and learning for years. 
We will forge ahead to support learning for the thousands of K-12 students across the district. And with that, I hand it over to Dr. Baez to go into more details. Thank you. And we welcome you, Dr. Baez. Thank you, Board Member Goldberg. Thank you very much. That applause is she has recently completed and been awarded her PhD. Thank you very much, President Goldberg. Good afternoon, President Goldberg, uh, Board of Education, Superintendent Carvalho, and Deputy Superintendents. My name is Frances Baez, Chief Academic Officer for LAUSD, and I am here to present an overview of evidence-based interventions. My objective is to provide an overview of evidence-based intervention programs and review the high-quality instructional materials the district implements to engage students in learning. I will then walk you through a timeline of evidence-based interventions through the years, taking you to the current early literacy model called Primary Promise and the literacy and numeracy intervention model moving forward. The LAUSD evidence-based intervention model is aligned with the strategic plan under Pillar 1, Academic Excellence, aimed at providing high-impact intervention and instructional programs to accelerate learning for students most in need. Additionally, Pillar 4 under Operational Effectiveness is the strategic plan calls for utilizing data to provide a multi-tiered system of support and distribution of resources, and you will be hearing that throughout this presentation. I will begin up front by exclaiming that LAUSD is not cutting intervention programs. Instead, the district is scaling up a sustainable academic intervention model for K-12 based on today's student needs and resources. I also want to emphasize that we are not ending early literacy programs. As a matter of fact, we are going to build upon the lessons that we've learned based on what the early literacy programs that have been, impl been implemented these past few years. The enhanced model will ensure the sustainability of an intervention model without a loss of positions. In the coming year, we will build on the successes of the primary promise while addressing the challenges the model posed, such as the misalignment of locally designed programs and assignment of primary promise teachers. The program created classroom vacancies to address the needs of a small group of students causing an interruption of services in the highest need schools, inadvertently compromising our equity focus. We refer to research on evidence-based approaches and the decisions that we make to structure the intervention. We use the California English Language Arts and English Language Development Framework. We use the Math Framework and Best Evidence Encyclopedia. What Works Clearinghouse, to name a few, and of course, the meta-analysis results from John Hattie are also used to inform our practice. The LAUSD intervention model follows seven principles. We begin with a multi-tiered system of support that includes student performance data to tier students based on their need and personalizes their learning through a universal design for learning. In order for the evidence-based intervention to be successful, it must be done with frequency and intensity, which means the student and the educator need to be in school every single day to maximize learning. The intervention should be above and beyond what students receive during the instructional day and led by educators who have received professional development and evidence-based interventions. And you will see later in the presentation what that professional development entails. This pyramid consists of three tiers. The first one depends on strong core classroom instruction to get 80% of students to be at grade level. Students in this tier are engaged in challenging learning led by a teacher who uses data to differentiate learning and lead small group instruction. The second tier should consist of 15% of the students in our system and offers additional instruction on top of the tier one experience. There is focused small group intervention and it is offered by an interventionist or a general education teacher or other trained personnel. The third tier should consist of 5% of the students in our system that provides individualized or small group instructions through the use of a high quality supplemental curriculum. Student learning is frequently monitored to ensure progress. Now you've heard me repeatedly say the word should. This is because the pyramid is currently inverted and most of our students are in tier two and three in LA Unified. 
This requires a multifaceted approach to convert our pyramid to look like this pyramid. So we lead with first good solid instruction so that 80% of our students can be in tier one and tier two would be at 15% and tier three at 5% so that we maximize our dollars for tier one instruction. This data-driven cycle of inquiry from a multi-tiered system of support plan is, aligned, is applied when identifying the presenting problem that prevents students from learning. We analyze the student's academic performance data and implement interventions that meet the needs of students. And lastly, we evaluate the response to instruction and intervention. So this is the cycle that we continuously use to analyze data, plan lessons that address the needs of students, go back and see if it worked and try again. And that's the research cycle that we incorporate into our teaching and learning. A universal design for learning ensures that students are provided meaningful ways to learn, understand, and demonstrate their learning using a menu of options. The universal design for learning is uh, an approach that was introduced in the special education space and has scaled up throughout the district and has really empowered educators and leaders to understand how to best meet the needs of students by providing them multiple ways to engage multiple ways to represent their learning. And this is where we have built our equitable grading and instruction aspect of our, uh, of our programs. Students should have many ways to show their learning to best meet the needs of our students with dyslexia, our English learners, our standard English learners, our culturally and linguistically diverse, gifted and talented students with disability, and personalizing lessons to meet the needs of our students. Small group instruction allows for that personalization and understand the needs of every single one of them. <coughs> Small group instruction follows this sequence. We begin with data to identify where students are performing, and based on the data, we group students and choose the academic focus and instructional strategies for small group instruction. As a matter of fact, recently, we have just adopted the curricular associates, curriculum associates, which is an assessment that does just that. We're able to assess, we're able to group our students. We're able to provide individualized lessons that meet the needs of the students. We establish learning goals with them and work in small groups so that we empower students to understand their level of performance so that they can also be, be monitoring their learning just as well as a teacher. Lastly, we progress monitor students and reflect on the lesson we taught and revise it if it was not working. Now I will show examples of the small group configuration in the classroom. And the ones that we'll share are just a few of many uh, innovative approaches that our schools use to structure intervention throughout the day and after school. There are several organizational structures such as the push-in and pull-out model. Push-in will be where there is a teacher that pushes into the classroom to decrease the number of students per adult uh, and that ratio will help with more personalization as well as the pull-out model. This might be when there are students who are uh, an intensive uh, uh, area of performance and we need to really personalize the learning with a small group outside of the classroom. Academy time following the early language and literacy plan where students mix homogeneously either by grade level or within the classroom. And this was an approach that was used widely before the pandemic and where students would mix throughout the, uh, the day uh, and teachers would collaborate uh, amongst their grade levels to receive one another's students to make sure that they got that personalized targeted support. In some cases, elementary school departmentalization is used to deepen student learning in English language arts and math when teachers in grade level plan and deliver lessons in that discipline to an entire grade level. A four by four bell schedule offers teachers more time to incorporate small group instruction since the instructional blocks are longer. Intervention should be the core minutes plus 30 to 45 minutes. This is an image of ways students rotate between learning stations. Each station includes a small group or full class instruction, group projects or independent work. You might have seen this in action when you visit classrooms. As you can see this one, it can be uh, very, uh, there's many ways in which students become engaged either with the teacher, with the group, with the digital uh, device or platform, uh, and with projects. This allows for students to have multiple ways to engage in the learning. To continue with the description of small groups, the group size should be no more than four to six students with a teacher. 
The frequency and duration should be a minimum of three times per week for 30 to 60 minutes per day, or about 50 hours over a semester, in addition to winter, spring, and summer breaks. And as we know, that has been part of the strategy in LA Unified in providing uh, additional days of learning for our students, whether it's during the spring break or winter plus programs. And of course, I, I would be remiss if I did not put a plug in for summer school. So please make sure to enroll your children in summer school uh, for a summer of learning. Enjoy. The next item is, a, uh, is important is making sure that we focus our attention on the targeted skill and the standard. What is very tempting to do when uh, from one grade level to the next is sometimes in the fall, teachers believe that they have to reteach an entire grade level before you get to the actual grade level learning. When in fact, you have to look at the prerequisite standard that leads to that current grade level standard that informs the future standard. So it's important for teachers to understand the coherence map of a, of a math standard and also the continuum of literacy. So that we're not reteaching a grade level, we're actually building the foundations to get to the next uh, grade level standard through a prerequisite skill. This requires students and the educators to be in, uh, in attendance daily to maximize student learning. And this attendance piece was a very, uh, 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 a limit, uh, one of the limitations of ensuring the success of our intervention programs in the past three years. Uh, when teachers and students are not present, we cannot really benefit from the investments that are being made in the classroom to ensure that we are closing those achievement gaps. A well-structured intervention program requires high-quality instructional materials. Now we will present the state-adopted curricula and the Tier 1 and 3 intervention supports that help our students. If you recall the pyramid of intervention that I showed a few minutes ago, it was organized into three tiers. This graphic shows the high-quality instructional materials and approaches used for uh, every single one of those tiers. The LAUSD Tier 1 Elementary English Language Arts Curriculum is benchmark advanced, and some schools use core knowledge language arts. We will go through an adoption in the upcoming school year, so this may change next year. Tier 2 consists of students receiving Tier 1 instruction and additional instruction through small groups using the materials listed here, starting with the 95% group, Haggerty, Orton-Gillingham, language essentials for teachers of reading and spelling, reading horizons, and the rest of the materials on the list. These are also used to build foundational reading skills to help English learners as they meet reclassification uh, goals, such as the foundational, foundations of reading. Tier three consists of tier one plus even more programs and tools, such as high dose tutoring, the intensive diagnostic educational centers lab, and interventionist support. These tools and programs need to be implemented with increased frequency and intensity for there to, for it to make an impact. In elementary math, tier one curricula include Eureka, illustrative math, and a supplemental uh, instructional approach called cognitively guided instruction. Tier two and three offer even more support to students in small group instruction. As you can see, again, with frequency and intensity, students are able to benefit from the learning uh, and, and engagement of those materials. The middle and high school English language arts curricula are listed here for tier one and will expand through the use of the reading apprenticeship framework in middle school. Students who need additional support receive core instruction. In tier two, additional programs and tools are offered, and in tier three, Support will be provided through an interventionist who uses the corrective reading program plus Achieve 3000. And this is what we have in store as we reshape our intervention approach and inc incorporate grades six through eight in the intervention model. The interventionist will be trained in the use of corrective reading and Achieve 3000 to assist our students who are at that developmental stage but yet have not acquired re reading fluency. In middle and high school, tier one math curricula is listed here. Tier two offers students additional programs and tools. Tier three provides students with even more instruction using these curricula. I wanna direct your attention to the, the, uh, the variety of uh, curricula that we have and really the best approach would be for us to narrow the curricula uh, and this is another piece that is really helpful is students receive instruction with the similar curricula 
Teachers receive professional development and the similar um, materials. You'll see that there will be high yield results across the system. I have to stop you. Uh, we're going to come back to this, but we have an item on the agenda that is scheduled for 3.30, and it is now 3.32. Okay. I'm sorry to interrupt your presentation. I had hoped we had gotten to it sooner, but we're going to take that item up now. Good. And then when we conclude, board members, we'll come back to, and we'll start on page 21 with the tutoring and have a, our full discussion at the end of that. Uh, but now we will come to item number eight, uh, Mr. Melvoin. Uh, Dr. Rivas did call in and ask to be added as a co-sponsor, and I give it to you to open. Yes, and I would gladly accept her co-sponsorship. I know Ms. Gomez is also a co-sponsor, Mr. Schmerelson, Ms. Ortiz Franklin, Mr. Shin. I also. Dr. McKenna, thank you. U unanimity. Um, I think if it works, we'll actually call the uh, speakers for this item okay, first, and then we can all say a few me. words. Thank you all. All right. Okay, here we're going to do the public comment for item number eight at the time certain of 3.30. Ray Lopez Chang, are you on the line? Ray Lopez Chang, are you on the line? If you are, press star six to unmute yourself. You have three minutes to speak once you begin. Ray Lopez Chang, I see that you're on the line. Press star six to unmute yourself, and you have three minutes to speak once you begin. Great, thank you so much. Good afternoon, district leaders. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity to share a few words with you. Uh, my name is Ray Lopez Chang, and I am speaking on behalf of GPSN. Uh, we are an LA-based organization dedicated to catalyzing public excellence in public education and actively convening over 70 cross-sector organizations for collective action. Uh, folks, today I am approaching these comments much differently than this board might be accustomed to. Uh, first, it's important I celebrate this board for taking a firm and unapologetic stance to reaffirm the fundamental value system of this district, which is ensuring the safety of all of our students. To renew your commitment is actually to remind us of our visibility. And so for that, thank you. And considering the recent burning of a pride flag at an LAUSD school, and given organized parent protests against LGBTQ plus existence, I am going to make the courageous decision to speak directly to the students, families, staff, and educators enduring this hate. And today's words are truly about your innate ability of choice and consumption. We cannot always choose the hate we consume from people's limited scope of intelligence. But what we are doubly capable of is to reject words, actions, and opinions that do not recognize your complete and whole humanity. And when you witness or experience moments of condescension, othering, or at worst, bashing, remember that beneath your eyes, ears, and spirit exists an atomic mass of friends, family, organizers, shakers, and wholehearted human beings who are ready to shield you from malicious ineptitude and selective ignorance. And what you have above all is the power of discernment. And this board made a determination that despite this recent incident, they were going to remind us of who we are as a public education system. And that is one that has demonstrated to this country time and time again what it means to include and love our LGBTQ plus young people. Unfortunately, you will hear remarks that devalue your identity. You will also hear unsubstantiated, antiquated, and data debunked arguments for why you deserve erasure in our school system. However, while they waste away their erasers, lean on us to sharpen your pencils and write vigorously and often and authentically so that you can never be erased from our history. Your identity is worth far more history than any attempt to puncture our story. And when you are ready, engage your inner power, strengthen your voice, and show the world who this school district knows you to be, which is a beam of excellence. Thank you again to this board for hu your humanity and leadership. We look forward to the full board support of this resolution. Thank you for your time. 
Catherine Anderson, are you here in person? Catherine Anderson, you're signed up to speak in person. Are you here, Catherine? No, Catherine Anderson? Okay, Channing Martinez, I feel like I saw you out there. There you are, come on up. You'll have three minutes to speak once you begin. Mr. Channing Martinez. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Channing Martinez, co-director of the Strategy Center. As a black queer man who grew up in LUSD, I'm more than thrilled that the district is recognizing LGBTQIA students and staff. As a measure of importance of this motion, you have to understand that according to the Trevor Project in 2020, 44% of black LGBTQ youth seriously considered suicide in the 12 months prior to 2020. 55% reported symptoms of generalized anxiety disorder, and 63% reported symptoms of major uh, depressive disorder. As a black student, I did not understand my sexuality and had no one to talk to about it. When I attended Crenshaw High School, I only met with my academic counselor twice in four years that I was there, and the second time was simply to tell me that I was wasting my time applying for a UC with a 2.8 GPA. I would, not get, uh, I would not get into any of them. I got picked on for walking effeminately, having body language that was not extremely masculine. I was kicked down the stairs at Audubon Middle School by, uh, by the boys on campus that thought me and my best friend, uh, that at the time Michael, were too close. And while the dean suspended those students who did it, there was no restorative justice process. Um, a counselor didn't check in with me about my mental health, and now I'm spending, to be quite frank, hundreds per year processing the harms of my youth because the district could not find the political maturity to actually have a fully-fledged medical health uh, structure. But, they didn't, uh, but the district didn't hesitate to criminalize, suspend, expel students. The board didn't hesitate to fund police and ambitiously go after a tank, three grenade launchers, and 61 M16 assault rifles. I deeply appreciate the sentiment of this motion, but in some ways, it's just that, a sentiment. It doesn't commit the district to fundamentally changing the culture of the district that is backed by actual policy. As there is a crisis of drug, drug overdoses on campus, I wonder how many of those youth have turned to drugs because the district simply hasn't implemented the community safety pilot programs to address needs of black LGBTQ youth. The issue around students using the bathroom as their safe haven is more than 75 years old, and not one district has looked into why students see the bathroom as a convening place to do everything. LAUSD certainly hasn't created um, or legislated uh, concrete requirements for safe spaces for black LGBTQ youth. How can we talk about success of black students if black trans gender non-conforming youth are punished or even bullied for using the bathroom that resonates with their gender. Last year at Hawkins, administration was allowed to enforce a dress code which targeted those students. So I guess my last point is, I really think this is a really great motion and a first step, but we can't just vote for this motion and not implement the community safe pilots, defund the police, and really stop all the indicators that are holding back the barriers for black LGBTQ students. Thanks. Thank you for your time. Alejandro Banuelos, are you here in person? Alejandro Banuelos, if you're here, come on up. You have three minutes to speak once you begin. Good afternoon, school board members. Uh, I'm here to speak on behalf of Alejandro Banuelos, who couldn't be here with us today. Uh, but my name is Mal Trejo. I am a senior organizer with the uh, coalition called Students Deserve and also a member of the Police Freely Use the Coalition. This month, we don't just celebrate Pride Month, but we also celebrate um, uh, Black Music Month. And for me, as a both uh, non-binary and queer 
uh, organizer and person who works with students, I take pride in being able to not only support students in their civic engagement efforts and being involved not only at the school board level but within their own schools. But I want to quote Marsha P. Johnson, who uh, named that there's no pride for some of us without liberation for all of us. And so this month, as we celebrate not only the experiences in the identity of LGBTQ and queer youth throughout our district and our staff and educators and everybody that works to sustain this, this school district, I think it's very important to think about, right, beyond just celebrating LGBTQ youth, what does it look like uh, to also act in action, right, with including uh, folks on campus that can support folks when they have questions about their identity. I used to teach a class called the Black Male Youth Academy through the Social Justice Learning Institute, where we taught youth about identity, right, as black men and boys uh, within schools and how they're impacted by different systems, right? When you have an identity, when you are a black young person who also identifies as queer or trans, um, or you're questioning your identity, it's also really important to have dialogues in the classroom to think about what does that look like for myself, right? And so today, I'm in support of this resolution. But not only that, I want to encourage you all as board members to take an additional step to support not only keeping our students safe, but also keeping students who also are a part of the LGBT community safe. And for us, as the Police Really Use the Coalition of Students Deserve, that looks like enacting safe passage programs that each school can also have access to, to support young people getting to and from school, and additionally, right, a full defunding of LA School Police um, to ensure that that safety of our students can be reimagined without the use of police officers on campus. So again, to quote Marsha P. Johnson, there's not pride for some of us without liberation for all of us. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Michelle Lindsay, are you here? Michelle Lindsay, come on up. You'll have three minutes to speak once you begin. Hi, my name is Michelle Lindsay, and I'm a new parent of Students Deserve. My son is a 10th grader at Hamilton High School. I am in support of this resolution calling for LAUSD to commit and honor LGBTQ plus youth and community members. This is a great step towards a transformative learning environment for all students and marginalized groups. LAUSD could be doing so much more to, to support not just LGBTQ plus youth, which includes making sure we have safe passage, BSAP, and so much more. My son transferred from a charter school to Hamilton High. I was in awe of the B-side program and the students that are coming up through it. I am here to stand in solidarity with the students and make sure that their voices and my voice is heard regarding safe passage partnerships and continuing of BSAP in all schools in LAUSD. None of the demands that have been raised are controversial, and as a new parent, I will hope that my child see all these demands come to fruition. The superintendent's background of being this well-decorated man in his career in education while running in Miami-Dade District should continue now that you're here in LA. In 2012, you threatened to resign if a North Miami student was deported. You stated I took a position then, I stood with the students. You also told CBS Miami, at no point shall I allow my decision to be influenced by a threat to my paycheck, a small price to pay, considering the gravity of this issue and the potential impact of the health and well-being of students and dedicated employees. What will you lose, Mr. Carvalho, if you meet the demands of the LAUSD students? What will those against these demands gain? I hope and expect that you will do the right thing and stand with our students and parents as we call for the expansion of BSAP. I expect that the superintendent and his friends will stand with our students and approve more safe passage partnerships at the end of this year and not 2024. I expect for you all to stand with the students and defund the school police and replace them with programs like baby, peer counseling, mental health services, and et cetera. We may not look like you, but all kids, no matter what color, deserve to feel safe in I their community. I just want to remind you gently that this is for the Pride Rezo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Jennifer Lupo, I see you're on the line. Jennifer Lupo, if you're on the line, please press star six to unmute yourself. And you have three minutes to speak once you begin. Jennifer Lupo. Jennifer, I see you're on the line. Just press star six to unmute yourself, and you have three minutes to speak once you begin. Oh. Can, you, can you hear me? We sure can. Go ahead. Okay. Okay, great. Hello. My name is Jennifer Lupo. I am a crisis counseling and support PSW for LAUSD. I agree with the resolution to support and affirm LGBTQ students and staff. 
Your resolution states that you are renewing your commitment to supporting LGBTQ students and staff to feel safe and thrive academically and socio-emotionally. In order to do so, I strongly urge you to restore funding of crisis counseling and support PSWs, mental health consultants, TREE PSWs, Kinder Readiness, and Eric's PSWs. Ms. Lupo, we I want to remind you that this is for the uh, Pride Resolution under tab number yes. eight. Thank you. Yes. So two stats that I want to highlight. Suicide is the second leading cause of death among young people aged 10 to 24, and LGBTQ youth are at significantly increased risk. LGBTQ youth are more than four times as likely to attempt suicide than their peers. Mental health services are a matter of life and death. And without these critical infrastructures in place, school-based PSWs will be stretched even thinner. This is antithesis to your resolution to increase mental health support for LGBTQ students. Additionally, we offer assistance to PSW staff who identify as LGBTQ and help them as they navigate their role in the school. Staff wellness, recruitment, and retention will be impacted. I think of Sadakoy Elementary that experienced anti-LGBTQ attacks because of a book reading. A mental health consultant went out to respond to support the school. Who will be able to respond when you've decreased the team by half? When I was a school-based social worker and already licensed, I would still frequently consult with my mental health consultant when there were risk assessments to make sure that I did everything I could to keep the students safe. Without these supports in place for our social school social workers, these are some things that will happen. Unlicensed social workers will leave for employment that will provide them with clinical supervision and new and experienced PSWs will leave because they are stressed, burned out and not supported. This will only compound the mental health crisis we are in. When the PSWs that we do have leave the district for other opportunities, we need our staff to have the support they need in order to provide excellent and holistic mental health services to our LGBTQ students. Thank you for your time and consideration to fully restore funding to these positions. Thank you for your time. Vivian Freeman, are you here in person? Vivian Freeman, are you here? Vivian? Okay. Um, Dr. Paul Nakachian, are you here? Dr. Paul Nakachian. Come on up if you're here. Dr. Paul Nakachian. No need to run. Thank you so much, sir. Good evening, board members. Thank you for the opportunity. And um, I just want to um, show my support for this particular resolution um, as an Armenian gay man and a dad of a recently six months old daughter that I have. And it's very crucial to um, recognize, acknowledge some of the issues with the LGBTQ community, um, especially in light of the fact that uh, uh, teaching uh, tolerance among student body to recognize and understand our differences. It's through the acknowledgement recognizing our differences that we're going to be seeing our similarities. So it's an important first step to substantively recognize all these aspects. So I teach law school. I'm at the part of the University of Lebanon College of Law, um, Hispanic serving institution. So um, I do recognize some of the issues even in law school coming and being part of the pride movement and so on. Um, so it's a journey. So it starts much early on, and I think it's a vital importance that we recognize that. So I commend you for that effort to uh, acknowledge, irrespective of the fact that um, you might not have heard from um, other community members from the Armenian community. I'm here to, in support of that, on behalf of the student body itself, to um, convey to you that there are many of us who are in support of this. So congratulations, and I hope the work can continue, and um, I commend you on that. Thank you. Thank you for your time, sir. Sunitha Menon, are, he, are you here? Sunitha Menon, come on up. You have three minutes to speak once you begin. Thank you. Good afternoon, board members. My name is Sunitha Menon, and I'm the Managing Director of Operations for Equality California, the nation's largest statewide LGBTQ plus civil rights organization, passing legislation and electing pro-equality leaders up and down the state at the local, state, and federal level. 
It goes without saying that we're in a national state of emergency for LGBTQ plus people. We're facing daily attacks that are taking away our humanity, our civil liberties, and specifically targeting the healthcare and well being of LGBTQ plus youth. As a young, queer, Jewish, Indian child, I felt alone in school. There was a lack of diversity within the student population, the staff, and the teachers. There was no GSA, there was no Pride Month, there were no Pride flags, and no local Pride celebrations. Everyone around me seemed the same. Everyone was white, cisgender, and heterosexual. There was nothing letting me know that my differences mattered and that I would be, that I would be respected or that my experiences mattered. I look at the diversity of LAUSD and remember my own journey of identity and self-love. It warms my heart to know that the LGBTQ youth do not have to struggle the way that I did. But there is much more work to be done, and you all play a big role in that critical change. Today, you have the opportunity to remind LGBTQ plus students that they belong, that you see them and they are valued, that you recognize that the world is scary for them, but you will protect them and support them, that you will not stand for hate, homophobia, or transphobia in any of your schools. We know that LGBTQ plus youth who have access to affirming homes, schools, community events, and online spaces have reported lower rates of attempting suicide compared to those who have not. As the second largest school district in the nation, you can make a decision that sends a powerful message, not only here in California, but across the nation that LAUSD affirms, values, and supports all LGBTQ students, families, and staff. That all school systems in the nation, no matter how small or large, have the ability to do the right thing in these trying times. By supporting this resolution, you are on the right side of history. Equality California looks forward to continuing to partner with LAUSD to improve the lives of LGBTQ plus youth. We will continue to pay close attention to the school districts, especially those in California who are not protecting LGBTQ plus students. Thank you for your time and thank you for this resolution. Thank you for your time and I am informed that Katherine Anderson, one more public speaker, has uh, made it into the room. So you have three minutes to speak. Why don't you begin on the Pride resolution? Go ahead. Good afternoon. <clears throat> My name is Katherine Anderson. I have two 10th grade daughters at Hamilton High School, and my son, Matisse, is an 11th grade student also at Hamilton High School. I'm here as a parent, a member of Students Deserve. I'm in support of this resolution calling for LAUSD to commit to and honor our LGBTQ plus youth and community members. We are living in a time where our LGBTQ plus youth are at higher risk of bullying, of homelessness, death by suicide, and attempted suicides. This resolution will go a long way in ensuring that our LGBTQ plus youth feel safe and celebrated. And it's a great step in creating inclusivity in our schools so every child is authentically comfortable in their education. We strive to make sure through resolutions like this, through funding programs like BSAP, that our school board is responsive to underrepresented groups in our schools. It is important to send the message that you are listening and advocating for our youth when hope is in short supply for a lot of our kids. We are asking for your clear and public commitment to the LGBTQ plus resolutions. We're asking for your clear and public commitment to fund black student achievement programs. We're asking for your clear and public commitment to safe passage program that does not put our youth in the oppressive environment where school police can change lives through abuse of power in an instant. We want our children and teachers to be safe. We do not want anyone to be targeted by hate or violence, and I understand why some people think school police will protect our youth. It's resolutions like this, LGBTQ plus resolution, and more evolved safety through the Safe Passage Program, and funding for programs like BSAP that are the real pathway to safety. So let's make sure every single student goes to school feeling safe and celebrated. Thank you. Thank you for your time. And it looks like one more person has showed up. Vivian Freeman, are you here? Vivian Freeman, come on up. You have three minutes to speak on tab eight, Pride Rezo. Thank you. Hi. 
Um, hello, my name is Vivian Freeman. I am a sophomore at Eagle Rock High School, and I am a member of Students Deserve. I want to wish you a happy Pride Month and speak to you about um, what you can do as a school district to help us protect LGBTQ plus students. I'm sure I'm not the first student to come to you and tell you about the rampant homophobia that students face in our district. In my own school, I've seen countless students, especially trans students, and especially, especially trans students of color, be victimized by their peers. I've seen them jump through hoops to try and get a gram of justice with the lackluster and understated Title IX laws. I've seen them get nothing at all while their victimizers go free with no repercussions. In a world where queer students face abuse on a regular basis, what can we as a district do to honor Pride Month? What can we do to honor people who fought for these kids to be able to express themselves? We can protect them. The word gay or the word trans should not negate the word kid or the word person. Students have been asking for this kind of life-saving protection through the implementation of safe passage programs. The district has tried to use police, and it's done nothing to lower the amount of targeted hate crimes students face. If anything, we've only seen an increase in violence against students as a whole. In February at Garfield High School, student school police used pepper spray as a crowd dispersal agent against students, a clear infraction of LASPD policy, volume three, category three, article seven. This is an infraction to the T, but I guess since these are school police we're talking about, they don't need to see the consequences of their actions. Where is the justice? After kids suffer physically and psychological harm, by the hands of trigger-happy police, why are they surveying our schools like a prison? I want to remind you again, this is on tab eight, uh, Pride Resolution. Thank you. Yes. These, are school p these police are not effective. Please, we need safe passage programs to protect queer students who are seeing this kind of abuse very frequently. We see them working at Dorsey High School, but we want them at Eagle Rock, where I go to school. We want to see them, and we want them, we want them soon. It's, this protects us. This helps us. It's, it's boy, please help us honor LGBTQ plus rights activists like Marsha P. Johnson, Edith Windsor, or our Lord, and many others by protecting the new generation. We urge and expect you to unanimously agree to pass the Safe Passage Program proposal on June 13th, and we urge you to, sorry, and we, we urge you to immediately start implementing it. Change is not your enemy. It is a life-saving protocol. Thank you for your time. And thank you for your time. This concludes public comment on tab eight. Board Member Melvoin. Thank you, Ms. Goldberg, and thank you to our speakers. I'm proud to bring this resolution at an important time in our country and our city and our district and our history to stand up for LGBTQ plus rights. At its core, Pride Month is about more than just celebrating our LGBTQ plus community. It's about affirming the supportive welcoming and inclusive environments we strive to create year-round in our schools. You know, this resolution has seemed a bit perfunctory over the years. We'd bring it and we'd celebrate, but we thought that it was less needed here in Los Angeles, but more over there, wherever there may be. But as we're seeing the weaponization of public policy to sow hate and discrimination, it makes it all the more important for us to speak out against the act of hate and violence cropping up all around us, from legislatures across the country passing anti-LGBTQ plus bills to a cruel act of vandalism in our own backyard just a few days ago. These kind of incidents shake us out of our complacency and reiterate our commitment to inclusivity and creating safe spaces for our students and staff. And to combating misinformation, I think back to the resolution I did with Ms. Goldberg about criti critical media literacy. If you listen to protesters just last week, you would have thought a school was teaching a graduate level course about sexuality to five-year-olds. As Ms. Goldberg de demonstrated in the reading of the book, it's a book about our families and how some kids grow up with two parents and some one, about how some kids have a mom and a dad, about how some look like their pets, and about how some kids have two dads, like my niece and nephew, who in my brother and his husband have the best parents imaginable. All too often, our schools become the forefront of social wars, from racial integration to the Scopes trial about teaching evolution 100 years ago to the current vilification of LGBTQ plus in our schools. I love what Ms. Martinez said just a few minutes ago, that schools make our kids' worlds bigger. And that's what scares a lot of intolerant people. They want the world to be small. But we have a responsibility to prepare students 
for the realities of the world they live in. And it's a world that includes different types of families and people, and that's what makes it so wonderful and beautiful. And that's what we'll teach and celebrate, not just in June, but all year. I'm so grateful to my colleagues for their unanimous co-sponsorship and to our superintendent and his team for their unwavering support of our LGBTQ plus students, families, and staff. We see you, we support you, we'll defend you, we believe in you, and we love you. We love each and every one of you. Thank you. Other board members wish to speak? Mr. Schmerlson. Yeah, I just want to read a, a statement that I put in for a press release saying that I am proud to support this resolution and stand with the LGBTQ plus community. It is crucial that the LA Unified School District becomes a place of acceptance for our students, staff, and the entire community. Um, the LBTQ plus community experiences higher rates of discrimination, higher rates of violence, and higher rates of homelessness. Students cannot learn if they don't feel safe or they don't feel accepted. And at LAUSD, as Mr. Melvoin said, they will always have a place and a voice. And I just wish the entire LGBTQ plus community a happy and safe Pride Month. We join them in this celebration. Thank you, Mr. Melvoin. Chase Franklin. Thank you, and thanks for accepting my co-sponsorship. I'm particularly excited that this resolution brings together all uh, queer all year calendar and the many celebrations throughout the year because it is absolutely a decision every day to support all of our students, particularly our LGBTQ plus students, not just in June, but all year long. So I have pride today. Who else has pride in here? Yes. Thank you, team. Mr. Shin. Thank you. Uh, I think I've learned a lot, you know, serving in this position. And one of the things that I've learned is that the loudest voices in the room oftentimes do not represent the majority. And so when we see uh, in the news media or on social media about the hatred and intolerance in our communities, we know that that doesn't represent all of us. And so that's really what I think this resolution is about and what our celebration uh, of Pride Month is about, is that we are showing that a chorus of tolerance, of inclusivity, of welcoming is so much stronger than whatever ignorance or hate we see out in the community. I think um, there are a lot of politicians, uh, community agitators who find a path to power or fame in attacking our education system not by confronting the actual inequalities and issues that students face, but by attacking those students themselves for being who they are. And so this board and this district has an obligation to continue making sure that hate has no safe harbor in our LAUSD. Um, so I wanna thank the board for passing this resolution and standing up for our LGBTQ plus students uh, teachers and staff. Thank you. Thank you. Did you wish to make remarks? Okay. I don't. I, uh, I, I, know, I think she's here. I just want to make sure she can get connected. She just unmuted herself. You can go okay. ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, thank you so much. I appreciate uh, Mr. Melvoin bringing this resolution forward and accepting my co sponsorship. And uh, you said it well that now more than ever, it is so important that we create a safe and inclusive environment for all of our students, um, regardless of their sexual orientation, gender identity, or expression. It's clear that our LGBTQ plus community is under threat across the nation and even here in Los Angeles. Um, I am the representative for the area that includes Satakoy Elementary. And I want to make it clear that in the San Fernando Valley and beyond, hate and discrimination have no place in our schools and we must take a stand against it. This resolution sends a powerful and timely message that no matter the loud voices or obstacles, LUSD remains committed to promoting equality and acceptance. And we strive to foster an environment where every student feels safe, respected, and celebrated for who they are. This means creating safe spaces where students can express themselves without fear or judgment. 
as well as celebrating the diversity and unique perspectives that each of our students and families bring to our table. I was proud to work with LGBTQ plus students in my board district in June of 2019 to pass a similar version of this resolution that recognized Pride Month, but also deepened our supports for students, including updating our all gender restroom guide to ensure greater accessibility of all gender restrooms, adding new training for school staff on uh, students of diverse gender identities, and sought partnerships with the LGBTQ community organizations to further the work of creating safe spaces for our LGBTQ plus community. Um, and I hope that this resolution really prompts us all to think about inclusion in a much deeper way throughout all of our policies and supports for our LGBTQ plus students. Um, I urge all members of LUSD and the community to support this resolution and help us create a brighter future for our students and families. Thank you. Dr. McKenna, any comments? I didn't prepare any comments, but I'm persuaded to say something. Um, having been a principal of a high school in South Central Los Angeles, which was what it was called back then in the 80s, the school where the Crips gang originated, there was a lot of uh, male aggression against boys, young men who were gay. I had to deal with that by standing to the entire student body and saying, you shall not oppress anyone here. And because what we did became so successful at the district, what assigned students who were being oppressed in other schools to Washington High, Washington Prep, because they were safer there. And I felt good about that because I could see the change in the tolerance of the student body, particularly the male, black male students who stopped bullying and taunting and oppressing others that they thought were not them. I wish we had had something back then that was more universally accepted as a policy. But I turned it into a practice at Washington Prep. And I was told by the people who downtown, which at that time was 450 North Grand, that I had more, a greater percentage of gay male students, gay black male students at Washington than any other inner city school. And they said it to me as though they were surprised. I wasn't because I knew they were safe there. And I would say to the students, an affront to them is an affront to me. And none of you here want to affront me because you respect me and I love you. And there's nothing you can do about that. As if you don't like it, start loving yourself and you can help yourself love others. And I had all kinds of speeches I made, the gospel according to George McKenna. But it had to do with tolerance and acceptance, not acting like it made you stronger because you could pick on somebody you thought was weaker than you. I also gave him some examples. I said, a lot of you like to use physicality as a measure of your manhood. And so you pick on somebody because you think you're physically stronger. And I use this not only with People, especially the males, trying to oppress the girls and boys that they thought were weaker than they. So, you know, only two things happen when you oppress somebody on this campus and you fight with them. One is, if you beat them up, you're not going to get any, any uh, congratulations for that because you were picking on somebody you thought was weaker and I'm gonna give you a transfer. If they beat you up, you're gonna ask me for a transfer. Because if you pick on a girl and she beats you behind, you're gonna to wanna to leave because you're not gonna to wanna to come back the next day because you embarrassed yourself. This kind of recalls all of that. I wasn't prepared any notes, but I remember the atmosphere changed and we would get many more students who felt comfortable at the school 
not just from the gay community, but from others who felt because it was a place where Crips were born, you can turn students away from being Crips without having to transfer them. You can change them internally so they no longer feel the need to ride or die with their homeboys blood in and blood out and abuse other people as a way of proving their manhood. That's just a recollection from the past. Most of you in here weren't even born then, but you're here now. And we've come a long way. And I appreciate the resolution because it affirms that we're in a different place now in 2023. And we ought to stay different as we go forward. And I appreciate the resolution. All of you who, who, who uh, not only wrote it, but signed on to it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, of course, this is deeply personal for me. Um, I will say that nothing horrified me more than to see two persons in this room who represent district community, committees standing outside of a school, screaming at the loudest voices that they had, listen to the parents, they are, they are criminalizing the children. I read you the entire book. It had one sentence. Families can also be two parents that are mothers and two parents that are fathers. They were told, the parents at that school, that if it was very difficult for their children to be in that room, that they didn't have to be in the room. They announced the assembly, told all the parents, if this is a problem for you, we get it. You know, I've been confronting this issue my entire life. I have been threatened. I have been harassed. I've been denied jobs because of who I am and who I love. Now, a lot of people out there I talk to outside Satakai say, oh, I have a gay cousin. I have a gay nephew. I can't be homophobic. B.S. B.S. You can be homophobic and have a gay friend, a gay neighbor, a gay son, a gay anything. Talk to all the gay kids that get thrown out of their houses and onto the streets by parents who say, I won't have you in my house any longer. And tell me that having a gay relative means that you're not homophobic. But here's what really scares me. When you have two or three days of this kind of chaos, of people screaming at the top of their lungs, outside a school that read a book with one sentence in it that said, yeah, guess what? Families can include two moms and two dads. By the way, at the little discussion at the school after that, as soon as the book was over, one of the little girls sitting at my knees said, I have two mommies. But a little boy on my other side said, I have five grandmas. <laughs> the idea that there are different kinds of families the people screaming out at the streets, they didn't get a chance to find out about that because they made a decision based on hearsay. They made a decision based on agitators, not from their community, but from outside their community who saw an opportunity to take advantage of the real fears of people. I want to be very, very, very clear. Nobody has to accept me. I'm not looking for your acceptance but you better treat me the same way you treat everybody else. That's how we live in this country. You don't have to love me. You don't have to like me. You can think I'm the devil incarnate, but you better treat me like a decent human being because that's how I treat you, even though you don't believe that I have the right to exist. I am very tired of having young people and adults in the LGBT community hear uh, three days of yelling and screaming about this, what do you think that did to them? What do you think that did to every gay teacher, every gay custodian, every gay worker in this city, every gay kid? What do you think that did to them? It made them afraid. It made them afraid. How dare you make them afraid because you are. I'm sorry. I told you this was personal. 
I went through with this. My son was harassed because he had two mommies. But my grandchildren aren't. That's progress. But I say to all of you, nobody in this district will ever, ever sexualize any kid for any reason in any classroom in any way, shape, or form. And those of you who believe that this might happen are allowed to read the curriculum materials, are invited into the assemblies with your children, are invited not to have your children go to the assemblies. I do not believe in forcing a parent to have a child attend assembly that they feel would be violating their values. That's fine with me. We don't all have to agree. In fact, none of us all agree. But we are going to stand up and say to people shouting outside of a school and to the media that when you broadcast this in the way that you did, you frightened LGBTQ kids and adults in every school in this district and in this city. And we must take much more care about how we elevate an assembly reading a book with one line, one sentence, one sentence that said also there are families that have two mommies and two daddies. That was the terror outside of Sadakoy. I want to close by saying to those parents who were very afraid, I understand your fear. I'm not saying that there aren't people trying to make people afraid. There's one whole party in this country now whose whole campaign is to make everybody afraid of everybody else. Everybody afraid of everybody else. We're afraid of immigrants. We're afraid of black people. We're afraid of brown people, old Chinese people. We're afraid of gay people. We're afraid of this people. We're afraid of those people. Fear is not our friend. Love is. That was the Mount, Sermon on the Mount, and I'm Jewish, and I still say it. Love one another as you would, have, as you would be loved. Um, I think that's the rule we should have for absolutely everybody. But if you can't love me, at least don't bug me. <laughs> don't threaten me. Don't make me afraid. Treat me with respect. I'll treat you with respect whether we agree or not. Thank you very much. All right, Mr. Superintendent, you get the last word. I, I should not have a last word when, when I just heard your words, but I do want my position to be unequivocally understood. Um, as a result of what took place at Sadakoy and, and since, um, there's been a lot of hate mail. A lot of it coming from individuals outside of our community because hate is so easy to join. And what I just heard is the reality. No one in 2023 should feel that they have to go back into a dark corner or fear or feel disparaged or insulted just from being who they are. So in as much as uh, dissension continues and compassion, understanding, empathy, acceptance have been politicized in America today and polarized. The one thing one would hope is that public educational institutions do not do that which is easy, which is either not taking a side because not taking a side is accepting a side or being silent which that too connotes and denotes a selection. And I take pride in this board. I take pride in Board Member Melvoin's resolution. I take pride in every single voice that has spoken. And the last thing I will say is that, uh, you know, we ought to be in a position where we're okay with being excluded by some because we choose to include everyone rather than being included by those who choose to exclude some. We ought to make that decision. And there are no easy decisions when it comes to these matters.
So if all means all, we ought to be an educational institution that protects all, elevates all, dignifies all, and humanizes all. And silence is not an option. And one of the earliest speakers said it. We will stand for the immigrant. We will stand for the foster child, for the homeless child, for the gay child, for the undocumented child, for the black child, for the Latino child. Because who on the list do I leave out? And what right have I to make that decision, that selection? So I take pride in the actions of this board. And uh, the entire country won't agree with what we do here today. But then again, you know, history has a tendency of not recognizing right all the time, at the right time, for the right people. So Board Member Malvoin, thank you. To the entire board, thank you for your courage and your dignity in the protection of all the children that we serve. Thank you very much. All the vote. Uh, can I have a motion? <laughs> I'll move it. I'll second it. <laughs> Moved by Mr. Melvoin, seconded by Board President Goldberg. Uh, Dr. McKenna? Yes. Dr. Rivas? Mr. Schmerlson? Yes. Mr. Melvoin? Yes. Ms. Gomez? Yes. Ms. Ortiz Franklin? Yes. Board President Goldberg? Yes. Mes resolution passes. Uh, I would like Mr. Shin's advisory oh, vote, excuse please. Excuse me. I yes. Saw, okay, excellent. I Thank you so much. I apologize. I'm sorry. The resolution passes, y'all. Thank you very much. Now, of course, we have another dilemma. We try to start our, uh, our uh, public speaking that is not on uh, agenda items at 4 o'clock, but we did not conclude the superintendent's reports. So I'm going to ask him to conclude just the one report again, and then we will go to our various, uh, well, I guess we first have to do the um, public speaking on the items on the agenda, right? Okay, we'll take general, pu we'll do the superintendent's report, general public comment, and then we'll return to the uh, consent items. All right, Dr. Francis Baez, take two. <laughs> you who arrived uh, uh, for the four o'clock uh, public speaking time, we will have that as soon as we are finished with the superintendent's second report. We will hold all the other reports and the um, public speaking on um, agenda items till after we've heard uh, general public comment. Go ahead. Dr. Bias, thank you. I'm sorry to interrupt your okay. wonderful presentation. It's for a very meaningful purpose. Okay. All right, so slide 20. What? So to continue, uh, as you know, high-dose tutoring, focused virtual tutoring, and the variety of tutoring menu items are also uh, part of the strategy uh, that allows students to receive intervention and support them in addressing unfinished learning. Next, I will share with you uh, the multi-tiered system of support intervention models through the years, and I'm going to be starting with 2000. I will review the intervention models through the year starting with 2000 to 2010. Independent work time was a uh, system that was used during the implementation of open court under the Reading First program. Students worked independently while the classroom teacher provided small group instruction in the area of need to four to six students. This was also a, a, a strategy that was used and a lot of professional development was conducted during the summer for teachers to be able to deepen their learning in this area. Then the English language arts and English language development framework introduced the universal access time to ensure that we were uh, providing small group instruction for the neediest students uh, in, the, uh, in the classrooms. A response to instruction and intervention was introduced first in the special education space and scaled up throughout the district based on its research-based efficacy. All schools learned how to analyze data group students, personalized learning, and progress monitor. This was a very important first step for us to understand that pyramid and where we all knew that first good instruction uh, was the most important and that that would lead to 80% of our students meeting grade level standards. Intercession was also a trademark, signature practice in LAUSD. This was during the year-round days when students would go on vacation. And so we needed to provide students that additional time for them to close the gap 
and to come back to school uh, without that loss that tended to occur during summer breaks or intercession. And of course, Saturday school continued. In 2010 to 2018, a multi-tiered system of support was introduced, combining academic and behavioral support for students. In the realm of academics, District schools understood that we needed personalized learning strategies to reach students in tier two and three. The early language, uh, early language and literacy plan called for academy time where students mixed by homogeneous groups within grade levels so that focused instruction was conducted in the target skill. And of course, intercession continued. These were the times when there was a lot of professional development. This was the time of reading first, when there was lots of investment. So many teachers who were trained in open court uh, and in and, um, response to intervention and multi-tiered systems of support have now become educators that are now in the, been in the system about 30 years. But since then, there's not been a coherent approach for professional development in our system. As we follow the timeline to the present, it's become evident that we need to scale up the intervention supports that have helped some to a model that helps all students in need. This means that we are democratizing intervention. I call your attention to this quote from John Hattie, a renowned researcher who has conducted an 800 meta-analysis of 50,000 research articles, including 150,000 effect sizes from a cumulative sample of 240 million students. His findings show that a 1.07 effect size on response to intervention and student learning with a threshold of 0.2. He says that students learn regardless of what we do, but we need to ensure that the opportunities to learn are maximized. That's why you see the 0.2 threshold, because everything will work. But we need to make sure that we maximize the learning and we implement evidence-based approaches. The next slide will show you how we are scaling up intervention support. From 2020 to 2023, as we know, we've implemented the primary promise for grades K through three. And this was based on goals set forth in Reading by Nine initiatives. Reading and math action seminars were offered to school instructional leadership teams. Professional development was ongoing for primary promise teachers and incorporated the Orton-Gillingham approach and implementation of language essentials for teachers of reading. However, there was variability in the number of teachers at primary promise schools. For example, I can share that as a recent local district superintendent, I had school A, a high need school with three primary promise teachers and school B, a high need school blocks away with no primary promise teachers. In addition, we were vacating classrooms at a rapid rate when we were already feeling the effects of the teacher shortage. Moving forward, we will go from serving K through three students to serving K through 12 students. Given a combined funding approach with central and school funded dollars, K-12 students will be provided intervention support. We will provide an interventionist academy in literacy and numeracy in which all intervention teachers will receive professional development and guidance to best meet the needs of their diverse learners, where that had not been the case before. Summer professional development topics will include data analysis, grouping students, and providing small group instruction. There will be a homeschool connection to empower families as partners and provide them with tools and strategies to reinforce learning at home. This has been offered in a limited fashion with the primary promise. The next phase in a multi-tiered system of support includes moving from K-3 to grades K-12. This is possible with braiding central and school funding. When we combine dollars, we reach even more students. Going from a selection of schools based on pre-pandemic academic data, CENI status, and other factors, to assigning interventionists to 168 lowest performing schools moving forward. One-time dollars that end in September 2024 were used for the primary pr promise positions. Conversely, one-time dollars will be used for professional development for all of our teachers to sustain and expand interventionists in high-need schools. This is possible with the funding partnership approach between the central district and schools that leverage a variety of funding sources. With the primary promise, vacancies were created in classrooms causing substitute teachers to be assigned to those vacancies. In the literacy and numeracy model, interventionists will not be released until the classroom assignment is filled. 
With Primary Promise, action seminars were offered in English language arts and math for participating Primary Promise schools. And there was professional development for certain teachers. On the other hand, we will provide an interventionist academy for all schools with an interventionist to ensure a coherent approach across the system. Ongoing professional development will be offered in Orton-Gillingham, Language Essentials for Teachers of Reading, U.S. Math Recovery, Building Fat Fluency, and Intervention Cycles. In Primary Promise, there was limited parent engagement, and with the literacy and numeracy model, there will be family and community engagement to improve the homeschool connection and strengthen the teacher-parent relationship. We began communication efforts to schools in February, and this was the response from principals. Parent leaders and nonprofit organizations have provided their impressions of this literacy and numeracy model as well. Please take a moment to read these quotes. And I want to call your attention to the quote that reads, my school never received primary promise teachers, but we are looking forward to receiving interventionists next year to support students. I believe they would be able to support all grades. We continue now from voices from families and communities, parent leaders, and national literacy and nonprofit leaders. Personalized intervention is really only reaching a minority. The plan opens doors for all students to receive the intervention that they need, as well as trained classroom teachers so that the entire staff can provide the support to our students. Moving on, another parent leader says, in all honesty, to be in a country like the United States where reading is not being learned by most of the student population is an embarrassment. Quality intervention should be expanded to those that need it. And this is the kind of training that we will be providing Teachers and principals will receive summer professional development, beginning with our teachers the days of August 7th through August the 10th. Our teachers will receive uh, professional development and small group instruction, literacy and numeracy, beginning of the year planning based on the student data that they have at the time. Principal Leadership Institute will be from July 26th through July 28th to support teachers throughout the year in literacy and numeracy. This has not been done in many years. A series of professional development sessions will be offered to interventionists throughout the year, consisting of data analysis, student grouping, use of high quality instructional materials that are evidence-based and proven to work, and co-planning. In the final slides of my presentation, I want to show the number of schools that were centrally funded and filled positions from the 2020 through 2021 school year and 2022 through 2023. You can see it went from 138 to 257, and then to 283 centrally funded and filled positions. However, in 2023 through 2024, there are 449 schools with centrally and school funded positions, expanding our reach to even more schools. With the new model, there will be an increased reach of students from the populations listed here. You can see that by right-sizing the supports and combining the dollars that are school-funded and centrally funded, we've increased our reach of the stu student populations you see listed here. Black students will go from 4,415 to, 400, 4, to potentially reaching up to 20,062 black students. For Latinx, we'll go from 50,744 to potentially reaching up to 215,964. As we move down the list, you can see that the new model will increase the, the reach of the most vulnerable students. As I conclude, I want to reiterate that LAUSD will continue to provide intervention to students. The district is not cutting intervention programs. Instead, the district is scaling up a sustainable academic intervention model for K-12 based on today's students' needs and the resources of today. I also want to emphasize that we're not ending early literacy pro programs. Those are fundamental and essential to students learning to read and then reading to learn. This enhanced model will ensure the sustainability of intervention model without a loss of positions. 
And in the coming year, we will build on the successes of primary promise. And I want to emphasize, we're going to build on the successes. But we needed to address the misalignment and also understand that there was a breach of equity and that we needed to right-size the district to ensure that the neediest students were receiving the services. The Los Angeles Unified School District will always be focused on a strong intervention that is sustainable, scalable, and effective. By leveraging the dollars across the system on strengthening our tier one instruction, all teachers will be supported with providing first core instruction. I wanna remind you about the pyramid. The goal is always to get to the pyramid. 80% of our students should be at grade level when good core instruction is taking place. And that requires professional development teachers to collaborate with one another, observe one another, and work as an instructional team. An intervention program will provide a structure to support the neediest students. And here's just a limited list of references that we use to inform our practice uh, in LA Unified when it comes to an evidence-based intervention model. And that concludes my presentation on the evidence-based intervention models that will help our students be ready for the world. I'm open to questions. So Madam President, uh, to, uh, to sum up this, uh long but comprehensive presentation that didn't just address primary promise and a necessary shift, it gave a universal perspective at great level of detail as to what the theory of action is moving forward to provide comprehensive intervention support uh, to all grade levels, both in literacy and numeracy. Uh, considering, as we've detailed before, even in the previous presentation, what will no doubt will be a tough year uh, as we hit uh, September of 2024, and uh, the funding behind Primary Promise currently uh, supporting those programs sunsets. So demystifying and debunking some of the rumors, innuendo out there. Uh, primary Promise works. That's why we are evolving it. That's why we are revamping it. Secondly, Primary Promise works. For the students, it was touching not scalable the way it was organized or funded. That is why we're revamping it, ensuring the democratization of intervention, scaling up to all grade levels, and achieving a tiered uh, approach to students uh, that will be addressed on the basis of their proficiency. The last point, as we said earlier, yes, there will be some degree of inconvenience. But if we do nothing, the inconvenience will become a cessation of the intervention as we know it. There is no way of turning back the clock and forcing a, the reappearing of the funds that will sunset in 2024. And that is why we've decided to take this direction. I will accept, as does this team, any criticism over the fact that uh, maybe this information is coming somewhat uh, late in the year. But we put a lot of thought into making decisions about how best to approach intervention to our district. We put a lot of thought into the research that currently exists. And we spent about 10 times the amount of time in explaining the evolution of intervention in the district as was spent in the launch of Primary Promise. This is the approach we'll take. At the end of the day, it's the approach that has provided results across the country and around the world. And that's why we're moving forward. Thank you very much, Madam President. Fortunately, I'm going to ask you to hold your questions and comments and go right now to public comment because we are 40 minutes late from doing that. I know that those of you who came to talk on items on the agenda, we are going to come back to that. But we try as much as we can to keep to 4 o'clock or as round quickly as we can. Thank you, doctor. We'll call you back up uh, a little bit later. And now, uh, Mr. McLean, let's go through. Let me remind you that these folks that are on public comment can talk about anything they want for their three minutes. But when we go back over the ones that are talking on particular items on the agenda, we're going to require you talk about the item on the agenda. That's why we have public comment for any comment anybody wants to make to this board and this superintendent. Mr. McLean. Okay, uh, ready for general public comment on anything related to the business of the Los Angeles Unified School District. Common areas, are you here? Come on up, Common. You have three minutes to speak once you begin. If I, if I mispronounce your name, please tell me how to do it right, please. Come on up, you'll have three minutes to speak once you begin. 
My name is Kaylin Banks, and I'm a leader with Students Deserve. I'm a ninth grader at RFK UCLA Community School, which is in board member Excuse Jackie me, just Gomes. a minute. You're not Cayman Arias. No, no, do, is, is Cayman Arias giving you your t her time? Or yeah, well, how, how's this working? I just want to know. What's yeah, this? they'll be back in a second. But I'm, I'm sorry? Yeah, they're splitting time, but they'll be back in a second. What is your name? So Caleb Banks is gonna is gonna speak until Common gets here. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I just, okay. I'm just so let's to get let's restart station. the timer, pretty yes. please, and yes. then um, we're just gonna we're just gonna do the three minutes. So if if Common gets here a little bit late, I'm sorry, but um, they will have lost a little bit of their time. Oh boy. Oh, here comes. I have a feeling I know who this is. That worked. <laughs> okay, so if you welcome, Caleb. <laughs> As a quick note, if you're going to split time, we, we just, we just, the clock keeps going, so I'm saying don't waste time when you split it. And we're Give starting it over your quickly. time over. So the timer has started over. Uh, Ms. Banks, please proceed when you're ready. My name is Kaylin Banks, and I'm a leader with Students Deserve. I'm a ninth grader at RFK UCLA Community School, which is in board member Jackie Goldberg's district. As a community, Students Deserve has been fighting against injustice in our schools because that's what leaders do. Leaders step up and take action, and that is exactly what Students Deserve is doing right now. If we want to change the outcomes for the future of black students, then we need a fully defund school police. Police aren't needed at schools. They stopped being needed when they started to harass the black youth in our community. They stopped being needed when black students were being profiled and accused simply because their skin color is looked upon as a threat. School police aren't needed on campus because there are other resources that can provide safety for us. Real safety means more counselors, parents, and community members who can support students without violence as their first response. Real safety means that we are investing in community-based violence prevention, intervention, and de-escalation programs like Safe Passages. We think that it is important for you and the district to pass the Safe Passage resolution so that we can build systems for school safety without police. Counselors and community programs are proven to be more effective at preventing violence than police officers. Invest in safety measures that actually keep us safe. Thank you for your time. Okay, hi. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Kamen Arias, and I am a rising senior, and I am a leader in Students Deserve. I go to UCLA CS RFK in Jackie Goldberg's district, and I'm here to advocate against bringing in school police back on campus, and here to advocate for Safe Passage. The school I go to has already implemented Safe Passage, since I have heard that you guys are struggling whether or not you guys want to implement this in schools, I'm going to tell you some experiences and changes I've seen in my school since this has been implemented. So. Bilingual, kind, and caring, these are people who live in our neighborhoods. These are families of some students, aunts, grandmas, moms. These are people who genuinely care for our students. When it comes to keeping our students safe, it has to make our students feel safe. Safe Passage has allowed students to create, to create positive relationships with the people who monitor them at schools. Students talk with hall monitors and they feel no fear. They are not intimidated by the, by the monitor as they would feel with a cop when they have pepper spray on them or guns. Police are trained to detain, handcuff, and arrest. They do not de-escalate, but rather escalate situations. According to the BSAP survey conducted by the Police Free LAUSD Coalition, 50% of students actually demanded safe passage programs. So listen to the voice of your students. We are the ones who have to be in these schools five days out of the seven days in a week. We are the ones who are impacted by these changes. Fully defund the school police because they are not needed when we have a safer solution. Listen to our voices because to keep us safe, we have to feel safe. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Adrian Sandoval, Adrian Sandoval, come on up. You have three minutes to speak once you begin. Good afternoon, Good Superintendent time. Cavallo and esteemed members of the Board of Education. My name is Adrián Sandoval and I am the Senior Director of Policy and Advocacy with GPSN. Yesterday, we sent a letter in support of the district's literacy and numeracy intervention model signed by almost 30 organizations from across Los Angeles. I have copies of the letters for, here for you. On behalf of the over 250,000 students and families that our organizations serve across Los Angeles Unified, we expressed our support for the district's implementation of the literacy and numeracy intervention model. In addition to the students and families that we collectively represent, many of us are also parents of district students. 
Primary promise was a responsive to a moment in time, but we have now adopt a board adopted strategic plan in line with the board's vision and goals. We have a superintendent who has assembled a team of talented professional experts with deep roots in Los Angeles Unified to implement the plan. To fully realize the promise of the districts ready for the world strategic plan, we must be nimble to changes that align, and, uh, align to the plan and actualize the plan. This new intervention model is an appropriate evolution informed by student-centered decision-making that focuses on priority schools and high-needs com communities. Now more than ever, it is time for the district to prioritize initiatives that yield systemic change and ensure literacy for all. This means pursuing efforts that are scalable and proven to be effective. The literacy and numeracy intervention model has the potential to impact more students through a holistic approach that is financially sustainable. The great expansion, especially to middle school, is timely because these are the students who experience 18 months of virtual learning during their critical elementary years. As the state of California forecasts financial deficits, it is important that the district's initiative align with the strategic priorities. It is equally important that the efforts are focused on maximizing the number of students uh, to make the greatest impact on improving educational outcomes. We applaud the district's inst instructional leaders in developing an initiative that is responsive to student data and fiscal re realities. We also appreciate transparency and engagement of families and students and community. We encourage the board to request regular updates and ev evaluate the implementation of the literacy and numeracy intervention model. If the model is not realizing the promise of better educational outcomes and opportunities for students, then just as the primary promise model must evolve, so should the literacy and numeracy intervention model. We thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Thank you for your time. And, uh, you can... Okay, thank you. Uh, Nicole Pfefferman, you're here in person. Come on up and you'll have three minutes to speak once you begin. We're going to share time. Okay, and I'll, I'll just say again, uh, when you we're, cut we're, it, we cut it. We're talking together. It's fine. Thank you. First, we want to say that we wholeheartedly support today's resolution in support of our LGBTQ plus families. We want to recognize that this isn't a subject that children are being taught. These are the families who live next door and the students sitting next to your child at recess. This is LAUSD. We are here today to speak on behalf of parents, teachers, staff, and students who are asking you to not get rid of primary promise. Today's presentation claims you aren't cutting the program, but that is absolutely what is happening. When you dilute a program until it is simply a dressed up version of what teachers are already doing at school every day, that is cutting the program. The point of primary promise is to eliminate the need for later intervention. If we keep on using Band-Aids, we will never fix the root problem. So my main takeaway from the presentation is that you love primary promise so much that you want teachers to do it themselves. There is no money for intervention, except <clears throat> there is money for intervention. And we aren't reaching enough students at 400 schools, so we are scaling up, but going to 168 schools. I taught elementary school, and small group instruction is great, except that every two minutes you get interrupted. I have to go to the bathroom, I see a bug, somebody touched my hair. It's very hard to do. You can provide all the PD in the world, but nothing can compete with a room full of six-year-olds. Our middle and high school students do desperately need intervention, and without targeted intervention for our youngest kids, they always will. Data is the foundation of primary promise. It was dis disconcerting to meet with some of you and hear you say the data isn't available, when you can see it on the walls of every single primary promise classroom. Why did you not receive a report after all of the middle of the year results came in? We had teachers show us their classroom data and the results are astounding. Kids who started out unable to identify letters proudly read their new favorite book out loud to their families. Primary Promise isn't revolutionary, as you said, but it is a widely supported and targeted instruction model. The proposed replacement is a one-size-fits-all program that, amongst other concerns, proposes hiring two people to do the job that one person is successfully doing now, which in a conversation that repeatedly references cost seems like an unnecessary expense. It has yet to address how it specifically meets the unique needs of English language learners or how it's gonna separate the needs of a six-year-old from a 14-year-old. We need to look back to look forward. Acceleration days were implemented unilaterally with no plan in place and ended up being a costly intervention attempt with zero data supporting measurable impact. Yet that's still included in the approach. Why are we continuing to use diminishing ESSER funds for an intervention that didn't work? Why aren't we using this money for primary promise? 
So Primary Promise is successful because the staff is highly trained in Orton Gilling and methodology at district cost. The staff was protected from doing other school duties and its pull out small group model allowed for focused daily student support. We need to retain these key components of Primary Promise no matter what name you want to call it and we're asking you to commit to what is actually working for students. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Ariah Blakely, are you here? Ariah Blakely, come on up. You'll have three minutes to speak once you begin. Hi, LAUSD board members. My name is Araya Blakely, and I'm with the Strategy Center and Strategy and Soul Social Justice Clubs in Roosevelt and Hawkins High School. As the school year comes to a close, I urge the board to implement the BSAP community safety pilots as we reimagine solutions to address drug use in on-campus bathrooms. In response to drug use concerns, there's a general trend of closing the bathrooms from students, despite how bathrooms are essential for all of us. Let me be clear, punishing students for drug use is an extension of the war on drugs that targeted black people and emboldened the LA School Police Department in targeting black students. When bathrooms are unstocked, never open, or restricted to a few bathrooms open on campus, students feel unable to use the restroom eight hours a day, five days a week. Some students have told me that they wait to use the bathroom at home because this resource is unreliable. Some campuses have limited bathrooms open during passing periods, but rarely during class. Many campus bathrooms lack toilet paper and menstrual products, plus the stalls don't close and the sinks don't work. The Black Student Achievement Plan is shifting LAUSD's focus to address the needs of the whole student, and the bathrooms are absolutely a part of that. In 2021-2022, only 31% of students had excellent attendance in comparison to 73% the year prior. Why would students show up when they don't have the necessities to be supported? The Police Free LAUSD Coalition reminds us that police are, not a, re are a reactionary armed force who don't deter crime. Going to school or the bathroom is not a crime. Rather than closing bathrooms, relying on police presence, and enforcing punitive policies targeted at black and Latinx students, the board should expeditiously implement the community safety pilots in full proposed by BSAP. Based on previous reporting, we saw that there has been misappropriation of funds designated for community safety pilots. This is the typical bait and switch by colonial institutions while LAUSD students are in need. LAUSD, stop playing chess while students' lives are on the line. The district is wondering, why are the bathrooms being misused by students when the question should be, why do students feel that the bathroom is a safe haven? The answer to the latter is that students feel unheard and pessimistic that change is possible in LAUSD. This is not purely a bathroom issue, but rather it points to the culture you create for students. Students don't, don't show up for school or they look for safe spaces away from the classroom when they are on campus. As LAUSD reimagines solutions to drug use on campus, black, Latinx, and other marginalized students need to be involved in that process directly, which will result in safer schools that students want to show up for. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Deanna Guillen, I think you're out there. Deanna Guillen, you'll have three minutes to speak once you begin. Uh, if folks in the audience would like to hear what Ms. Guillen has to say, she's going to speak in Spanish. If you want simultaneous translation, you pop on these headphones and you will hear in English what she is saying as she is speaking it here in the boardroom in Spanish. So um, Ms. Guillen, if you could just hold on a sec while we hand those out. Um, I'll give you a thumbs up when it's time to go. Each headset is automatically uh, uh, turns on once you put them on, and it should be on channel two. Channel two is the English channel. Thank you for your patience, Ms. Guillen. You're good to go. Hola, buen Hi, good afternoon, members of the board. My name is Diana Guillen, and I am the DLEC chairperson for the last four years. And today, 
the last time that I was here, I congratulated the African American community with giving the follow up with their historic narrative because they have also been a very discriminated race. I want to congratulate the community that identifies as LGBTQ and I want to share that there is a homogenous elite that is creating hate reactions from other groups because they don't know the suffering of the poor LGBTQ people. And that is a problem that this group has an, a privileged agenda and not the truth and the needs of the LGBTQ community. When, Ms. Goldberg, I want to say, when will you push for a resolution against the discrimination for the indigenous people of Latin America because this happens in every single one of the schools when there isn't even a, a translation. When will you push for a proposition, a proposal for a curriculum that tells the real tale of our indigenous people and not just the story of those that were victorious? Just like you feel proud to be Jewish, I also feel proud to be Mexican and to be Aztec. And that is the community that I represent, all of the indigenous community. And I also want to say something about the primary promise because the teacher union is pushing for this, for this agenda to continue. I am from MacArthur Park School where the majority of our parents are indigenous and we have the primary promise. And I want to say that I I asked for data from the person at the school and she said that she was giving intervention to 39 students. And in six months, the only thing that this person was able to do is to put nine children at the grade level. Do you think that is something that is good for our students? It sounds good, the narrative, but in reality, it is not working because the teachers are not giving the information the instruction, academic instruction that our students need. I also want to say that we parents need in the community, not the organizations that do not represent us, the parents, we do need school police within the uh, schools and outside of the school. Ask the parents, the organizations that come here to talk on behalf of us are not representing us legitimate parents at the Los Angeles Unified School District. We parents want the safety of our children and we need for this policy, police, along with the other services, counseling, whatever you want to be within the school. But right now, there's a lot of drug sales inside and outside of the school, and drug consumption is reaching our children and all the communities, not just LGBTQ, but also our, our community of poor or low income, and that is 74%. Thank you. Uh, folks, keep keep your headsets because we will have other other people who are speaking uh, in Spanish primarily. Okay, uh, Marie Morgan, are you here? Marie Morgan, are you here? Come on up. Okay, there she is. Miss Morgan, I see you're on the line. Press star six to unmute yourself, and you have three minutes to speak. Once you begin, Marie Morgan, press star six to unmute yourself, and you have three minutes to speak. Once you begin. Marie Morgan, I see you're on the line with us. Please press star six to unmute yourself and you'll have three minutes to speak. Um, if you don't come up soon, we will return to you at the conclusion. There you are. Hello? Hi. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah, we sure can. Hi. Okay, thank you very much. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, good afternoon, Superintendent and LAUSD board members. I'd like to respond to the change of the primary promise program. I desperately encourage and urge you to not change or disrupt this program. I have a seventh grader who, while in elementary school, was part of this amazing program, and without this program, I know for sure he would not be thriving as he is today. When my son was in kindergarten, we noticed something very concerning about his reading, and it greatly concerned us. Receiving the DIPL testing results crushed us each, crushed us each time. It was consistently saying that he was reading below average, and no matter how much the teacher in class tried to help, he was not grasping the concept of putting sounds and words together. In the year that followed, we decided to explore a 504 and eventually we received an IEP due to his learning disability. Part of his learning, uh, his IEP was to be placed in primary promise 
to help him with his reading challenges. This small class approach was very helpful for him and he made him feel very comfortable in knowing that other students were just like him. Ms. Jennifer Garcia, who was his teacher, did an amazing job and he still reflects on how important she, uh, she to him during this time. In speaking to him yesterday, he said, changing to a different model, especially one of a virtual aspect would be horrible for him and other students. They are tired of being pushed to virtual solutions. Virtual is not always the answer, nor is asking the teachers to take on more responsibility by coaching them, coaching them in this, these areas. They need to be able to be in small group in person, small in-person groups with specific guidance. My suggestion is that you ask the students who have gone through this program how they feel about it. My son has never been asked until I mentioned that it may go away how it is now. He really felt strongly about what, what he was able to get from the program and what it meant to him. While I appreciate you listening to us on this, this is not the time to test the waters by blowing out a program when these students are already struggling. Are you willing to quickly pivot should the data on this new improved program show decline performance? Because if it fails, it means failing our students, our, our children, and ultimately our future. Thank you, very much. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Let's see. Chanel Gaines, are you here in person? Chanel Gaines? Yes. Chanel Gaines, are you here? Okay. Pamela Cohen, are you here in person? Okay, thank you. My name is Pamela Cohen. I'm an advocate for struggling readers and students with dyslexia. Uh, I hope, uh, Carval Superintendent Carvalho, I really would like you to stay for this statement, please. I would really appreciate it since we're not being allowed. Okay. Um, I, want to, uh, I want to speak here on the superintendent's new literacy model. I'm really sorry he's not here to hear it. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Board Member Schmerlson, for pressing to have this topic on the agenda today because we would not have had the transparency in this presentation without additional pressure. It would have just been pushed through. I'm glad to hear it stated that primary promise works because two weeks ago the superintendent told us primary promise is dead. That's a quote. As an advocate for struggling readers, a model of primary promise is what we've been advocating for for five years. Small group instruction in a protected pull-out setting using structured literacy. Teacher data, including Dibbles, the breakthrough study of July 22, shows primary promise is working with this pull-out intervention. The superintendent wants to replace primary promise. Don't mistake it. That's what's happening. The elementary component of intervention. He wants to replace it with an old model. It's, if you look carefully at what the presentation said, it's using interventionists to coach classroom teachers and push into the classroom. This is not intervention. This is full classroom intervention. It's not a model that works. Ask anyone who is an open court teacher working uh, in the early 2000s. Um, what we're looking for is, um, I'm gonna go quickly. Superintendent let go of highly trained primary promise teachers. Many of them have found new positions, casting to the wind their training and experience. Now the new highly inter newly hired interventionists come in without this training. They will get on the job training. Basically, untrained interventionists will be coaching teachers in the classroom. This is not a financial issue. The superintendent found funds for his new intervention model. His model emphasizes a push into the classroom with the burden of intervention on overwhelmed on pull out small group intervention, assure the interventionists are already trained in OG and structured literacy. Um, here's a teacher testimonial. Students love coming to Primary Promise. For many of them, it's the only place where they feel successful as a student because the instruction is at their level. They're proud of themselves and their work. All of us in Primary Promise are devastated for our students why is the district not prioritizing a program that is shown to be successful? What will happen to our students now? Thank you. Thank you for your time. Let's see, Beth Newman, are you here in person? Beth Newman?
I hear someone saying Chanel Gaines. I uh, called Ch uh, Chanel. Are you here? I'll come back to you, but I, we're trying. We're just going to go as orderly as possible. Yeah, we'll come back to Miss Gaines. Th please go ahead. Thank you. Hello, uh, Superintendent and members of the board. We have some materials for you. So I am Beth Newman, and I'm ceding my time to Gisela Gutierrez. Good afternoon, my name is Gisela Gutierrez, and I'm a mental health consultant with School Mental Health and the UTLA Chapter Chair for Region East. Over the last couple of years, our unit grew exponentially and has nearly doubled with over 783 PSWs. School Mental Health developed and enhanced infrastructures and systems of support to address the growing mental health crisis. Now this is being dismantled by eliminating significant programs and reassigning over 60 positions. P.I. Escudero explained that the reassignments are to fill school-based vacancies followed by, I quote, our priority is the services that most directly impact our school campuses, end quote. The narrative here is that because we're not assigned to a specific school, we have less direct impact on schools and students. Well, that's wrong. We service many schools. Our crisis counseling and support services supports 264 PSWs with clinical supervision on a weekly basis to meet our board's licensure requirements as well as our ethical and legal clinical best practices. In addition, they provide the quality assurance of our billing documentation, generating millions of dollars to LAUSD. 38 mental health consultants, including myself, have been in the trenches and the front lines, side by side with our school-based PSWs, crisis team members, administrative teams, operations, and other LAUSD departments. We responded to over 12,000 consultations just this year alone, and provided approximately over 500 trainings of professional development on crisis response bulletins and mental health related topics, in addition to hundreds of parent workshops. Above all, we have been the lifeline called upon to support the most critical crises at our schools involving deaths, suicide, community and school violence, child abuse, and most recently, a parent protest at Sadakoy Elementary where six mental health consultants provided crisis counseling to our teachers. What part of all the work I just mentioned sounds like we are not a part of the services that most directly impact students and schools. This goes against the alignment of student education and mental health, and in contradiction of the, gover the governor's behavioral health plan. Reassigning us to fill school-based vacancies is a band-aid that will bring up bigger problems of liability, staff retention, and burnout and systemic issues. That's your real Armageddon. I stand before you to ask the board to exercise the checks and balances. Superintendent Carvalho, your response to my colleagues this morning was inappropriate and not of a leader hearing your constituents. How can 18 positions do the intensive work of 75 people? A reduction in supports is not protecting programs. How is this supporting our pillars in our strategic plan of joy and wellness and investing in staff? LAUSD board members, in closing, I ask you to revisit your priorities and ask, is this the mission that you entrusted the superintendent to achieve? I hope not, and we ask that you help restore school mental health and demonstrate your commitment to the mental health and well-being of all community stakeholders in LAUSD. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Chanel Gaines, Chanel Gaines, are you here? Come on up, Ms. Gaines. You'll have three minutes to speak once you begin. Hello, my name is Chanice Thomas, and I'm here speaking on behalf of Chanel Gaines. I'm a ninth grader at King Drew, and today I'm here to represent the students who cannot be here today, and every student in my school who were traumatized by the event that took place in the early hours of April 25th. A body was found on our campus, thrown in the bushes like it wasn't, like it wasn't a big deal. That body sat there for hours, and when police finally arrived at our school, when police finally arrived, our school was taped off, scaring me and many of my peers. My school never came out with the info, and we, and we relied off rumors, which eventually led to a student-led walkout. My point today is that that body could have been a student, or a teacher, or anyone. I have been, I have been followed, catcalled, harassed, and many other horrible things, and it's always been blamed on the fact that I go to a school in Watts. Now, personally, I don't, believe my I don't believe my safety, and maybe even my life, depends on whether or not I live in Watts, or somewhere with white schools. So please hear me out when I say Safe Patches Program is the best thing for LAUSD schools. The thought of my mother waiting for me to return home when I may never will and it being blamed on the area of my school breaks my heart and it makes me scared for the future of LAUSD. I will not back down when I say that the Safe Passage Program is a matter of protecting our students' lives. So now decide, 
You protect your ego or you protect every LAUC student's life. Thank you. I yield my time. Good afternoon, board. My name is Sakibu Hutchinson. I'm a parent member of Students Deserve, and I'm the co-founder of the Black LGBTQ Plus Parent and Caregiver Group and the Women's Leadership Project, which provides programming for black girls and queer youth in South LA schools. I want to express my support for the Pride Resolution. I also want to urge the board to make good on your professed commitment to promoting equity and self-determination for black students by expanding the BSAP program and ensuring that the lived experiences of black queer youth and families are affirmed. As a parent of a non-binary student in Hamilton, I have seen the academic and cultural benefits of BSAP firsthand. My child and others have received academic support from the school's BSAP team. However, transitioning into the next phase of implementation, the district should strengthen targeted culturally responsive programming and trauma-informed mental health supports for black girls, black queer youth, and gender expansive youth who are experiencing record rates of sexual and domestic violence, including sex trafficking. We know that black girls have some of the highest rates of domestic sex trafficking in the US experiencing high rates of push out, criminalization, suicide, and homelessness. And while it is indeed wonderful to celebrate Pride Month, especially in the midst of this toxic anti-LGBTQ plus backlash, black and BIPOC queer youth need year-round support. They need black affirming intersectional curricula. We need black affirming LGBTQ plus parent education, not token gestures from the district in order to redress rampant anti-blackness, misogyny, homophobia, and transphobia. For these reasons, safe passage intervention, intervention uh, programs are critical for our black girls and our black youth across sexuality because they have some of the highest rates of incarceration. And if you truly want to be down and you truly want to be queer affirming, you will abolish the police state regime on your campuses because to quote the black queer poet and visionary Audre Lorde, the master's tools will never be used to dismantle the master's house provide our students with the educational reparations that they so justly deserve. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Yoli Flores, are you here? Yoli Flores? Okay. Maisha, Maisha Kiff, are you on the line? Maisha Kiff. Maisha Kiff, if you're on the line, press star six to unmute yourself. I see you're there, and you've unmuted yourself. You have three minutes to speak once you begin. Okay, can you hear me? We yeah. sure can, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is Maisha Keefe with the Los Angeles Urban League. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Um, I'm also a parent um, of children in the LAUSD, and uh, we support the sustainable literacy and numeracy um, intervention model. Um, this model will increase the number of student supporters as well as supporting high school students whom at this time are in the crisis in academic achievement. Um, change is needed right now and we feel that Dr. Estrada and her team will be able to implement this model greatly. Um, I'll be brief um, because I know there's others uh, wanting to speak but I just want to encourage uh, the board and everyone to assist um, all of the um, organizations, the parents and everyone who is assisting with um, closing that achievement gap um, that is mostly affecting um, black, brown, indigenous and underserved students. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, let's see, Eliana Coindreau, are you here? Eliana Coindreau. Come on, Nathie, you have three minutes to speak once you begin. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Eliana Cuandro. Good afternoon to all of these board members. Good afternoon, Mr. Carvalho. It's nice to see you again. My name is Eliana Cuandro. I'm a student from LA High, and I, I am a member of Students Deserve. I just moved here from Mexico City in January, so this has given me the opportunity to see a lot of problems that are going around in my school. And I am here to talk to you about the wellness of the students and how to improve academic achievement for a bigger performance. I think it is extremely necessary to ensure 
mental wellness first on the students. Currently, we do not have a school therapist in my school. He has been missing for three months. Any young kid that is struggling is being transferred to the school counselors. The school counselors, they are only required to help us out with our academic future, but they are unprepared to handle complex subjects as such as anxiety or depression. They are unprepared too to bring services that only a school therapist could bring us. For me, as a new st student hearing this, it was heartbreaking to know. I am able to recognize the deep generational traumas that are walking through the hallways in my school, where the kids, they are not criminals, they are not violent people, they are just the seeds of society's neglection. Even if they are not capable or know well enough, they need mental health support. It is evident, it is seen in the, the failing grades, it is seen in the misbehaviors beha behavior, it is seen in the absences. I know we believe in a bright future for all of the people equally, and we believe that minorities now can succeed. But this is not possible until we are able to arrange and bring a solution for the deep-rooted problem, which is providing mental health for students. Kids are only the reflection of society's pressure, and the world they are being forced to strive in is not getting any easier. In my peer counseling class, I experienced this. I had the opportunity to talk with one of my classmates. He was very sad. He looked in a lot of pain. He did not want to participate. But then after a few seconds, he started opening up and I told him I was there to support him. And if he needed anything, he could count on me. And I could see in his eyes how that changed him and how he started participating more after that. He even went with a smile at the end of the class. There, I realized that kids, they are never the problem. They are not criminals, they are not rebels. They are only a reflection of a lacking mental health system. And I think, as a society, we need to guide them through it. We need to have more mental health resources, and we, we need to be more active with them. So how are we expected to thrive if we're lacking if we're lacking this guidance. We need to apply pressure to the system and we need to put more money into adequate mental health support systems that we can count on and we need it now. Thank you very much. Okay, going back to Yoli Flores. I see you're on the line. Yoli Flores, I see you're on the line. Please press star six to unmute yourself and you'll have three minutes to speak once you begin. Thank you. President Goldberg, members of the board, Mr. Superintendent and cabinet members, good afternoon. My name is Yoli Flores. I'm president and CEO of Families and Schools, a nonprofit organization that serves low-income communities and communities of color. Our mission is to help families become more knowledgeable and confident advocates for their children's education and authentic partners with schools. I'm here to speak in support of Superintendent Carvalho's numeracy and literacy intervention model, an effort to correct historical inequities in the early and upper grades that have impeded students from having the chance to succeed in school and in life. As some of you know, I spent most of my last decade at the National Campaign for Grade Level Reading, working to address our nation's literacy crisis. The issue of literacy, though, is much more personal to me. My father never had the opportunity to learn to read or learn math. Consequently, he was stuck in low wage jobs all his life. The saving grace is that hard labor jobs didn't require the skill of reading or math in his day. This is what allowed him to work. Today, this is hardly the case. Today, if our kids don't have these skills, it's practically game over. Perhaps more, more compelling on the reading front is my conversation a few years back with eight boys from Highland Park who dropped out of school in seventh grade. When I asked the boys why they dropped out of school, one young man replied, ma'am, do you know what it feels like when you can't read? Do you know what it feels like when you don't have a future? So yes, if we don't do something bold and courageous and at scale, it is game over for the 70% of low-income black and brown third graders that are not meeting standards in reading, 75% not meeting standards in math. 
and or the 65% of low-income black and brown seventh graders that are not meeting standards in reading and 82% not meeting standards in math. So yes, boldness is needed right now. Boldness to expand to more children in the early and upper grades. Boldness to make this intervention sustainable. Boldness to bring families in as partners and boldness to list this up as a high priority equity issue. Board members, the superintendent and his leadership team, Dr. Estrada and Dr. Baez, have brought to you a bold plan that builds on what is promising and making it even better and accessible for more students, especially those who have been historically marginalized. We must not limit these students' access to two fundamental rights the right to read and to be proficient in math. LAUSD is on track to do the right thing. This is the opportunity to fulfill our obligation to ensure all students across all grades, not just the lucky few, are on track for success in school and in life. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you for your time. Mr. Juan Jose Mangandi, come on up. You'll have three minutes to speak once you begin. I believe Mr. Mangandi is going to speak in Spanish, so if you want to hear what he is saying contemporaneously with his speech, throw these on and you will hear what he is saying. Just give us one moment, Mr. Mangandi. Thank you. Folks, me, me dicen. Momento, por favor. Okay, listos. Listos. Okay. Buenas tardes. Este, como saben, mi nombre es Juan José. He sido presidente dos veces de todos los padres aprendices. Juan José Mangandi, I have been the chairperson for the DLAC for uh, English learners, and first I want to congratulate the first time the African Americans that are a minority of students here have pushed for an agenda to change a historic narrative that has been unjust, and I have applauded that. The only thing that I always say is that I always see a group of privileged people, not the ones that I meet with at South Central, the people that have great social socioeconomic problems and that have a lot of students that have left school, a lot of students that are not having a future. And it's good those that can finance the unions or organizations can finance. Number two, that I think is very important here. In 2012, I got the chance to travel with the LGBTQ people. It was 28. We started a trip from Arizona, which was for migratory uh, reform. And it was called No Paper, No Fears. And we faced uh, discrimination and hate. But the issue here is that when walking in, in the entire space here, I noticed that those that sometimes support us and it was just hypocrites and they were taking advantage of our own weaknesses. And at the end, there was no immigration reform. And then with Obama came and we still were uh, disappointed. And I saw so many parents cried and again, I'm here again with the LGBTQ group and I have that relationship with them and I've spoken to them and I say, what do you think about this? And they tell me there is something that is happening and it's dangerous. Our community cannot take to a confrontation with other communities, but if the community is not well informed and does not understand why we have this agenda and how we can share the same pain of abuse, discrimination and bullying, that is not what is being said. But on the other hand, too, we know, and this is very important, that there is an agenda that is against those that are the poor, especially those at Latino that are South Central and Pico and the West and the East. And this is not being worked on because we're always gentrifying and giving the resources to those that have more possibilities and taking over resources for those with less possibilities. And that's the point today. Primary promise. UTLA, in a manipulative way, and I say maybe an, a manipulator took away many of the good teachers to take them to this program, and we had substitute, and that's why the schools um, regressed in their academic achievement. And with those same substitutes that now are in the educational system, now they want to bring them that to ending this process. You know what's happening? Again, you are playing. The chairperson spoke about what has been the results of the uh, famous primary promise. It's just another political play and another play from UTLA to have new members, to have more money, and not improve education. I want to say that we need to start to think, truly think about those that are truly affected and not do this kind of manipulative political games that they lie and have no results for the students. Thank you so much. Jenna Schwartz, come on up. You'll have three minutes to speak once you begin. 
Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, Matisse Anderson. Matisse Anderson, if you're out there, please come on up. You have three minutes to speak once you begin. Hello, school board. It's good to see you again. My name is Matisse Anderson. I'm a core member at Students Deserve, and I'm here once again to advocate for the Safe Passage program. The area around my house has gotten less and less safe for students, and it's more and more of a time where we need safe passage. Many students wouldn't even feel comfortable saying anything to a school police officer if they saw something. A lot of us are afraid of being victimized, and we're, we have to wonder, if we do tell the police about something, will I get shot or will one of our friends get shot who look like us solely because of how we look rather than the actual culprit? Now, many people have also argued that you don't know if any community members in Safe Passage would be like a good person. You don't know if they will be moral. But we do a thorough background check on these people and also, it's definitely more safe for us than a stranger who is armed taking care of us. And so all I ask today is not any impossible feat. I just ask that you be on the right side of history and make sure that all students can feel safe in schools. I yield the rest of my time. Um, hello, my name is Donna. I'm an 11th grader at RFK UCLA Community Schools. I'm a leader in Students Deserve, and I want to share why you need to fully cut the school police budget this spring and put that money towards safe passage, because that actually helps the students of LAUSD instead of harming them. I go to a school where all of, the, all of the staff are members of the community. We have little to no police on our campus. Our staff aides handle problems in which a police, which would use Police. However, in our school, the staff aides handle problems a, a thousand times better than a police could ever or would ever. I emphasize passing safe passage and having community members take care of students. The staff at school have been there since I was in kindergarten. Um, I know all of them and I'm familiar with them. I know each staff member at my school has children or had children who all went to the same school as me, so they understand the importance of keeping uh, students safe. Um, as a rising senior in my K through 12th grade school, I have a responsibility to keep all grades younger than me safe, and the way the school board can help is um, by cutting all school police budget and passing safe passage resolution. Thank you. Thank you for your time. That concludes general public comment. Thank you for your comments. We appreciate them, and we are always happy to hear from you. Uh, now we're going to go back, uh, Dr. Baez and company, to uh, having questions and comments from uh, board members regarding uh, the superintendent's report on evidence-based intervention. So for those of you who are keeping track, following that, we will then go to hearing a public comment on the items that are on the consent calendar and have a vote on the consent calendar, followed by the remaining reports of the superintendent. All right. All right. Questions or comments uh, for Dr. Baez or others? Uh, Mr. Schmerlson, you're first. Thank you, and I'll ask a few, and then I'll give up my time and have someone else, and then we'll go a second round, okay? So, Francis, if you could answer this, or if the budget people can answer this, we'll see, they're behind you, just so you know. Um, how uh, will the new model be paid for? Yes, I do welcome them to come up and respond <laughs> okay. to that question. I figured that. <laughs> I have the funding source, but I want them to be accurate. Thank you, thank you, Francis. Um, it'll be paid out of ESSER funds next year, and we also have a state-restricted grant that is uh, known as the Reading Specialists and Liter Literacy Coaches Grant. Those are state-restricted funds. Okay, and part two. How will uh, we sustain the program in the long run? Um, I'll take that. Okay. 
For the long haul, as I said a couple of times earlier, uh, Board Member Schmerlson, it will be a partnership between General Fund, once ESSER Fund sunset uh, beyond September 2024, um, would be General Fund, and then the more stable uh, entitlement programs, such as Title I, Title III, IDEA, is appropriate based on the pro rata share of representation of those students. One of the things we've detected in this school system, not just recently, but for a number of years, we never have money for anything. However, the carryovers at school sites, specifically the general fund, as well as Title I, often exceed 20% of the appropriation. So when we talk about a partnership, we're talking about a categorical allocation of some school site funds to support the intervention program. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, this is for you, Francis, and I guess for uh, Carla also. How will we ensure that small group instruction is really happening with fidelity and the focus will not just be on coaching teachers? Yeah, so I just want to clarify that the interventionists will be working with students. They're not coaches. They're going to be working with students. And the way that we're going to monitor and support small group instruction is, as we have mentioned earlier, the principals would also receive professional development in the summer on observation uh, and feedback and support to the teachers. They're going to know, have the look for us for small group instruction. Uh, and then they're going to implement that, do an observation and feedback. We use our informal observation tool uh, uh, in our uh, that's a digital tool that where we can collect the data and see uh, when we're going in to intentionally to look for small group instruction. If it's not happening, we're able to capture that data and then go back and support teachers um, and help them to, to get to that point through modeling and so on. Gotcha. Thank you. So. Um this is something that I was working on with uh, Orton Gillingham now. Uh, will the ongoing professional development for interventionists be suggested or mandatory? And then, who will ensure that all staff are properly trained? I think that was a bit of a problem last time, insisting that everybody be trained. Yeah, I, I want to preface that by saying that there has this is an opportunity for us to have a tighter uh, reporting system, both in understanding the minutes or the dose, doses that we're offering our students when it comes to small group instruction, because that has not been a strength. So that's an opportunity for us to grow. The other one is to ensure that we use MyPLN when teachers are registering for the intervention. So then we can clearly see these interventionists attended the workshops or the sessions, but the ones that did not, then we need to offer them makeups. But that's how we will know who has not gotten the training and who has received the training through use of MyPLN, which has not been consistently done. Okay, we really have to be strict on that. Yes. Okay, I'm almost finished, Jackie, almost finished. Okay, <laughs> well, I'm, I don't want you to get mad. Okay, <laughs> that was earlier, okay. Uh, uh, Francis, can you tell us more about uh, the basis on which you're determining priority schools? How, how do you determine what's a priority school? Priority schools is based on the um, dynamic indicator, basic early literacy skills, DIBBLES, screening uh, results. Uh, SBAC assessment results, the CASP, uh, attendance, um, also looking at the socioeconomic status of the, of the community. So all of those would compri comprise that student need equity index. Uh, so we're looking at the students who, have that, who are in the highest need areas. That's how we are prioritizing the resources. Okay. And last, last question. How will students in need intervention be served in a non-priority school? That's, that's my uh, yeah, problem. So and I know that you'll know this, you know, you have historical knowledge of this district. And before we had funds, we had an intervention program. I'd mentioned earlier, it was either after school or Saturday school. It was always some form of intervention. Those schools still also have a, um, an opportunity to receive high dose tutoring or in face to face tutoring if you don't have primary promise. So there are many different models and different menu options. And we are in the process of developing or finalizing the evidence based intervention um, uh, bulletin to guide schools. Uh, with a, a variety of resources that are available to them. Okay, I just want to make sure that Board District 3 gets its fair share of those students who are needing uh, this intervention. Okay, that's it. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you. Um, thanks for the presentation and, and the acknowledgement from the team that s some folks, I think, are experiencing some whiplash about primary promise, you know. Granted, there have been a few different administrations, um, but data and 
pronouncements from this district that it's the greatest thing since sliced bread, and then that it doesn't work, and then that it does work, and that's why it's not changing, and then it is changing. So I, you know, I just want to acknowledge that. And I think this is helpful um, in ex understanding where we're trying to go with, with funding, with support for students. I guess for right now, my, I, only have a few, I only have a few questions, but one, I guess, is on slide 34, if we want to pull it up. I want to, yeah, I just want to make sure we're comparing apples to apples, because part of this, and it's true, as I said earlier, on the budget side with Path to Recovery and ESSER funds, but when we are talking about positions and students served, so as you pull up slide 34, it's looking at primary promise versus the new intervention model, but seems a little incomplete because we're talking about centrally funded positions on one side of the slide, but all positions on the other. And so I'm curious if you could help us understand to, for, to have that apples to apples comparison, um, but I'll wait for the slide to go. I'll go over the first tab and then Francis and the team can jump in. And you're looking at slide number 34, you right. said? Right, so on the left there, it's the centrally funded positions, and on the right, it's all positions, including school-based funding, which doesn't seem like the most fair comparison. Yeah, so it was not our intent to, to compare because we are evolving. We're going from a model that served a limited number of schools and an even more limited number of students in those schools, arrived at based on pre-pandemic data profile, the identification of schools, pre-pandemic data profile, but then the identification of the students was using pandemic data um, using particularly dibbles. So the reason why we don't uh, dwell on the central to central is because, as I said earlier, two elements. Number one, it's going to be a partnership. Uh, but I can tell you that about half the number of students uh, of schools currently receiving primary promise teachers will continue to have them going into next year. So we're decreasing the reliance on, gen on ESSER by 50% going to next year. That does not mean that we're abandoning those schools. No, we're shifting now to the partnership of local and uh, central funded positions. One of the reasons is, Board Member Melvoin, is that it, as part of our research, we were able to ascertain that a lot of schools are already funding interventionists, literacy interventionists, numeracy interventionists. So to us, rather than simply counting centrally funded positions, why not conduct a true assessment of all interventions that are currently in the district? S step two, put them all through the science of reading, intense training during the summer, which is our goal. So the same type of approach that teachers have relied on, on primary promise, that body of knowledge that only a few possess, will now be known by all, including those those interventions that currently are at schools already bought by their principals. And then we will help other schools that will qualify under the different tiers with the necessary funding. And as I said, going to next year, and this will be more evident in, in, in uh, subsequent conversations, 20% of our Title I funding is year after year unspent. We plan to categorize part of that funding and centrally, not ESSER, but centrally, categorize Title I for the use of the schools at the local level. That is why, speaking of a purely apples to apples comparison, which by the way is a question that's been asked by a member of the media, obsessed with, with that element, we're not going to be that rigid. The schools at the school site, there should be an agnostic approach as to the funding behind the intervention. The question is, will all these schools have an equally trained, qualified interventionist and the support systems that they will need. I understand the theory behind it, and I'm not disputing it. I'm just curious for our comparison and for the public's. So 22-23, we had 283 centrally funded, and the increase to 449, like the, you know, 166 positions. Are we to expect, I, it, let me ask another way. I'd like to know how many of those are central Yep. And how many are school-based? E okay. Even if the, the, the rationale is yep. sound, I just would like to know so that for, increase. For the 449, that consists of the 168 centrally funded and 281 school funded. And the difference here, the reason why you have the left-hand side of superintendents that is 
uh, these do not include the interventionists that had been purchased by the schools. So we, they were not part of a professional development approach or coherence right. with the 449 that will, uh, they will be included in that. So 281 school-based? School-funded. School-funded and 168. So kind of an inversion. And then, so are those people, so for the, two, like the 283 people, like the actual people in 22, 23, who? Schools, we're looking at schools. Sorry, a number of schools. Um, so 283 school based, okay, got it. And then on the next page, on the next slide, um, and this supports, I think, the superintendent's point about just the numbers, that 60,247, well, two things. One, again, I think that that's just, um, primary promise schools and doesn't uh, um, uh, acknowledge an intervention at other schools. I understand why, because of this cohesion. But the 60,247 students were not all being served by primary promise teachers. It's a small percentage. Right. What is that number? So out of the, that's the student enrollment at participating schools. What is the students served by primary promise last year? the number. Or the average. If I may also, as she's identifying, one of the things that we found, and it's been one of the things that we've been working with uh, as an improvement area, is tracking the students who actually were served through Primary Promise as well has been, since year one, a bit of a transition. And we can have our ODA team help us on some of that as well, clarifying some of that. But we have been able to see that year one, some of this was tracked paper pencil on a spreadsheet just because we didn't have the mechanisms to track students through MISIS. Moving forward into year two, we've been able to see a greater tracking. So we've been improving. It's, it's an area where we've seen the need because of the fact that also through intervention, some students go in and then they're gonna come out of it. And so how do we track students moving forward is also that something that we're solving through the new intervention model. And, and we have um, up to 22,450 students um, that have that have been reached again not acknowledging that rotation the students coming in and out and needing to really include that in MISIS what were you know, the number of weeks or number of, of sessions with the interventionist and them exiting we need to create a system where it's more easily reported so we understand cumulative how many we've supported yeah because I've seen it reported as 13,000 students served 22,450 but I will say I mean and this I think is in support of the new vision but in that next column, 275,000 plus students served by this intervention. If I'm understanding your tiers correctly, 80% of the students are getting the tier one just good teaching. Correct. But 20% is are getting more uh, intense intervention. And 20% of that is you know 55,000 students. And so I think it is like so, so you, you know 20. It's double the number of students getting some sort of intensive intervention. If I'm understanding Density, frequency, the idea. you've got the second dose, the third dose, and in those schools, even the prior, the schools that, that we, that are centrally funded, even those schools decided to purchase their own to get additional services. So um, this is just the number of school, number of schools and looking at um, the number of students that we could possibly reach. Now you mentioned a number of 13,407, that's the minimum. The maximum would be 22,450. I give you a range, again, because our reporting yeah. has not been as consistent. Yeah, and I, and I think too, so in the new model, we have, even if it's 20%, that's 55,000 students, but again, that first column is just the primary promise schools and it's not taking into account school-based intervention. And so it's just, again, it's hard for this. I think people are trying to compare. The last. The last question I have, at least for this round, is I, I do think it's difficult f understanding the funding stream. I do think it's difficult to say that we have an assessment out there of a program, but we cannot wait for the results of the assessment. We gotta move quickly, because we and this board in particular have been very clear about program analysis and evaluation and looking for results. And so I'm, I'm curious, and at a future meeting would like some accountability, like who authorized a study that wasn't gonna be completed until we were gonna to have to make a decision? Because the board's expectation, whether or not we support it or not, was not that we're gonna have a study, like a bridge to nowhere, a study that then we just say. So, you know, as we're saying here and publicly that we can't wait for a study. I mean, you know, that's like putting kids in saying, we can't wait for your test results to come back. We just gotta move quickly. It just, it, it just doesn't really pass the smell test. And so if it's a funding thing, if we're saying that yes, we acknowledge that 
it's odd that we're not waiting for the results of a program analysis, but we cannot wait because the funding is running out, then I think we need to be very clear that this is a funding-based uh, decision, not just an academic one. And I think that, that people are just fair to acknowledge that tension and say, well, what's the point of these? And I think it, it uh, diminishes our credibility a little bit, especially given that the district itself said this program was working, at least for a small subset of students. I think it's all the factors that have been involved. You know, as we've talked about the vacancies that, that were imposed on the highest need schools, um, knowing that there hasn't been an ac adequate reporting of the times the students have received intervention, um, and we don't know who has uh, cycled out of the interventions. Uh, and then, of course, then there is a funding need. Uh, so we know we need to improve the model by creating that, the tighter reporting system so that we can adequately see what worked. Uh, and the, the number of minutes it took for a student to improve. And we're using research to, to improve that practice. But to your point uh, about coming back, we'll be happy to come back and to share the results um, that, we, that, um, that the program produced. But board member, I, I want to chime in. It, it's not an either or. It's not either we're doing this because of budgetary constraints or because it makes more academic sense. It's a both end. Uh, I think we've been very clear that uh, that's how I began a conversation today, and that's what I've been saying all along any time I have a chance to say it, is that, uh, of course, an intervention that relies on a highly skilled interventionist assigned a handful of students is going to pay off. We know that. That's been well documented in the study. The question is, number one, can you sustain the model, that model, as it stands, considering the funding constraints and the sunsetting of the totality of the funding behind that model, consideration number one. Consideration number two is can you scale up, meaning more students, even those same grade levels. Thirdly, can you scale up to other grade levels? Fourthly, can you, in addition to literacy, incorporate numeracy? And that's where the model, as we have it currently, breaks down. It works to the extent you have the funding to maintain the integrity of one to four or five or six. When you scale it up to all students who are tiered with the same need, you don't have an answer for it. Um, the intervention model that's being advanced is one, as Francis Abley said, that tier students, no matter what, based on the model, funded via partnership of local school site funds, centrally general funded positions, in addition to categorical Title I funding, we will double the number of students under that very intensive four to six to one uh, interventionist. That alone will double, but in addition to that, we will scale up to the additional grade levels as well as the, the numeracy component, which is critically important. That is one of our lowest points of performance, is numeracy as opposed to reading, even though we believe that establishing a strong reading foundational skill set will improve all other subject areas. Thank you. Ms. Franklin, are you hearing me? I am. It says I'm unable to start my video, though, so maybe okay. Mr. McLean well, we'll can just, help. Okay. We'll, we'll listen to you then, I guess. Okay. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask if you could clarify the interventionist roles for math, if there are going to be any, because the slides, it doesn't look like there are interventionists for either elementary or secondary math? And then have we started to hire for any of these? So um, both of those things. Yes. So question on uh, the interventionists in math. We will have an interventionist in math in the high need schools. When we get into middle school, we're not. But this is the reason why. Because the math, uh, the teaching, math teachers are, is, a, is a shortage field. So we don't want to take a math teacher out of a classroom and create an interventionist, and then we're not able to fill that position. So going back to that same rationale where we want to ensure that we have teachers in the classroom before pulling them out and create interventionists, same is true for math. So we are investing in pro professional development in math to support our teachers, um, but the, in elementary school we do have two, one in literacy and one in numeracy. Um, what was your second question? If we've started to hire for oh, them yet. Yeah, so the hiring has uh, taken place. It's a combination of the region offices um, at schools and also um, the district offices have supported with, hire, with um, interviewing and going through the selection process. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Gonez? Thank you. Um, I appreciate the presentation and the opportunity to learn additional details about the model, both with the board, but also publicly. Um, and certainly, you know, I, I hear the need um, urgently for additional support at all grade levels, especially post-pandemic, 
I was a middle school teacher. I definitely recall seeing sixth and seventh graders in my classroom who, who struggled with reading, were behind grade level or couldn't read at all. So um, I, I think that that's all really valid. Um, you know, while a change may be needed, I have definitely seen the positive impact of primary college at schools in my district and never before have I seen schools so passionate to show me um, their intervention efforts and the results from that. In particular, I have seen the work firsthand just in the last month and a half. I saw a number of schools in previous school years, but in Lassen Elementary, Vista del Valle Dual Language Academy, Canterbury Elementary School, and Osceola Elementary School. Um, and at Osceola just last week, um, I have to shout them out because I witnessed an impressive collaboration, um, data, data dialogue conversation between the Primary Promise team and the first grade teaching team who they had worked together to grow their capacity um, in following the science of reading and saw improvements in terms of the number of students who were on grade level. Um, so I just this is obviously a significant investment and, and I think it's worth um, taking a close look and, and asking detailed and, and sometimes challenging questions to really make sure that it is the right one. Um, so a few for me and I'm happy to, Ms. Goldberg, feel free to cut me off there. I have a number of them. So if I need to stop at some point, you let me know and I can go for round two. Um, Dr. Baez, I think you touched on a little bit the role of the interventionist, but could you specifically just share um, what they will be doing throughout the school day and what their pr proportion of work time will be uh, between working with other educators and working directly with students? Yeah, so their role primarily is gonna be to work with students, to work in small groups. Uh, that's gonna be the main function. Um, they should have a caseload of about 30 to 50 students, uh, and that's going to be the main, the main function. They will be collaborating with teachers when teachers are available, so bank time Tuesdays or uh, when there's a substitute day, uh, professional development time that the school provides. Um, we will also provide um, the action seminars that have been provided the past couple of years. Again, the action seminars go back to 2000s. Those are, they were not uh, initiated in 2020. So bringing back those action seminars that have been successful in our district uh, in literacy and numeracy that include the instructional leadership team. Thank you. Um, I wanted to also ask about the aides. I know that from the schools that I have spoken to, uh, a large component of the success um, based on what they've shared is the instructional aides who are part of the Primary Promise program, how well they've been trained and how that helps support a low student to teacher ratio um, in the program. Can you speak to whether instructional aides will be part of this program? If not, why not? They are part of the instructional program. So they will be um, part of the elementary. Uh, uh, it won't be for the middle and the high schools, but they, they or for all of the uh, schools that have um, purchased the interventionists, but they are also part of our, of our model. Is it possible to get firm numbers on the number of instructional aides that we would expect and how they would be allocated? Uh, yes, uh, we might have some of the information now and we can provide the rest of it, but maybe Carla Good or Budget could come up to speak to that piece, please. Should I go for more while we, I, I, oh, she's coming, okay. Good afternoon. Hi. Hi. Uh, yes, of course. We can get you some numbers and we'll get those. Um, we are actually in the process of doing all the reassignments that are necessary. And uh, we plan to send out any reassignment notices um, starting tomorrow. And so we should have some firm numbers for you in uh, the next day or two. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, to follow up on some questions that Mr. Melvoin raised, I think one of the primary issues that have been raised about primary promise is the ongoing cost and the need for sustainability, which I certainly think is important. Can you share the cost comparison of primary promise this year um, versus what we expect the interventionist model to, co to cost in the upcoming 23-24 school year? Sure. So when we fund all of the elementary schools that could reach up to $192 million, um, the total budget in 22-23, uh, when it's centrally funded, comes to $134 million, and that includes positions, PD, and instructional materials. Uh, the total projection of expenditure, expenditures for the upcoming year is $103.5 million. Again, that also includes uh, teacher PD, materials, and the positions. 
Is that just the centrally funded cost, the 103.5 million, or does that is that all in, including the school budget? No, that's well? just a centrally funded. Okay. Um, it would be helpful if uh, if the full cost could be provided. It's it's okay if you don't have it right now. I'm I'm happy to receive that later. And then just so I understand the difference between the 192 million dollar dollar figure that has been referenced and the 130 something that you shared. What's the reason for that difference? So the 192 would be if we were to uh, scale that with every single elementary school. If we funded that for every single elementary, that would be 192 million. But in 2022-23, as you saw in the numbers earlier, we did not fund all of the schools. Right? This is this is what it um, what it looks like for 22-23. Right. Um, thank you. And then, can you also provide the number of FTEs currently funded as part of Primary Promise versus the anticipated FTEs we would need through the new interventionist model? Yes, I'm going to ask Nero to come and respond to that one, please. Okay, so currently we have uh, 530 interventionists funded uh, centrally and 596 centrally funded instructional aides. So that's question. current under primary promise. That's what correct. about anticipated for 23-24 if then, this new model correct. is? Correct. So 2324, we funded 239 position, uh, interventionist positions and 216 instructional aid positions. And those are just the centrally funded portion. They don't include the school purchases. Right. Okay. If we are to Same. add board, board member, uh, if we are to add the school funded interventions, and I do have it in front of me, then you add an additional 521 positions as compared to 442 currently funded school funded interventionists. So the grand total, the grand total would be for next year around 760 uh, positions as a partnership between uh, central funding as well as school site funding. The vast majority of the school funded interventionists are already in place, meaning the principals have already made decisions to purchase those positions. We're adding about 80 or so, which as I said earlier, we believe we can sustain uh, with Title I funding without burdening the schools. Thank you for providing um, those numbers and I appreciate the, the summary and the explanation on funding as well. I have about six more questions, Ms. Goldberg. Would you like me to hold on those until the next round? Ask it, Mr. Shin. Okay. All right, go ahead, Kelly. Great. Um, so at earlier grade levels, what supports will be provided to schools that are not receiving a centrally funded interventionist? And let's assume also that they're not funding their own interventionists using their school budget. Yeah, so the um, expanded learning opportunity program has been, um, you know, the, the cornerstone. So we have provided schools fun funding uh, to provide that extended learning after school, uh, during vacation times, during breaks, uh, summer program, uh, winter bridge. So the dollars are there. Uh, many schools had their locally designed intervention programs. You've, you've heard me provide updates on tutoring. Uh, you've seen the um, high dose tutoring, face to face tutoring. Well, locally designed is exactly that. Uh, is that uh, schools uh, create their own program and plan depending on the needs of their schools and then they um, assign the teachers, the students, and they have a, a number of, of weeks where they conduct instruction and then assess student progress at that point. So that has been the approach that we have been using uh, when they don't have a primary promise teacher assigned to them. Just to clarify, it seemed it seems as though one of the rationales for, for this new approach is, is a system-wide uh, approach to intervention that's based on, on the evidence and the research. How will that then penetrate schools that, that aren't receiving these interventionists and that are running their own locally designed programs? Will we support them in those efforts to ensure that they are aligned to the research? Absolutely, uh, and that starts with that summer professional development because we need uh, everyone to have a common understanding of how we do the groupings, whether it's in the classroom or whether it's after school or in locally designed, uh, and then just progress monitoring. So that will be at scale and it will be done with more intensity and more frequency uh, with our region offices, uh, with the region support and those that are are closest to the school to monitor uh, to monitor the implementation of the intervention programs. 
If I may, Ms. Gones, to Board Member Gones, what you're bringing up is an important part of ensuring that we're using these one-time dollars also to invest at a larger scale on all of our staff and resources that we have at our school sites. One of the things that, we, as we've been doing our research, is we've also been finding that there's a lot of other positions that are being funded uh, and paid for by our schools. So we want to make sure that whether it's a coach, a coordinator, that those types of individuals are receiving specialized training to maximize their capacity and support at the school level. So to your question, I think it's really important to emphasize uh, exactly what you're pointing to, that we must invest in the foundation, especially of the staff that we have at our school site. And that's an important part of the next phase of this work. Thanks, Dr. Estrada, that's helpful. Um, the district's goal on literacy, which uh, emerged from the board's goals, establishes the goal of moving third grade students 30 points closer to proficiency on the SBAC. Um, and it, it was an intentional focus on the early grades um, that emanated from the, the board's decision to set a goal around third grade, recognizing the importance of proficiency in reading by third grade. So I'm wondering how this approach uh, fits into the strategy of investing in early learners and ensuring that students are proficient readers by third grade. Yeah, that commitment continues. That's not gonna go away. The early literacy initiative continues because we know that that's the fundamental. Students learn to read at the early grades and they read to learn in the upper grades. But we understand that there's been an impact uh, given the pandemic in the neediest communities where students have left third grade uh, and uh, they're in upper grade and they don't have those foundational reading skills. So we need to do both. Um, a a good, good first instruction and an early literacy plan uh, balanced with an intervention program to address the needs of the students that didn't get the fundamental reading uh, that was required in the earlier grades. So the commitment is still there. Um, the, the work will continue when it comes to early literacy and ensuring that our teachers have the, the best supports. Um, we'll be also incorporating the model that we had before with the academy time, uh, and as well as the, the interventionist working very closely with those grades. Also know that in the early stages of Primary Promise, there was a, a concentration uh, of um, first grade for a period of time. Uh, and then it, in, in, uh, you know, it was added, second grade was added, and then third, but we, had not, we did not start strong with the kinder third. Uh, it was mostly in the first grade. You could see pockets of K through three, but mostly in the first grade. And so we are looking towards um, scaling that up to ensure it happens at every grade level, kinder, first, second, and third, through our early literacy program. Uh, monitoring the Dibbles data because in third grade is when uh, we'll, when students take the SBAC this year, uh, we'll see the results sometime in the fall, uh, but it won't really reflect whether a uh, student who participated in Primary Promise uh, it will reflect the results in the SBAC. But we're not very clear about that, again, because the reporting wasn't as clear as to the participants and the number of minutes that the students participated in, um, in uh, tutoring with the Primary Promise teacher. Dr. Baez, can you speak also to the family literacy aspect, which I think is an important strategy that we just kicked off uh, uh, for uh, early literacy? Absolutely. So the, there has, there's been successful approaches to engaging parents, one that combines the teacher, the parent, and the student. Uh, an example is uh, Springboard, for example. Uh, we piloted that at certain schools, and uh, the teacher the, and the parent worked together with the children for a number of weeks, uh, and that's how the, the parent-teacher relationship became, became stronger, homeschool connection, and the parents understood the, the use of the strategies that the teacher uses at home, at school, and how to bring those to the home. And that's what we plan to scale up up with supports from outside organizations and professionals who can, uh, and our PACE office and the talent within the district uh, that can uh, be super intentional about the way we help our parents uh, at home to, to connect, um, to help them with literacy uh, achievement um, at home. So uh, an example of that would be uh, using our community representatives or, or using the parent liaisons at the school, ensuring that the workshops are happening at the school site and that we're scaling up so that there is capacity building and parents walk, walk away understanding um, a list of ways that they can help at home to reinforce the learning, which is an aspect that really has not been very strong. I, I definitely agree. I'm, I'm excited about the, the family engagement component, and certainly there should be alignment with the way that we're preparing teachers to teach and how we're teaching students and how we support families and supporting their, their children's learning. Um, and I hear what you're saying, Dr. Dr. Baez, about all of the different um, elements that help support literacy in the early grades. I just I think it's challenging 
um, for this not to appear like less of a focus um, and less of an investment in, in readers in the primary grades. Um, and, you know, obviously dollars are limited. Maybe there was a decision made that there was no other way to address um, our, our older learners, our, our struggling readers in middle and high school. Um, but I, I worry about this cycle of remediation that we often get it, I believe, in the, in the school yep. district and, and not setting a strong enough foundation district-wide for, for students to, to be proficient readers. Yeah, and like I mentioned earlier, the pyramid of, of intervention that we currently have is shows that most of our students is, are there in tier two and three, and we need to work hard so that tier one is solid, so 80% of our students are at grade level. That's the goal, and that's the way in which we're gonna be leading instruction in, in our district in the next moving forward um, but also in terms of early and early literacy our commitment is to those district goals district and board adopted goals so uh, ensuring that students read by third grade conti will continue to be a priority it's one of our board goals so we'll continue to invest but we also need to balance that with uh, uh, supports in middle and high school as well Okay. Um, just uh, three and a half more questions for me. Um, to, to the point of secondary schools, I think in the various materials, I've seen references to interventionists being deployed to high schools and middle schools. Some also only reference middle schools. Could you clarify if we're funding interventionists K through eight or K through 12? And then also what's the proportion? Um, so how many would we expect we're going to elementary? How many to middle? How many to high? Yeah. So the centrally funded model uh, does uh, go to eighth grade. So it'll include middle school. Uh, but the school funded position now it takes us to up to 12th grade because high schools have purchased the interventionists. This is where we're trying to close that gap so that we provide the professional development to the high school interventionists where it had not happened before. And the centrally funded positions uh, will be at middle schools. That's where we'll be investing in the corrective reading and the Achieve 3000 uh, and ensuring that, the, that those teachers have training in the summer to start strong. Uh, and then at middle schools that uh, decided to buy an interventionist that were not centrally funded, uh, those will also be included in our intervention model. But your question about where, which way are we going? I heard it was middle school and then it's high school. The reason is because we are centrally funding up to middle school, but because high schools are also funding their own, this is a school funded approach. That's why it's, it's a K-12 approach. Um, and I don't have the numbers in front of me and I can provide those to you afterwards. I can provide yeah, you the numbers. Okay. Yeah, in uh, elementary, we'll have 309, middle school 57, high school 56, and then span 27. Thank you. Um, you know, and you covered some of this, but we do have existing intervention programs at the secondary school level. So my, my question is, will those existing approaches continue? Will they be subsumed by this approach? Any clarity you can provide? No, those will continue. So we've had um, the use of um, credit recovery, ingenuity, winter plus, all of those different approaches. <clears throat> well, those, those will continue. Um, this summer will be with students who take periods one and two uh, to improve their grade. Uh, so those interventions will continue, but this is going to really help the students who don't have those foundational reading skills. That's why uh, building capacity in a high school intervention intervention is to understand Orton Gillingham and the science of reading, that's going to be groundbreaking because that's not happened before. We don't have teachers at the high school level who have that level of, of training, but there are students who don't have those literacy skills. Maybe they are international students who've just arrived or um, there could be a variety of reasons. Uh, students who, who don't have an IEP, who have other supports, but who are having some challenges with reading need a very focused approach to help them, uh, to help them catch up and break the code. Thank you. Um, last question I have for me. I know you mentioned that hiring has, has begun for these positions. Can you share how many of the interventionist positions have been filled? And then also the rationale for why restart the hiring process rather than um, recognize the interventionists who are currently serving in that role. I'll invite the HR team to come up, but I know that the um, hiring is continuing and the selections continuing, but our HR team will respond to that question. 
Good afternoon. To answer your first question, the reason that we are having a rehiring process is that we have no system in place for releasing these folks. In other words, we have no seniority-based system. So what we have done, though, is in the interview process, the people that have our existing primary promise, their, their uh, application process is very streamlined. In other words, you just have to upload their interest, and so they're having a small interview because we acknowledge the resources and the time that we have put forth in their training. But we also want to give the opportunity to new people if they're interested in doing some of this work because we have many, many teachers in the district that have background in literacy. So that's why we went for that particular route. At this point, um, we are looking very good, we are looking very solid, and it's very helpful for us, for other staffing to already know that these teachers are going to be in these positions, which has helped us to backfill those classroom positions. Thank you very much. We'll miss you, Juliana. Um, that's it for me. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, Mr. Schmerlson, did you have more? Okay, Mr. Shin. Thank you, and thank you, Dr. Baez, for your presentation. I think I was in the same camp uh, as Mr. Melvoin a little bit, ping-ponging back and forth, and um, it seems like there's a dearth of accurate data, and then you know, the pandemic disrupted a lot of stuff. So to be entirely candid with you, I was pretty confused um, about <laughs> the whole program and everything. So um, your presentation answered a lot of questions, but it also um, prompted a couple more. So I wanted to ask um, for the multi-tiered systems of support uh, on slide eight. I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head. I might be confusing district numbers and state and country, but I think it's something like 60% of students are not meeting uh, literacy standards, and then 70% are not meeting uh, numeracy standards. So I'm wondering if we're trying to have a baseline tier one and then shrink that to a smaller group of tier two and tier three, if a majority of students are not meeting baseline standards, how are we gonna have, I guess, like a pyramid that's bigger on the bottom? Smaller yeah, and it goes back to acceleration and ensuring that our students do get um, with frequency and intensity of, 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 um, of instruction, uh, intervention, getting that first scoop, the second scoop, the third scoop. And I had mentioned before 50 hours, and I, then I mentioned uh, Saturday school, and I mentioned, so it's a lot of, of schooling that students are have to go through in order for us to take our entire system to get to 80%. But if we can get as close as possible, you know, that would be, that would be the goal. Okay, uh, so starting next year, um, I guess I think I'm oversimplifying it a little bit, but I guess what's sort of the cutoff for you to be put into uh, tier two systems of supports? Like, is it one grade behind? Yeah, so what's really helpful is um, with either diagnostic assessment or screeners, they offer the cutoff. So there are cutoff scores, and right now, for example, Dibbles offers the cutoff score. So you've got the above benchmark, the benchmark, well below benchmark, and, and so on. So based on those, uh, that's how we group our students. Uh, so we'll, they're either color-coded in some form or fashion, but teachers in group, teachers in their cl classroom teachers or grade level they will then look at the students, and that's where that mixing occurs and creating or forming homogeneous groupings. But the way we determine the intervention and who qualifies for Tier 2 is based on either the screener or diagnostic assessment that the student takes. The one we'll have very soon from Curriculum Associates does just that. They assess, then it groups the students for you, and then it provides you the lessons as well that are appropriate for the student or um, computer adaptive lessons that students could do independently. Okay, so if a student is in tier two, is there a way for us to say they're this many grade levels behind and they're being put in tier two, or is it? It, it does, uh, the, the um, Curriculum Associates does provide that. It tells us uh, the levels that they are, the grade levels um, that they are below or above, uh, and so that is offered. That is a report that's offered that we haven't had. What some of the systems that we've used is that uh, when, when students can, um, go through the Dibbles assessment or screener, leg style levels are assigned to the students. And so in certain schools, uh, teachers are familiar with the leg style levels, say starting with 170 and going to, uh, over 700. 170 would be a student who is just barely decoding, can read very few words, and up to the highest level. And so regardless of the age level of the student, that is, that's the, that's the leg style level, and that's how we try to provide students the most um, personalized learning. 
Okay, so to sort students into tiers, is it something like a percentile system, like the bottom, you know, X percentile are tier three, the bottom Y percentile are tier two, or is it just everybody below a certain cutoff is this tier? It's a, it's a cutoff. Okay. It would be a cutoff, and the cutoff is, and the, the, the number of students will be different in different schools because believe it or not, this pyramid does exist in some schools. Some schools do have this, this configuration where 80% is a grade level or, or close to 80% are a grade level. It is possible, it's just that we need to um, bring that up to scale. Okay, um, and then for the professional development days over the summer, I know this isn't a, a perfect apples to apples analogy, um, but when we were talking as a board um, related to acceleration days and we had those discussions about PD over the summer and then the instruction or the PD over the summer was intended to support teachers in identifying and assisting students over acceleration days and that original plan was sort of disrupted. For these PD, PD days over the summer, do you see buy-in from most of the teachers and that this is something that will be followed through? Yeah, so we have definitely been um, reaching out to them intentionally to give them information so that they can sign up for, uh, for the uh, summer professional development. Uh, we have the numbers at this point, but we, you know, we're asking them to sign up on my PLN and, and per providing some personalized outreach. We are seeing a registration uh, really ramp up, especially before uh, teachers leave on vacation. Uh, if they don't attend those professional development days, the, the material, the content will be offered uh, during uh, the school year. Because we want to make sure that everyone has the same information and that there's a baseline in terms of the strategies that work in schools that we want every single uh, teacher to have. Okay. Um, and then I know that the board shares the superintendents and your priority about making sure that every student, uh, every classroom has a certificated teacher. So the priority is going to filling classroom vacancies. Uh, once those vacancies are filled, are there still leftover, um, I guess, literacy coaches right now who are going to become interventionists? And I guess is there a proportion or a number or something uh, of the positions who are currently funded by Primary Promise? How many of them will become interventionists under the new model? I don't have that data. I'm, I'm wondering if HR, our HR partners have that data. I don't have that yet, but we can bring it to you. Okay. I just know that... Um, you know, from the students who've worked with their primary promise um, coaches, um, you know, there's a lot of specialized training that goes into it, and it seems like it would be prudent to have that knowledge preserved. Yeah, um, what I can forward. tell you is that as uh, regions go through the selection process, that is definitely a criteria for teachers to have background and have um, the training and the, uh, even a micro-credential, because you know that that's been part of our initiative as well. They have a micro-credential, absolutely we want them to be in our classroom. So that would be a criteria that would um, allow them to be highly uh, eligible for those positions. Okay, thank you. And I just want to end on a positive note by saying I think the um, part of this new program that I really like was the, is the expansion beyond primary um, support, because I, I noticed um, you know, in elementary school, a lot of the reading instruction is related to um, phonics and things like that. And then if you lack those foundational skills because literacy instruction is, you know, cumulative, you get left behind in middle school when they're focused on, you know, reading comprehension and analysis and those sorts of things. And I see it now in high school. You know, I have friends um, in my school and at other schools who are reading, you know, right now at middle school levels. And so when we're focusing on um, you know, reading more advanced literature, things like that, it seems like a lot of those students are really being left behind. So uh, I like the, the idea of expanding um, supports and people with, you know, knowledge and teaching foundational literacy skills to the, the higher levels. So thank you for that. Thank you, board member. Yeah, and I, I know we'll wrap this up in a second. I think I, I also appreciate the expansion. You know, as a former middle school teacher, I saw a lot of kids, almost all of my students, coming in far below basic and around the second grade level. I think one of the challenges that I'm hearing, too, in some of the advocacy around this is that primary promise, the primary, is around the early literacy. And that was a board goal, as Ms. Gonis was saying, and this is an expansion. I don't think we've seen, to keep using that apples to apples idea, but I don't think we've seen a grade level breakdown of primary promise in this intervention model. I know we have schools and demographics, but it could be helpful at a follow-up to look at students served K, first grade, second grade, third grade. 
you know, I don't have an agenda in mind. It would just be helpful to tell people, yes, this is still primarily a early literacy project or no, and then help us think about, well, then how are we going to bolster now early literacy in other ways? Part of that is the TK expansion, which I know we have in a few. The last thing I'll say, which is just a suggestion, Superintendent, um, a lot of this comes down to reducing that class size and the smaller group instruction and the one-on-one -on -one or seven-on-one. -on -one. And a more cost-effective way to do that is instructional aids is TA and TAs. And, you know, there are, I think you said, I wrote it down somewhere, but um, only um, 216 teachers assistants or TAs funded through this program. I know a lot of schools that are able to raise funds, um, you spend them on TAs because they're cost effective and they do a lot of that. And so, and I've suggested before, and I know that we have some advocacy both locally and in Sacramento around making it easier to hire and retain and place these uh, positions. But it could be interesting looking at a strategy around, you know, whether you call it intervention or primary promise, just TAs, like other centrally funded opportunities to get TAs in the class. Because that's just a huge, I mean, I never had a TA as a teacher. It would have been so helpful. And again, a lot of this just comes down to doing that as opposed to pulling teachers. Because I definitely saw that I only had a couple of primary promise schools, but the domino effect where you pulled and then we had vacancies, I saw that for sure. So if you could just infuse and maybe, you know, think about so 216 centrally funded TAs, you know, we had 400. Right. Does that get a lot of the aims that were and just to let you know, one of the challenges that school, schools faced this, this last year is they had the funding, they opened the lines, but they couldn't hire those positions. So what we advised was instead of TAs, because they have to IAs. be in college, go to the instructional aides. Yeah. So and we have instructional aides in this reading model. Yeah, and, and that's fine, but I know there's a difference in terms of salary and also flexibility. And so I'll just say, again, you know, for the umpteen time publicly, I'd love us to advocate whether that's locally with our unions or in Sacramento with the Ed Code around the flexibility to hire TAs because we want to encourage all those TAs to go on a teacher pipeline, but we don't necessarily want to mandate it if there are a lot of retirees or, or you know, parents who want that, that position. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, I just have a few because most of my questions have been answered. Um, you know me. Uh, my concern is not so much the ones this far from standard, which I think this intervention is going to do a lot for, a lot for. My interest is the distant from, from standard. How do you see this expansion and evolution of primary promise dealing with the ones that are not close to being at standard? Yes, and, and I know uh, we've had conversation about this, and if we take uh, middle school in particular, because that is a, a new approach that, that we're going to uh, implement, it will be, for example, corrective reading reader, and then the uh, Achieve 3000 with a small group of students uh, with the interventionist, and the goal there is to help the students who don't have that fluency skill, because when you talk about the, the ones that are low, but the ones that are well below means they probably don't have the phonics, or they don't have the, they're not able to blend, uh, decode, uh, uh, and of course, we'll do vocabulary and comprehension development, but they need to crack the code. So we need to group those students and work with them so that they get that support and, and are able to catch up. So middle school is an example of how we, we plan to do that. Uh, in the elementary grades, as I mentioned earlier, there, is, there are cutoff scores that help us really group our students. Um, and the assessments that we see, if we're going to be using Dibbles, it's so precise. You click on the student's name. It tells you the sound that the student had difficulty with. So what you do with focused um, instruction is you teach the, the sound that the students having difficulty with. So it's very prescriptive in K through three. Teachers understand how to use that and how to use the zones of growth. But it's being able to scale that up to the other grades. But we would use something similar, but something that's appropriate to that developmental level because students are already coming in feeling disillusioned and, um, and feeling like they, uh, they are not hopeless. successful in school because they're not reading. It's hopeless, hopeless, hopeless. Okay. Um, it's gone back and forth now, so I'm just going to ask it because I got lost a little here. The interventionist teacher will work with students. Okay. So that's more like primary promise then because the primary promise teacher worked with students. Right. Okay. Because uh, I thought the interventionist teacher was only going to work with teachers. No, no, no. That would be coaches. And, okay. and with the coaches, we will plan to support them when they're school funded. So we do have an approach for that one as well. 
I too wanted to add my two cents for a, an additional person in the classroom. If it's an instructional assistant or a teacher, I don't care who, but when I was teaching kids in ninth grade who were not reading at all, having an extra person to read with them was very critical to success. Um, also, I think it's important to uh, get a, a notion about um, more, I, I, I think we, we could all use a memo because all of this came through about the staffing levels and who's paying for what and how many schools, a little bit more carried out. I'm not gonna ask you to do it now. Um, and I would also like to know that we are going to be working on the notion that says that we're never gonna get out of this problem as long as our class sizes are as large as they are. I mean, if the truth of the matter is, is that if, if TK is what, 12 now to one? Is that right? Okay. If we maintain 12 to one for three years, we'd have no non-readers. We'd have no non-readers. If we could afford to have class sizes in TK, kindergarten, first and second grade, everybody would be reading by third grade. I, could, I absolutely believe that's absolutely true. The real problem is that nobody in Sacramento gives a damn. They really don't, because a lot of their schools, the kids are not having trouble reading. That's the truth, that's the God honest truth. Uh, if every school district had 70% of kids that were low or very low income, funding for schools would be very different. So I, I just wanna keep saying over and over again, any ways we can reduce class size is going to make a difference, particularly in the primary grades, particularly in the primary grades. So I don't know how we keep looking at that, but I think we need to keep looking at that. Finally, I wanna say that I think that it's important to understand that most teachers after third grade have never taught reading. Not just middle school and high school. When we tried our reading program at Dominguez High School in Compton, there wasn't a single teacher on our entire staff, including me, that had any experience with teaching reading at all. Uh, I think that it, the mo most important things can be taught to other teachers about how to at least help youngsters who are not reading well, who are mixed in with your classroom with kids who read some and read more and read a lot. I think that's the final thing. Finally, I would like to say that I, my granddaughter who is leaving her fifth grade and now going to enter middle school next year, in first grade, was broken down into small groups with three teachers all teaching first grade, dividing up the kids. It does not take an intervention teacher to teach people how to group kids with the existing teachers. And that's particularly helpful for grades three, four, five, and six. So I hope that some of what we're doing is saying to them is that some of you won't even need a coach. You find the one that's the strongest with phonics that has the phonics group. You find the one that has the most success in their own classroom with doing uh, the Dolch 500 words, you know, and learning uh, sight reading words, you give that teacher that. In other words, that's what they did. They grouped those kids across first grade, and then they grouped them in second grade, and they grouped them in third grade, and in third grade they started Primary Promise, but her school didn't get it anyway. They were already doing this for several years because they came to the conclusion if they divided up for about an hour a day, the kids to, with different problems all in the same grade. And then the, you know what they did the next year? They put kids who were in different grades who had the same problem. Ah, oh, that was incredible. So there could be a first grader, a second grader, and a third grader who were all still having problems blending. We're in the same classroom for that hour. I'm simply saying I hope we are going to spend a lot of time helping particularly elementary teachers understand that they may have right there amongst themselves, yeah. as this one school did, without any help, if someone can help them understand how you make decisions on which kids go in which groups and how to move them from one group to another, that's really all they needed because my granddaughter's elementary school just did it. And it's why, even though they have a very large number of kids that are low income, she's not, but they do, their scores are pretty good in reading because they've done this for years now. Right. I just, and I, I say this because I wanna reassure the public that this, this is not genius. <laughs> We're not talking about you have to be a genius. 
we're talking about seeing that different kids need different things, and if they miss a piece of it, particularly in the early grades, you got to get that piece filled in early. And I just hope that we can help people understand that this is very important, but we're not going to be successful with everybody that we want to be successful with until we can get K-1, 2, and 3 down to about 12. Now, I was a part of the team in Sacramento that got it down to, I think, 26 or 24. I can't remember. But they, even that was twice as big as, they, as it should be. So the, class size is critical at the earliest grades in particular. And I hope that we can continue to advocate in the richest state in the richest country in the world that it is criminal not to spend enough money so that every kid that goes to school learns to read by third grade. Thank you very much. Just uh, a final comment. Let me thank the board, number one, for the time you dedicated to this critically important element. Thank staff, uh, Dr. Carla Estrada, Dr. Francis Baez, and, and the entire team including the data folks that didn't really get to, uh, to speak much. Uh, I also want to spe uh, thank uh, the, the speakers. Um, I know there is angst out there. I think we laid out the realities and why the need for the shift. Not abandonment, not dismantling, a shift, an enhancement, a shift, an evolution. Um, and I will close with some of the elements you just detailed, uh, Board President Goldberg. There isn't one single cure-all strategy in education. Yes, small size works. Yes, differentiated instruction with rotations within the classroom works. Intervention works. Before, after school academic support works. Enrichment works. The rotation of students between teachers in the school on the basis of extreme skill set associated with teachers works. Departmentalization of elementary schools works, allowing for specialization in literacy versus numeracy and the students rotate. All those strategies work. What we're attempting to do is considering the financial reality is using all of those best practices, provide the necessary professional development this coming summer so that next year we significantly expand the number of students touched by interventionists. You're absolutely right. We have teachers at the upper levels at the elementary school that need a retooling of their own skill set. That's what we have envisioned. We spoke very little as I close about, we, you know, interventionists by definition in what we do provide direct services to students. Then there are coaches. Those provide direct services to teachers. Our approach envisions both. Intervene with the lowest readers, with the lowest math performers at the earliest possible level with the smallest ratio of professional to student. At the same time, lift the skill set of all teachers so that at one point we don't require intervention because it is adequately done based on the skill set at the school site. And I agree with you, Board President, we don't get there uh, and without the necessary investments from Sacramento to reduce those, reduce those class sizes. The last statement I will make is this. We want to reach academic prowess. We will not assess or intervene our way to full student mastery. That does not happen. Intervention is not our sole strategy, nor is assessment. It's improving the skill set for all teachers while simultaneously intervening with the lowest performers in our district. I really appreciate the time that you've devoted to this, and I want to thank once again, and not only the parents of the community-based organizations, but particularly the teachers who spoke on this matter. Very much. We will now go back and do the uh, consent calendar speakers, starting with item number five, uh, approving a representative to the Los Angeles Regional Adult Education Consortium. David Tokoski, come on up. You'll have three minutes to speak once you begin to tab, speaking to tab five. Thank you very much. Pronounced Tokovsky. All right. 
Thank you very much for that uh, thorough instructional discourse. Um, you have before you an item about the adult division, which at one point in LA Unified was over 200,000 students. Today it sits at about 60,000 students. But whatever the fresh face leadership, the fresh start in the adult division is very important to have a good vision. The appointment is one thing. Being part of the consortium is probably another question to raise. Whether or not you should be associated with the four partners and whether that yields anything for the adult division in this district. Number two, uh, for, your, for your memory, Montebello, which is in receivership as part of our partnership. Burbank and Culver City, which are the recently departed leadership of the adult division. And LACCD. I don't think any of them share, as was pointed out, about the poverty levels. Number two, the Workforce Investment Act, or WOA. 26 cities, the county and the city of LA have disproportionately over the last decade or two robbed the money from the public school districts, okay? And so if you setting up the compacts with these cities, one of the items on the table ought to be what are you doing with the WIB money to help students in the district? Number two, the key point of uh, parent education. In the adult division, we used to have a large connection with the adult and early ed. There's a program called the SRLDP where parents were in on the fifth day of school in the classroom uh, with the teachers doing what was happening and it was a, um, it was a fully credentialed teacher, very often a senior teacher, experienced teacher in that role. Number three, I strongly suggest as you've set out a goal for early ed of 10,000 students to grow that we set the same thing at least with the adult division, that over the next year we should see 10,000 more students. And that's a metric. Above all, we'll be going into an election year and hopefully there'll be a bond or some other item on the, the adult division students are voters. Every single one of our folks in adult division are key. Convene our congressional delegation with the adult division, Maxine Waters, is the name of one of our adult center locations. She's still in the Congress and she's fiery as always. Dick Slauson Center is in the city of Bell. Dick Slauson led the Fe Labor Federation. And above all, we hope we'll have an immigration bill of some sort in the chaotic year ahead. And that has meant at Evans Adult School, a 24-hour school, if there's an adult division uh, uh, that has an immigration program, that would be very important to citizenship and to the voters. Thank you. Thank you for your time. And as a matter of parliamentary procedure, can we move the consent calendar to be heard? Oh, yes. There's a motion and a second by Mr. So got Mr. Schmerlson moved and Mr. Melboyne seconded. Um, okay. And the second speaker as to tab five, the approval of Los Angeles Unified School District representative to the Los Angeles Regional Adult Education Consortium, Nalita Mendez. Are you here? Nalita Mendez. You are not here. Okay, this brings us to tab seven. Um, this is for the submission of the 2023-2024 consolidated application for categorical aid programs. Is Maria Luisa Palma here? Yes, sir. Come on up. You'll have three minutes to speak once you begin. Good evening, board and committee members. My name is Maria Luisa Palma. I'm sure you've all been informed that last week, the District English Learner Advisory Committee, the DLAC, presented the following motion on their formal agenda. The DLAC committee does not certify the consolidated application and opposes having the president's name appear on the consolidated application due to lack of meaningful consultation of all low-income parents and English learners, in addition to not providing training in the understanding of the legal assurances, evaluation of Title I, II, III, and IV programs, breakdown of funds, and disconnection of DLAC with the ELAC committees in the schools. Now, as we all know, 
The California Education Code 64000D states, the consolidated application shall include annual certifications by the School District English Learner Parent Advisory Committee that the application was developed with the review and advice of that committee. Therefore, these parents are telling you there was a lack of meaningful consultation with them about this giant batch of information. Let me show you some of the documents that were presented to them, scheduled for about a two, two and a half hour presentation. The assurances and certifications. Okay, now this is a 14 page document with 107 assurances. The actual federal LCAP addendum that goes along with the consolidated application was not presented to them and it was not included in their information material packet. What was included was this packet with a link to that LCAP addendum. However, when you go into this link here, that LCAP addendum is not presented in Spanish. And remember, this was the DLAC committee. Now, what was included in that packet was this. This is a review of the LCAP addendum. Now, when you go through each of these pages here, you can see, sadly, that there is no math. There are no totals to any of these amounts. There are words, there are numbers, there's a mishmash of terminology. In some places we have a, a number with an M, in some places a number with a million, in some places a number with a K, sometimes we have thousands with some zeros. So aside from that, these are just expenditures. Even though they're not clearly delineated, they're just superficial listings of how the money is divvied up. This is all about the uses. There, is, there are no results of any of these programs that are being paid for with these categorical funds. No results equal no accountability. How can parents know what goes into these programs if they don't know the results? So would you accept reports like this? Honestly, any of you who receive financial reports, would you accept something like this? This was a learning guide. 20 M, 8.7 M. Now we have a 624 K. Is this how you receive budgets? Any of you, would you accept this as a professional budget? And yet this is the type of information that's provided to parents. And parents are then supposed to just certify the consolidated application. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your time. Marcella Garcia, I see you signed up to speak online, uh, but I don't see you online. Are you here in person? Nope. Uh, Paula Meneses, I see that you signed up to speak Remotely, are you in the room? Because you are not on the screen in front of me. No? Okay. Um, Norma Gonzalez. Madam Chair, while he's doing what he's doing, I'm concerned about the report we just heard. Do the parents get something that we don't get? They get an abbreviated or altered version of what we get? I mean, I'm very concerned about what I just heard. I mean, I know we can't respond, but I, yeah. we need to look into Somebody needs to look into that. What okay. are they getting that we're not getting? As she said, would we accept that? I don't know what they have. That's true. We're not aware of what they got. So right. I think that's the first question is what did they get? And if it, and if it is not clear, maybe it wouldn't be clear to us either. Yeah, it's a good we're question. We're not any better than they are. If they can't figure it out, we All can't right. either. Let's ask the superintendent to uh, look into what the materials were, uh, whether or not they were available in Spanish as well as in English. And, uh, and how does that compare to what the board gets uh, in terms of information about uh, the same topic? And, and from okay. whose uh, office do they come? Is that um, Antonio Placencia? Yeah. OK. okay. It, it's, uh, yeah. it's actually Veronica Reguin who will. <laughs> yes. Oh, the Con app. Oh, OK. We'll get you the information. OK. Though. All right. Thank you. We're not, we're not sure uh, what information you got, but we're going to find out. And then we'll see what we can see. And to unravel the onion, Ms. Uh, Palma, if you want to send any documents to my office, you can send them to me and I. Uh... It's on the DLAC website. Wonderful. We'll find it. Thank you. Go uh, ahead. OK. Uh, Norma Gonzalez, I see that you signed up to speak remotely, and I think that you just joined us. I see your telephone number. Norma Gonzalez, please press star six to unmute yourself, and you have three minutes to speak once you begin. Norma Gonzalez. Norma, I see you. There you are. 
Please go ahead, Ms. Gonzalez. Sí, ¿sí me escucha? Oh, lo siento, sí, 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 se escucha. Sí, buenas, buenas noches, mi nombre es Norma Good Gonzalez. evening, I'm Norma Gonzalez, mother with four students. Two of them are English learners. I'm an active member of DLAC as well. And I'm a parent that is concerned that is not being, we are not being given information to fellow parents as far as the consolidated application and one single presentation they wanted to do it and it wasn't correct. There should be a specific group assigned to talk to us about this, this consolidated application since this group this group should give all the information, not in just one single meeting so that the committee can approve it, but rather it's something so important for the district and for the parents. You can't use the parents to just approve something without being properly informed. There needs to be a parent group with accurate information and not be limited to just one meeting so that it can be signed and approved. I don't think that should be done. I think these funds should be distributed appropriately so that the parents are aware of what's happening, not just in the last meeting of the DLAC com committee to approve because that shouldn't be so. We should be given ample amounts of information and a specific group dedicated to this. Please listen to parents, those of us in this committee and in a meeting, you want to talk about that. So it's not appropriate. Thank you. Thank you. Eva Mays, are you here in the room? Eva Mays, come on up. You have three minutes to speak once you begin. Good evening. <clears throat> My name is Ava and I'm a psychiatric social worker in LCSW serving in the Black Student Achievement Program. Today I'm here to discuss my support for the approval of item number seven regarding the consolidated funds. This is pertinent to my role as approximately, as these approximately 500 million in funds must be used appropriately. And PSWs serve primarily Title I and SPED populations. Uh, Carvalho, you also mentioned that 20% of Title I funds are going unspent. Um, today, I will talk about how the proposed cuts to non-school-based PSW positions will sabotage the current infrastructure of school mental health, compromise our legal and ethical ability to provide mental health services in schools, lower the quality of care that students and families receive, and ensure that the goal of fully staffing LAUSD schools with mental health services will not be met. This plan is so short-sighted and dangerous, and it opens the district up to immense liability. These cuts will impact the quality of mental health care for students and families in the, in the following ways. Staff retention. New and unlicensed PSWs need clinical supervision in order to maintain the legal and ethical requirements stipulated by the Board of Behavioral Sciences and by LAUSD policy. Without the current infrastructure for hiring, training, and providing clinical supervision to new PSWs, they'll be forced to leave the district or work out of compliance with the BBS. Also, seasons and seasoned and licensed PSWs who've occupied the 50 plus mental health consultant and CCNS PSW roles will likely resign because they've been demoted. They can get a job anywhere due to the demand for mental health services providers post pandemic. This is over 300 PSWs that have a good reason to leave the district with these proposed cuts. A goal of, additionally, number two, a goal of a PSW in every school per the newly signed UTLA contract by July 2024, the district shall have centrally funded a PSW in all schools of 600 kids or more. The proposed cuts are comparable to trying to operate a school with only teachers. These non-school-based positions are essential to the overall functioning of the Department of School Mental Health as a whole. You cannot run a school or department without supports. This point was made very clear during our most recent strike, unless you have forgotten. 
This is not people worrying about their jobs. The clinical supervision requirements are a legal and ethical mandate in place to ensure that students and families get the best care. This plan is robbing Peter to pay Paul, moving 75 PSWs to a school site at the cost of losing as many as 300 PSWs eliminates more than 30% of your school mental health workforce. The math doesn't add up. Carvalho, what do you want your legacy to be? An innovator in public education with the largest school mental health workforce in the United States of America? Or the superintendent that gutted the mental health services for students and families following a global pandemic? Please invest in our students' mental health. Figure out the funding. There's nothing more essential than mental health. Thank you. Thank you for your time. I have a Kim McLean signed up uh, for calling in, but you are not on the screen in front of me. Kim McLean, are you in the audience? No? Okay. Merkisedet Absalon, I see you're over on the wings. Come on up. You'll have three minutes to speak once you begin. Um, if, we're gonna, if you would like to hear Span English translation of what uh, Mr. Absalon says in Spanish, uh, please put on your headsets now. It should be on channel two, and you can adjust the volume by this little dial, outward facing dial on the front of the device. Okay. Funciona. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Mr. Scott, Mr. McKenna. I know uh, Natania and Kelly have left, and Alberto, Miss Jackie Goldberg. My name is Merkisedet Absalon, and I am Israeli, not Jewish, because you can be Jewish two ways. One, you have to practice the religion, Jewish, and other to be part of the Jewish tribe. And I am of the tribe of Issachar. I feel good for you being proud. It's three of us, you, myself, and another person in the back who have our mask on. Why? Not because the, pan the COVID ended, but due to personal reasons. And unfortunately, we are in a enclosed space with a lot of people. Before there was a lot of people, there's very few now. It is protection for them as well as for me. But the rules, somebody imposes them and we have to follow. I'm so sorry, Mr. McLean. Also, hello to you because the people, Ms. Gones and Ms. Franklin, well, I have not had the chance for them to be here when I'm speaking or someone's speaking at the end. Thank you. And about the consolidated application, it's very sad that in the schools that you go to, and I invite you to go to the school that uh, are your schools, they don't even know what that is and what it is for and what it can do. And only in English when many people, and I'm not saying few, a lot, and uh, my partner said it before, they represent a lot of schools that sometimes they don't even speak Spanish. They don't know what the application is for. And so go and visit and take notice. Take notice firsthand. Not that somebody comes and tells you to somebody talks well or bad about it. Just go and check that um, issue. Because how can you approve an application just like that when, yes, last time and like they said, with, like they say, you do it for compliance. And if you divide it into two, you comply and you can lie. And so we have to be uh, lo logical in this because from the bottom, everything moves outward. We want for parents to attend. And many parents tell me, I don't go because I don't understand English. I, I go because I don't understand because of what they talk about. I don't go because of this or that. But in the attendance sheet, even the one that is visiting, they put it there so, so that they can say, yes, look, there's parents. We have to take a lot of things into account. And I have said it several times, last time I said it too, that you have in your grasp the future of the American people. And if you don't do your job well, the American people will demand it one day. This brings us to tab 11. Uh, speakers to the report of correspondence. 
Uh, I have someone named Danielle Watkins signed and up. And let me say right up front, this is a good example of where I'm not sure people actually want to talk about our correspondence. So let me advise you, if you want to talk about something other than our correspondence, we may be asking you to stop. Uh, Danielle Watkins, you're signed up to speak remotely, but I do not see you on the screen in front of me. Uh, Rocio G. Elorza, I see that you are signed up to speak remotely. Are you in the room? Um, and I do not see you on the line, so if you're not here or not online, we're going to move along. And Carla Franco, are you here in person? Carla Franco? Okay, I don't see uh, Carla Franco in the room, and she is not on the line in front of me. Um, this concludes general public comment as well as the item specific comment on the consent calendar. Right, now we are at the part of time where we take questions or comments and we had some on item three, tab three, who was that? We Mr. have um, Go uh, ahead, Mr. Schmerlson, you're on. Good evening, Board President and Superintendent and Board Members. Turn your mic on. A conversation by myself, sorry. Uh, a hands-on approach can be one of the more effective learning methods. So can you provide an example of a lesson through online software that intertwines both classroom and real life? Learning Absolutely. experience. I would Let's love hear. to do that. Okay. So here's an example. Um, we have 15 different industry sectors. Here's one for culinary. Um, food truck entrepreneurship. So uh, you read a little article about how food trucks have become a major method for uh, restaurants, right? Issuing food through a food truck. So the students get to learn about that. Then they get to decide what food they will offer in their truck. They get to look at what um, the business plan will be. Um, so they're doing equations, expressions, inequalities in this. So they're doing math elements. They're also reading research to find out what kinds of trucks have been successful and how. So there's Lexels and different reading levels for students so that different uh, levels of students can access the material. So that's, and then it come, they present their uh, findings about what truck they would create and what they would do with it in their business plan. Okay, so that's a real life experience. Okay, make a lot of money on the food truck too, especially exactly. if they have good stuff. And we're actually right? looking at bringing a food truck to a couple of our culinary arts schools. Excellent, excellent. Um, another uh, item, item C, was West Rose Therapy and Consultation. If you remember them, that's not. I'm not an item C. That's not you. You're not West Rose Therapy. That's, there you are. That's me. Okay. special education. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So um, West Rose Therapy and Consultation is supposed to address inconsistencies for student support. African American students are over identified as eligible for special ed under emotional disturbance and disciplinary events. So all 25 secondary CCEIS schools were asked about the possibility of participating in a one-year pilot program and 12 schools are volunteering with 120 members of staff participating. That's the background. Here's the question. Can you tell us the differences between the professional development that we currently offer and the professional development that would be given by West Rose? And are the goals uh, largely the same in these uh, professional developments or does West Rose offer a more specific curriculum in this specialized field? Sure, thank you for the question. Uh, good evening, uh, Board President Goldberg, uh, Superintendent Carvalho, and the Board. Uh, so I'll answer just high level the West Rose component. I'll turn it over to my colleague to talk a little bit more about the PD piece. So um, this is part of our CSIS uh, plan that is um, supported by the Division of Special Education. And specifically with West Rose, it was one of approximately 15 vendors that um, applied for an RFP that we had out um, to really target 
alternatives to suspension. So the professional development element is actually three components of the support that, that they're providing. So it's the professional development for all schools, so it's basically like the tier one professional development. And then there's the actual monarch room itself, so the trauma-informed healing space for students to go into as alternatives to uh, discipline um, or behavior referrals. And then lastly would be the coaching and consultation piece. So it, it is a three-tiered approach um, for these 12 schools. So and if you want to add in um, about the sure. professional development. Yes. Good evening, board members. Super and you know offhand hand the 12 schools? Um, actually, yes, I do. Good. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'll start with that. So we're actually looking at um, the Boys Academic Leadership Academy, Crenshaw Magnet, Susan Dorsey Miller, Thomas Edison, Gompers, Hamilton, Bret Hart um, Prep Middle School, Marina Del Rey Middle School, Edwin Markham Middle School, Palms Middle School, Daniel Webster Middle School, and Westchester Enriched Science Magnet. Okay, and so uh, one of the key components of the West Rose um, Monarch Room model is actually that trifecta. So it's not just the PD, of which the PD is a specific component, but the entire package is an evidence-based model that was conducted throughout the, through the University of um, Washington at UW, and the seminal researchers are actually the, uh, em the employees of West Rose Incorporated. So those, the reason it's uh, an entire package is because they're not just training on the PD, there's seven specific modules, some of which we have some partial trainings on, some of which we don't. So, but it's in conjunction with the Monarch Room model, which also includes not just the Monarch Room itself, but the sensory integration components that are actually infused within every single classroom at the campus. So it's a campus-wide model. And then additionally, there is also a evidence-based um, social emotional curriculum that can actually be used in conjunction with other curricula and as we as you may know that some of our secondary uh, social emotional uh, learning curriculum is usually online and this is all hands-on so this is a very different co um, integrated um, model sounds great sounds great thank you thank you very much oh. Sorry. Oh, sorry, just a quick question. So I noticed that 12 of the 25 schools volunteered for this program. Mm -hmm. Just for um, options like these, is, is 12 a good number or, I mean, is that? For, for, for the size of our CSIS plan, which is it's 60 schools total, 12 is pretty good. So for a little more than half of our secondary schools, I'm thinking that that is a good model for us to actually make sure that it is providing the results that it purports. And then we can, of course, and the other piece I did want to mention is that it's a sustainability model, so it's built on sustainability. So they're not, you, they're not proprietarily using those PDs. Once you're trained in those PDs and coached in those PDs, those same people can go out and use those PDs to train others. Thank you. Okay, thank you. If I might, just on the same item so you don't have to keep coming up. <laughs> Come back. Sorry. Um, would this involve the restorative justice program at all in any way? Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it actually is founded in restorative justice practices. It is specifically to address the school to prison pipeline, which is what it disrupted in its uh, original form, which is uh, the reason it's called the Monarch Room is because the Monarch was the mascot of a all girls um, black African American um, school in New York that had a, a horrific um, suspension and expulsion rate. And so this model was specifically used around restorative practices, and that's its foundation, around also positive behavior intervention supports. So let me say, Mr. Superintendent, I hope that in the fall we can have a report about where we are in implementing restorative justice in our schools. Because as I visit the schools in Board District 5, I find everything from wow, they're just doing everything everybody's involved to. What's restorative justice again? So I, I think we have uh, not got it together, but as long as this is going on, maybe we could use this as an example and then give us some idea in the fall about how we're going to actually make restorative justice in this district more than in name only. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Mr. Okay. I just didn't want to have him come back twice. No, don't come back twice. Okay, thank you. Um, Judith, this is for uh, Dr. Maholtra, unless you could answer. Uh, it's item D. Vive 
concierge. Oh, you're here. Wonderful. I didn't see you. Vive concierge or vive concierge. Vive. Yeah. So this is a pilot immunization compliance tool. I'm going to save you the, the, this part. Uh, uh, the contract provides a platform for parents and guardians to upload a child's immunization records. It will allow nurses to communicate with parents and guardians and provide them with resources to access immunization locations near their school. So it seems like the uh, pilot program has been in place since April. So the pilot program has not started yet. Oh, has not started it's yet. It's going to start okay. in August and go through December. Okay, then I'll ask another question about that. Does this program connect with the parent portal and Wellagent, Wellagent do you um, know? So it, it is not, it's separate from the parent separate. portal. It's a uh, freestanding application okay. that um, provides like a dashboard on immunization compliance for our nurses. And have we decided what schools will be part of the pilot yet? Um, we're still, it, it'll be for every school in the oh, district. Oh, good, actually. good, excellent, yeah. excellent. Okay, thank you, thank you. Thank you. I have another one, Any Jackie. Any other questions on the- not, not for me, how about you, no? Okay. Well, I have another question. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay, so this is for interpreters, unlimited. And this is to provide a written translation and oral interpretation services for student health and human services for working with parents and families. The services will be provided by content area experts in translation and interpretation. So I think everybody knows it's not easy to be a translator or an interpreter. Not an easy job at all. P oh, okay, Ms. Escudero, can you explain why the service uh, is needed given that we do have interpreters in the district, don't we? We do. It's an item that actually was recommended that we bid out for, and this vendor has worked with us in the past, and it's really a wonderful uh, service. It's immediate, on demand, that we call a number. No matter what the language, they provide interpretation services. So when someone's doing a home visit, or we have a parent at a school, and we need to even have a long therapy session or just um, minor questions, we're able to immediately speak in, in unison with interpretation services. But I still think we could use more district interpreters right here in the building. Well, that's true. That They can't do it. It's overflow. And it's, it's really a capacity that's um, during school hours. It, it's used in multiple um, areas at the same okay. time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. So Mr. Melvoin is back. Should I continue or give him a chance? Finish. Oh, oh no, 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 no. Okay, this next one is for um, item O. Accenture LLP, Mr. Catal. Okay, and the uh, idea of this uh, item is to provide security operations center as a service. 24 seven comprehensive security monitoring malware monitoring and security information event management to support the district's cyber security program. So this contract is uh, 13 million. Uh, my question is, instead of always having to hire outside contractors to perform the job, can't we train more and hire more IT staff? And how, many, and how many additional employees would we need uh, so we can get this work done in-house? Nine, 10, 20, how many would we need? Uh, the work um, need a special skill and training. Um, in the current condition on the market, um, the security is very a scarce commodity, <laughs> especially as a skill of the technicians. Uh, we have vacancies open for higher level engineers and for the entry level as well. At this time, we are running a temporary month-to-month -month contract for the vendor to perform the same function. Um, one of the reason that, um, one of the process that we implemented post cyber attack to be able to be aware of any movement within our network 24 seven, and we didn't have this function before cyber attack. Now, we are doing it through temporary, and this contract allows us to do that in the ongoing. Eventually, if we build capacity at the end of the cyber program, there is a possibility for us to build in-house in resources to be able to do this function. 
But until then, we rely on the vendors and contractor to help us. Okay, thank you. So our security is pretty good with us because every time I go online, I have to call in and has to call me back. So I know that's working. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Katal. Thank you. That's it, Jackie. Thank you. And I just had one um, que question on, I think it's uh, item BB. Um, and I've asked it privately, but just for the benefit of the public, this is a relatively large contract for um, buses. And I just want to uh, understand why we can't find an electric bus service to contract with. And so I see Mr. King, if you can maybe answer that. So this is item BB, the Student Transportation of America, just why these are propane buses and why we can't use electric. No, thank you for the question. So that is part of the planning for our future <coughs> requirement for our contract vendors. The intent was um, to have the district roll out our first electric electrification plan and then based on our learnings and best practices, um, mimic those uh, expectations with our contract vendors. And also to know in the background, um, even if we were to move forward with this expectation for this contract vendor, um, again, uh, some of the challenges we're working with with our utility partner now is the power doesn't exist currently. So just sharing some of the details we're managing through the Sun Valley project, our first yard to be electrified fully. Uh, they've committed to give us power to that yard within two years. So in, in, while our utility partner is working in that direction, the district is working internally at that yard at the same time and we're gonna do a project meet kind of coordinated effort. So with that said, um, it would be a long-term effort for our contract partners to even get to that level. So, but the short answer to your question is that is part of our future plans. So in the short term, it's the infrastructure and charging capacity, which is somewhat outside of our hands, but we're working on it with those partners, DWP and others. And then longer term, these contracts will come with electric buses in coming years. Is that correct? Right? Understood. Okay. Thank you. Just real quick, do these buses have Wi-Fi? The contract vendor buses, no. All district buses, yes. Anybody else? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I just had one question on item M, which uh, has to do with um, the uh, FSA. And, and really, we only have 700 employees in enrolled in dependent FSA? Anybody coming up to talk to me or am I talking to myself? Okay, I'll talk to myself. Let me say what I'm worried about. This is a great benefit to be able to deduct costs for your child care for all kinds of things. How could there possibly be only 700 people in our district that know about it enough to feel like they can try it? Um, there are some strict guidelines um, involved regarding dependent daycare flexible spending accounts. You know, employees have to plan very carefully their use it or lose it type of funds. And we do conduct a comprehensive communication campaign during the open enrollment where all employees receive communication on the um, FSAs and the enrollment um, instructions. Um, but it's, it's a voluntary benefits and I understand okay. it's a great I, benefit. I, I would yes. like to urge us to do more than just send a bulletin or something because Absolutely. Uh, a lot of people spend a lot of money on children and child care and other things which are eligible. Not everything is eligible, I know that, and you could lose it, but we could give them some guidance and say, first year, aim low, mm -hmm. and see how that goes. And if that worked, then pick a little higher number. In other words, I, I, this is an enorm enormous benefit that our employees must not understand well enough to try. And I'm just saying I'd like us to see if we could have in the next open enrollment period a lot more effort in telling people how to do this well, how to do this in a way that you go low so you know you're going to spend it all, and then next year see what else your expenses might be. But this is an enormous benefit savings in terms of people's uh, IRS, and we all pay, you know, income taxes. Uh, I think it would be really useful for us to do something more than we've been doing. That's Absolutely. all. Thank you very much. I think it's a Thank wonderful you. program. I'm just sorry we're not uh, doing that. Okay. Now we've done two. We've done three. We're skipping four because it's not on consent. On five, we have Scott. Yes. Okay. 
Um, so we have been part of LARIC for a few years now. I remember when we weren't part of LARIC. Uh, so I'd like to know if you could send me some information about an update through the accomplishments, and I know you're new to our district too, accomplishments and initiatives we've been able to support by participating in the consortium. And I think we have no choice. We have to participate in the consortium, so we have to make the best of it, right? Uh, what are some of the challenges and uh, any solutions? If you can do it off the top of your head or give me an informative, whatever you like. Um, off the top of my head, I could tell you that through LARIC, we've been able to develop curriculum, um, coordinate interdistrict PDs for the teachers multiple times a year, um, secure an articulation agreement with West LA College and Venice um, Skill Center for the year um, dental assisting, and sharing programs across the district the member districts, as well as work with the state to, to shape policy around performance data. That Lyric assists with, being part of it. Then I won't ask that question. So positive, positive, okay, good to hear. Mostly positive. Mostly, thank you, good <laughs> okay. to hear, thank you. Welcome. All right, and unless I'm mistaken, that's all the questions on the consent calendar, which includes items two, three, five, six, seven, nine, ten, and eleven. We will now have the vote since it's been moved and seconded that we will vote on the consent calendar. Let's go ahead. Dr. McKenna. Yes. Dr. Rivas. Mr. Schmorlson. Yes. Mr. Melvoin. Yes, except on item three, uh, on tab three items D and P, I'm refused. Yes. But yes on the balance. Okay. And do I hear Ms. Gonez? I think we got a vote from somewhere else, Ms. Gonez. <laughs> so many votes. <laughs> um, uh, I'm a yes and a no on tab three item BB. Okay, so you're a yes on everything except tab three item BB, is that right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Ortiz Franklin. Yes. Uh, Board President Goldberg. Yes. And uh, student member Mr. Shen. Yes. Okay, now we have left item four, and I'm going to ask Mr. Vel Melvin. I'd like to ask this a moment, please. A I'm point, sorry. Of, point of order. Um, I wanted to really ask a question about BB because I heard a couple of people vote no. I voted yes. But I wanted to ask a question. Is it customary to have the number of extension years for a contract exceed the time of the actual contract? That was one of the, uh, on BB. They gave an extension for the contract before, and it goes, the extension is beyond the actual contract. Is that normal? We're almost there. Are you asking if it goes beyond the five years or the, yeah, the original? Uh, on item BB. Oh, on BB, student transportation? Yeah, it is, uh, wait a minute, let me get it here. That'd be the way toward the end. Yeah, BB's got the. What number? What page is it? Uh, at the top. Page 135? Yeah. I can go that far. That far. Yeah, it's your 81. It's 81. This one you're asking about this question. Okay. Contract term. Contract term goes from 7 uh, July 1 of 23 through June of 26. And asking for authorization to exercise renewal options to extend contract for up to seven additional years. Right. Okay. Now I understand. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'm um, sorry. So, so we did, we're doing it for three years. Um, 
and but we have the option by law to extend it another seven up to seven years if we if we choose to. I think the goal is to you know start to transfer to electrical when that's possible. So we're only going for the first three years at this point. But if we do need to extend it, we bring it back to you. So and, it is uh, an option. It's not a uh, you're not extending something that hasn't right. been we're not uh, performed yet. Right. Okay, that, I'm okay then. Right, thank you. My, my vote of yes stands. I have the clarification I needed. I believe we have concluded the vote on the uh, um, consent calendar. And now, Mr. Melvoin, you wanted to take uh, number four off because you had some questions. Yeah, and I just, and maybe Mr. Salcedo, so uh, tab four, um, item T. My understanding from the briefing is that part of this is to increase the capacity of a contractor on disposal of hazardous waste. And I understand that some of that is asbestos and stuff that we need to dispose of, but some of that may be excess hand sanitizer that many districts purchased. And I know that the EPA, there are some guidelines around uh, reuse or donations or recycling or reclaiming and potentially pulling out ethanol for fuel. And so. It would be my hope that before we spend money, but also just dispose of all this, we could find other uses. And so I'm curious on the feasibility of that, and then uh, would request that before, if we exhaust all those alterna alternatives, before we dispose of anything, the board is informed so we can reevaluate. Re so I'm just curious if that's possible. Yeah, you have my commitment, I, I think, in talking with staff. We're going to exhaust all avenues to look at, you know, donations, recycling, and ways to reclaim any of the sanitizer or any other waste um, when it comes to the disposition of, of hazardous waste on, on some of our sites. And when you look at this contract, it, it goes beyond just hand sanitizers. It's um, asbestos and other hazardous waste that's required to maintain our requirements away around wastewater and et cetera, various programs. Um, the one thing that I want to just provide reassurance is that should we um, engage in this particular contract for the disposition of sanitizer, we will provide an informative to the board before we utilize it. Great, thank you. I mean, I think, I know that the, this board in the previous years has like donated old buses to a province or a state in Mexico and just other creative ways to take no. things that may not be on their code here, but are there. And so that's what made me think about it for the hand sanitizer and I know there are ways to uh, reclaim the alcohol and use it as fuel. So I appreciate that, and that was, I, I pulled it because I just wanted to get that answer, and I could have, I guess, just questioned it. That's so, right. anyways, thank you, and You're without assurance, to do that. yes, I appreciate it. So that was my only question. To pull <laughs> okay. All right. And and Mr. Hovatter, you know that that uh, hand sanitizer is a very good stripper for tiles. Have you ever seen at schools where the kids are using that? There's spots all over the floor that eat all of the. Um, wax, I guess. So you may want to consider using it to strip floors. Okay, All thank right. you. All right. I, I, I had a couple of questions on item B, the outdoor classroom, uh, uh, which is at Telfair. Not really about it, to be honest with you. It's about the factors that it says uh, in the, uh, at the uh, paragraph on the bottom of page 142. Proximity and access to existing green space, that's a good criteria. And then evidence of parent, administrator, and staff commitment to the success of the program. I worry about that as a requirement or as a prioritization because there are a lot of schools that don't have active parent groups and yet need this very much. So I'm wondering if, how much, how much do you really count evidence of parent, administrator, and staff commitment to getting a $2.9 million early education improvement in your school. As it turns out, for these 20 projects that are going to be funded under the program, it wasn't a factor at all. Okay. Um, all 20 projects are within the top 35 of the greening index, and the ones that were not selected, the 15, are getting other greening projects that are equal to I'm, or I'm more than this. I'm not complaining about that they got it. I'm complaining about that particular criteria, and you're telling me it didn't matter much. I worry about criteria like that, though, Understood. because I have schools where I have very active parents, and they'll be right out there in front. They may not be this high on the scale as others that don't have those active parents. The other question I had was on item C, as long as you're standing there. 
It says provides the removal of three classrooms in relocatable buildings, but constructs three more specialty classrooms. And then it calls for flexible performance classroom suite, support spaces, an outdoor amphitheater, covered stagecraft, storage area that will be designed, and on and on and on. How do I get one of these from my school? $23 million? Is there a list? Is there a criteria? I'm, I'm not joking. Uh, at, at this time, we don't have a program specifically for these types. This was a one-off selection that was, that was proposed over four years ago, and we were um, directed to design, and then a year and a half, the project was approved by the board at the All time. Right. Okay. Um, my final question, I have nothing to say about that. Uh, uh, let's see. I think that may be it for me. Thank you. Those are my two questions. All right. Anybody else have any questions on item number four? Kelly or uh, uh, Tanya? Ms. Ortiz Franklin, Ms. Gomez, item four? Hearing none, a motion's in order on item four. I'll move it. Moved by Mr. Melvoin, seconded by Dr. McKenna. Call the roll. Okay, so let me just repeat. So moved by uh, Mr. Melvoin, seconded by Mr. M uh, McKenna. Right. Okay. Uh, Dr. McKenna. Yes. Dr. Rivas. Mr. Schmerlson. Yes. Mr. Melvoin. Yes. Ms. Gonez. Ms. Gonez. <laughs> yes. Okay, Ms. Ortiz Franklin. <laughs> yeah, sorry, that was mine. <laughs> <laughs> and board president Goldberg. Yes. And board student board member uh, Shin. Yes. Right. Passes. Well, at 7:26, I think we've run out. Are there any adjourning motions? Well, I we have the oh, oh, oh! I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, we were going to do two more um, of the, one more. Okay. Okay, go ahead. UTK, right, absolutely. All right, I'm going to skip my usually uh, lengthy introduction. UTK, critical importance to us. We're celebrating the fact that uh, for the 23-24 school year, we'll be two years ahead of the state mandate to have UTK in every single elementary school. And the two gentlemen before us will tell us how we're going to do this and the moral imperative uh, behind adding 10 to 11,000 UTK children to our LUSC roles. So, Mike Romero and Dean Tagawa. You better believe it, Superintendent. So, good evening, uh, board members and Superintendent. I'm Michael Romero, the Chief of Transitional Programs, and I have the honor of supporting our early ed division. So, uh, Dr. Dean Tagawa and I, um, we appreciate the opportunity to share with you how the district has provided expanded opportunities for UTK for all four-year-olds for the next school year. Uh, Dr. Tagawa will give a little bit of brief background on UTK. He'll share some of the enrollment, student enrollment numbers for this year and, predict, and uh, projected student enrollment for next year. And then I'll close it out just sharing some of our outreach engagement with families to make sure that every family knows about this great opportunity. We're gonna start off with a brief one minute video, uh, board members, that will give you a flavor of a typical UTK classroom and our precious UTK students. And it was, um, it was at a press conference that our superintendent held just recently and our state superintendent, Tony Thurman, joined our, our superintendent where they were showcasing and celebrating the LA Unified work of being two years in front of that state mandate, as Superintendent mentioned. So can we share the video? Today we're talking about universal transitional kindergarten in LA Unified. Kids need a chance to be with other kids. They need a chance to make friends, to play in the outdoors, play alongside other kids. And all the socialization skills that come along at an early age, it's really important for them to be able to come in and have a place to do that. By 2025-2026 school year, every single elementary school across California must have these programs. The big announcement here today is that Los Angeles Unified, based on bold decisions to empower the youngest learners in our community, will meet that deadline two years ahead of schedule. 
making sure that they're in school every single day, universal meals, providing the early education. Um, when you put all these programs together, you spell out a way to make sure that our students are well prepared for the future. Uh, we're proud of you here at LAUSD and the state of California stands behind you every step of the way. It's funny, in my notes I had written good afternoon, but let me start with a good evening. Uh, good evening, everyone. I, <laughs> I want to share a little bit of background, and I'll go fairly quickly through this, but I don't want to rush through it either. Um, California has a master plan for early learning and education, and that master plan really is a blueprint for how we're going to move the state of California ahead to make sure that every three-year-old and four-year-old has access to a pre-K program. Now, the way it's done, and you kind of look at that third bullet, is through a mixed delivery system for our four-year-olds. Four-year-olds this year have access to a variety of programs. These include California State Preschools, Head Starts, private providers, family child care homes, and universal transitional kindergarten. I'll touch a little bit on the board resolution that really helped us push this forward. And that was authored by, at that time, Board President Kelly Gomez, who really kind of put this resolution in place and it helped us accelerate the work within LA Unified. As we look at why this is so important, it's all of these documents really speak to, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here when I talk about the importance of early education, but the research, the expansion of universal pre-K, fulfilling our board resolution to make sure that this happens in LA Unified, and to make sure that we're providing universal transitional kindergarten in 23-24, and again, as stated earlier, two years ahead of the state's timeline. And why? You know, why is this so critical? And why is this such a big deal? Because, again, research has shown, and we've noticed it even in our own district, the Independent Analysis Unit had done some serious research. They looked at how our kids were doing, kids who had attended an early education program, like Transitional Kindergarten, and then they compared them to how were kids doing that did not have access to a program. And so the results are there. So we, you can look at it. We know that they significantly outperform students in math, writing, and reading in kinder and first grade. Within the Dibbles, the Diagnostic Basic Inventory of Early Literacy Skills, we can see the results in the kids who, again, who attended one of our programs, outperform kids who didn't have access to a program in kinder, first, and second grade. All of these things help to close those opportunity achievement gaps that everybody was really talking about early, earlier today. And so when we look at it, what's key to me is this last bullet point where we looked at the work effort and social emotional skills on the students' progress reports in kindergarten, and we see that they're doing better. They know how to share. They know how to work with adults. They know how to relate to one another. They can persevere and stick to a task. And so these are those kindergarten non-cognitive measures that we know are going to benefit them as they move into adulthood. So these critical pieces are things that we're working on. And again, at, at the conference, it was really interesting because a reporter asked, why is LAUSD doing this two years in advance? And Superintendent Carvalho came, why not? This is critical, this is important. Let's get our kids enrolled, let's get them started, let's make sure they all have access to a seat. So um, as we look at the next slide, I wanna talk about because we're growing and because we're doing this and we're implementing this, I really wanna draw your attention to that first blue side. And if you look at that first blue side, you'll see that there are, th in this current school year, there are 317 elementary schools that have universal transitional kindergarten. In those schools are 13,804 year olds, or kiddos that are sitting in those classrooms right now. So for this year, 13,800. If you look at that second side, that I think, I don't know, tan salmon colored side, um, you'll see that the first row there, you see 317 elementary schools. These are the same 317 elementary schools. In the next school year, 23, 24, we're expecting about 14,000 kids in those programs. It's not a lot of growth within those schools, but it's because they're already doing it. They're already implementing it. So Master Planning and Demographics is asking, there's a few more kids coming in. That gets us to the 14,000. Then you're gonna see an added row where it says 171 elementary schools with UTK. 
That's an important note there because these are schools that have never had universal transitional kindergarten. So this is new for them. And those 171 elementary schools will bring in 10,000 students. If you do the math, it's around 58 students plus or minus in each one of these schools. So that gets us to that big total of 24,000 kids. And again, 24,000 seems like a lot of students. That little gold box at the top, that gold box represents 25,000 kids that we currently have access and space for. So when we look at our classrooms and when we look at the space that's available at our elementary schools, we have space for about 25,000 kids. I am pretty confident that at this point next year when I stand up here, I can tell you we hit that 24,000, we hit that 25,000. It's a lot more kids coming in, but I think it's a really important piece. Um, and let me shift a tiny bit of gears and then let's go to the next slide because the next slide I think is also really important. These are our early education centers. We have 86 early ed centers across the district. We have 89 state preschools, which are located on our elementary class, on our elementary campuses. If you notice, you're gonna see that right now, our 86 early ed centers have about almost 8,000 kids, um, and our state preschools have about 2,100 kids, right around 10,000 kids in our early education centers and our state preschool programs. We have capacity for about 14,000 kids within those, both of those programs. We're seeing a lot more three-year-olds enrolling into those programs, and we know that kind of moving forward, that we're gonna have some space, that we're gonna be able to fill with more three-year-olds and more four-year-old programs. I think what's important to hear here is that in September, at Norm Day, there were 5,700 students only in these programs. Now we're over 10,000. So the upside to this is that both of our universal TK programs are growing, plus our early ed center-based programs are growing. And there's a good reason why that's happening, but I'm gonna turn it over back to Dr. Romero who can talk a lot about the messaging and the communication work that's getting us there. Dr. Romero. Thank you, Dr. Tagawa. Um, and so uh, we, we have a target of 25,000 students UTK next year uh, and we want to talk about some of the things that we're doing to uh, provide information for our families and reach out to our families so that our families know about these opportunities and we maximize every seat available. Uh, so our regional superintendents and our COSAs and AOOs recently have been very supportive and all of our elementary principals have done a great job. Uh, this is a messaging toolkit for administrators that's already been implemented by all elementary principals as of the week of May, May 15th. Uh, so we had shared with our principals, kind of like on a silver platter to help them, they're so busy, to say here are some slides and here's some messaging that you can put up on your website to share about these opportunities and to share on your social media post. Uh, we even gave principals, here's uh, something you can put on your marquee, uh, that, uh, you know, calling all four-year-olds. Uh, we've done the standard Blackboard Connect messaging for our principals in English and Spanish, but not only the telephone messaging, but also the emails that can be sent out and the text messages that can be sent out to families. So we've done this and we're going to do it again when our principals come back on basis in the summer. Um, flyers I'll talk about in a second. Repro Graphics did a great job of reproing and printing out flyers in English and Spanish that went to all schools and went home with every elementary student a couple of weeks ago, UTK through fifth grade. On the right-hand side, you'll see banners at our elementary schools with the same information. So we're asking principals, and we hand-delivered it to schools, where they would put that banner up in a very prominent location where there's a lot of traffic for entering and exiting a school. Next slide. And board members, I just want to draw your attention to the flyer itself. That went home recently as I shared with every elementary student. We wanted not only Blackboard Connect messages, text, and emails, and marquee, but we wanted an artifact that kids took home in a backpack, took home in a folder, that a, f a parent would say, hey, what is this about? Maybe it ended up on the fridge. Maybe they shared it with uh, brothers and sisters and family members or grandparents about that. But board members, I want to draw your attention to the brown box where it says community representative 
outreach and targeted areas. And so Superintendent Charge does, this summer we are going to be recruiting community reps. And we are gonna train them like it's an I attend campaign for attendance. But what they're gonna do is walk neighborhoods surrounding our targeted schools, knocking on doors, leaving these flyers and information about we want you to know about this opportunity. Uh, we've begun to plan, we're actually planning further tomorrow, uh, what is the distance around the school still to be determined, how many will we recruit, um, and um, I want to share too, we're starting with our schools, the 66 elementary schools that are part of our 100 prioritized schools, so definitely around those schools. Also, Superintendent asked us, and uh, Veronica Ottagine and her team did a great job. Superintendent asked us to look at zip codes in our school communities that had the highest birth rates, like where there's a lot of babies being born. And we went back to 2019 and we identified areas. So right now we're gonna match up those zip codes with high birth rates to our targeted group of schools and that's gonna be our starting point this summer on there. So there'll be more to come. And then the last, Talking. Sorry. <laughs> Too tired. The community reps, are they from the schools in the area? They're the, uh, they're the paid community reps in the schools? Yes. And what we're planning actually tomorrow, and Antonio Placenci and his team in PACE, and Pia Escadero's team and Elsie Rosalvo, they're part of that team. Uh, we're going to make a de uh, decision how we recruit community reps because it's really going to be opened up. It doesn't necessarily have to be a community rep from that school. There might be community reps that are going off on vacation. But they're hired already. These but are hired people. They're hired. They're already our community okay. reps. They're not, uh, right now, they don't work during the summer. But right. when we recruit them and say, listen, there's an opportunity, we'll pay them. Okay. We think there's going to be a lot of folks that say, hey, count me in. I'm willing to do that. And that's true. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And then I just wanted to share here. You might have seen in the office communication. Thank you so much for your support. This is uh, right now on buses. You'll see information about uh, preschool. You'll see bus stops. You'll see billboards. And then our district white fleet, right-hand bottom side, Real soon, you're going to see our district white feet with the same type of information driving from school to school. And then the last slide we wanted to share, it is our, it is our website. It's the Early Ed website. And if you type in, if you Google in LA Unified Transitional K, LA Unified Universal Transitional K, EEC, all roads will take our families to this website. And it's a, it's a one, two, three on how families will enroll their students. We wanted to be one, two, three on that. Uh, we have um, a unified enrollment site for number one. It's actually a really good site. You just plug in your address and it shows all surrounding schools around your home that offer UTK. Number two, we tell parents, once you know your neighborhood school, just call the school. We have the number for them, we have the address for them, but we say walk on in for the enrollment packet. That's always the best way to do it. And then number three, parents can uh, register online and that's the website for that. But again, we really recommend that they walk in. The 1844 number that you've seen uh, for early ed, 1844 early ed, I just want you to know that the uh, ITS team uh, we have 15 customer support agents that we've trained and we practice with, um, and that's where that, those phone calls go to those uh, district trained folks uh, that we think is very helpful on that. Um, board member, superintendent, that was our brief presentation, and we'll open it up to any questions. Any questions? I just have a, not a not question, but I, well, I do have a question. First of all, I, I'm impressed. I've been, I've been, pushing for this a long time about marketing and the reason that yes. we don't have people. I mean, these kids are not just getting born because people are getting pregnant faster than other people before. They've been out there all the time. We just haven't gone and found these children. And the other schools are advertising all the time. They've been advertising since January. And we're sitting here waiting on school to start, and they're already running summer schools. So we're competing. We have, we have people that are 
we're all after the same children, the same age. So I'm really excited about this. And I'm glad the superintendent gave you like a little uh, a way to match them up and do some research on the birth rates and on where they're in the zip codes. I really hope that this works. The other thing is, I, I still don't know the answer to this because I'm not a reading teacher. Assume the hypothetical that we get enough students, a large group of students in second and third and fourth grade, and they are reading on grade level by the fourth grade. What do you know about the ability of a district, this district, to hold that, that, that competency into the eighth grade? Or do they deteriorate because the teachers are different that they go to and they're not as skilled as the kids get older at the upper grade levels at, at sustaining the reading level? I'm reading at grade level on the third grade. I'm at Doesn't the fourth happen. Grade. If they're reading at grade level at third grade, they're going to be a reader. Yep. So they're not going to deteriorate. Well, I think you'll find at some point when you get into uh, the comprehension in middle and high school, that's a different question. They, but we're, we're so they still be able to term, read. Long term, long term, the kids that are reading by third or fourth grade remain readers. They'll make, They'll make it. Okay, I understand learning to read is different than reading to learn. I got that. But the assumption is what you're telling me. The reality is that. If you learn how to read on grade level at the third and fourth grade, that when you get to the fifth, sixth, seventh, and middle school, you'll still be able to read at grade level. You might not be performing as well because you're not focused in all of those other. There's a lot of reasons why, you know, adolescence sets oh, yeah. in and they stop or concentrating. Adolescent. But they can read. Yeah. And they don't need another reading teacher because they know how to read, know how to sound it out. Know how to sound no, the differentiation words. after about fourth or fifth grade is really the depth of comprehension. Yeah. Do you understand implied got statements? It. You know all of those. It. Yeah, statements. I got it. I got it. That's that. the I difference. But they're readers. If they if they're reading at grade level in third and first grade, they are readers. They can stay read. They're, they're, Absolutely. They're lifelong they readers. They don't lose it. Okay. I, I just want some verification of that. I thought that was possible, but I didn't know it was being done because I've seen too many kids that are in middle school and still can't read and can't comprehend words that are more than one syllable type words. They're in the seventh, eighth, getting ready to go to ninth grade and walk into high school, high school. with this burden of, I can't read. Uh, how did that happen? Who let that happen? The system, we can blame it on a lot of things, but blaming is not as important as repairing and fixing it. Straight. But I'm, I'm so glad you guys are on this and are seeing this as a mission. The major thing to get these kids in, get them, get them in. However you can seduce them, persuade them, influence them, threaten them, whatever you have to do, to get them to send their, get their kids into the schools so we can help them and the family as well. And the advertising is a great idea uh, from, from the buses to whatever we put out there that can say, here we are, here we are, here we are. Bring it, bring, you know, bring, the, bring the children to us. Let us have them. And let us save them. Thank you. Thank you. A um, few quick questions. So, one, yeah, thank you for the effort. This is all very exciting. The, on slide uh, six, I guess. So, it's June 6th, and we only just have projections. So, how many students have actually enrolled? What hard data do we have? How many students have enrolled for TK? for the 2023-24 school year. Right. Uh, right now, it's less than 1,000. Uh, board member, I want to share, we, we have a protocol in place, ready to go, uh, where we will track enrollment per school, per region, uh, per director. And um, I, don't, I don't want us to panic on that less than 1,000 right now because Typically, this time of the year, as families come in to enroll for UTK, they complete an enrollment packet. And in many schools right now, including for kindergarten, the office staff has the enrollment packets. This is the time when most schools are starting to input into MISIS those enrollment packets into July. Also, what delays some of those numbers initially, um, when those parents come in, our principals and our office people say, you have to get your shots. So 
we tell the families you have to get your shots and then come back. So it delays a little bit of that. But our projection as we get into July and certainly into August, you'll see those numbers blossom. So just like we did last year. So the 24,000 students by August 14th or 15th is realistic? Uh, well, the 14,000, and uh, absolutely, because we did it this year. There's 14,000. We'll do that again for those 317. For the 171 new schools, uh, when Master Planning and Demographics does a projection of that 10,000, they're pretty in the ballpark for that. Now, but the headline uh, board member is, it's not enough. What we shared, the campaign and coming back and doubling down and even getting smarter on how we reach, we must do that to get us to that 24,000. That's critical. And it would be helpful too, I don't expect you to have the data on you now, but so like the 13,800 students from last year, I assume that the number of kindergartners at those 317 schools was at least double that. And if there are five in kindergarten, those kids existed as four-year-olds the year before. So I'm curious too, just to, it would be helpful to have a comparison of those numbers to figure out how many, even in our schools that have had UTK, how many f are coming at five, but they're not coming at four, and why? Um, so I don't know if you have a ballpark, but just thinking about, you know, I know you mentioned looking at the demographic data for birth rates, but understanding how in district boundaries, how many three-year-olds, four-year-olds, five-year-olds, six-year-olds, and what percentage we're capturing would be really helpful for goal setting and... Um, Certainly get smarter with that, absolutely. Yeah. And then I also think it's great that we're doing stuff at our schools for folks who have siblings, but I want to make sure we're really doing outreach at preschools, daycares, um, both the licensed and the unlicensed. I mean, every community, because that's where, you know, if you go to an elementary school, you have to assume that there's someone with an older sibling or like an older child, or that someone's coming in really ahead of schedule to look for options, but where the kids are now who are going to be eligible for this starting in two months, they're in pre-Ks and daycares and all that. So I want to make sure we're being aggressive there. And then finally, I do, I love that we're utilizing all the ad channels. I think some of these, you know, if I just, saw, if I saw a bus going by that just said, see me in school, I would not know that that meant my four-year-old was eligible for TK. So I just want to encourage us, and I'm not a marketing expert. I think some of these do say, like the banner has in pretty small print, elementary school starts at four years old. But that to me is the top line message that people don't know about, because that's what we're doing that's new, that we're ahead of the state. So I just would want to make sure that it's like really catchy in terms of what's different here is people know they need to enroll their five-year-old. Not everyone does, but they should. See you in school, I mean, it's a cute campaign in terms of um, pictures of kids and enroll, but I think the salient piece is that we want people to know if your kid is four, for the last 50 years, you couldn't come, now you can. So I think really highlighting that um, would be important. Kelly? Bonus? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, let's make sure you can hear me. Sure can. Um, well, thank you so much for the presentation. It's really exciting to see the impact of the resolution um, this coming school year and about half of the work uh, reaching fruition. And uh, to Mr. Malvoin's point, I, I really appreciate the clarification. Um, Dr. Tagawa and um, Mike have seen me advocating for those four words, um, well, both free and starting at four years old. Like it's essential that we include both of those components because if you talk to a parent who doesn't already have a child in LAUSD, they might not know what transitional kindergarten is. That's not a, a term that's necessarily accessible for a lot of families. And so I think it's really important that we spell that out. I appreciate that uh, the phrase is there um, on the flyers and banners, but agree on um, the marketing in general. And then um, just a few questions for me, um, as well as kudos uh, to both of you for all of this work. Um, where do we expect them to come from geographically? And if you can speak a little bit more to how are we targeting uh, our highest needs communities and, and populations um, who can most benefit from TK? So let me start with the uh, recruitment efforts. I think what we're seeing already and what we're hearing from our principals, because these 171 schools largely exist, and I'm going to call out Board Member Schmerelson and Board Member Melvoin. A lot of your school, a lot of your schools did not have universal TK in the past. So we're getting a lot of calls. We've held four 
um, town hall meetings or informational meetings with our early ed, our, with our elementary principals in those areas to help them with marketing, helping with them understand. And then we held an additional two meetings at the just recently where they could drop in and ask their questions around universal transitional kindergarten. But we are seeing a lot of growth, especially in Mr. Melvoin's districts and Mr. Schmerelson's districts. And I know that because of the number of calls that we're getting, because of the number of requests that we're getting from principals, the number of clarifications. So kind of looking ahead, I think those areas, you're going to see a lot more kids coming in this year. And the reason why is those 317 schools were targeted in areas that um, did not have early ed programs, that did not have, they were um, a lot of our Title I schools. And so that was a big piece in starting there in that first year, making sure that all of those communities had those programs. And so um, to that point, you know, the 13,800 kids, it's probably going to grow to 14,000, but you're going to see really big growth in, in um, I think it's Board District 4 and Board District 2 for this upcoming year. Thank you. Could you share a little bit more about how the district plans to build workforce capacity to meet the needs of a larger population in UTK? So we're pretty excited. One of the things that's, that's a big benefit for being LA Unified is we do have a large workforce. And so we do have a lot of teachers who are already eligible and meet those TK qualifications of having taught a program, um, having 24 units in child development, or an equivalent child development permit. So we're in a good place with our teaching force. Now, does that mean every school has a, has a teacher that meets those TK qualifications? We may find that there are a few schools that do not have a teacher, but district-wide, we've been assured that we have almost 960 teachers that meet those TK qualifications that we can take and move into one of those locations that we have it. The other really exciting thing is that we ran our first early childhood micro-credential last year. We had 20 participants, 17 of them got through the entire year with us doing that micro-credential. We spent a lot of time on the early ed environment, the preschool learning foundations, and so we have a lot of, uh, of expertise in there. We're probably expecting 50 additional candidates this year so that they can kind of meet those qualifications through a micro-credential. And then um, I'm going to lastly say is that um, over the summer, we're planning summer PDs for these teachers who are coming in. We have a couple days that we're looking at already to promote and provide training for new TK teachers. And then we already have five asynchronous courses online for TK teachers that they can take now and four additional courses that are related to early education that they could take now. So there's a lot of work going around. And I don't know if uh, uh, Dr. Murrow wants to speak to it, but we're also doing teacher summer institutes. And so that's going to be a big lift to do all of this and make sure that they're prepared. So, um, Kelly, are you done? I wasn't sure if um, Dr. Romero was going to share about okay. the Summer Institute. I was, just, I was just gonna say uh, yesterday, we completed our third day of what we call a retreat with the EEC leadership team for planning uh, our Summer Institutes for teachers. Um, and beginning to think, as Dr. Tagawa talked about, how we're going to differentiate for our new teachers. So in early ed, 20% of our teachers this year have taught less than two years. So we have a large chunk of new teachers that will differentiate. So it'll be a little bit of a different game plan, a real intensive way of approaching it, not only this summer, but every week, uh, every month, winter break opportunity, spring break, as Dr. Bias talked about. Uh, also, um, half of our early ed principals have been early ed principals for less than five years. So there's going to be a lot of deepening their content knowledge and pedagogical knowledge and their leadership skills uh, as well there. Thank you so much. Super exciting. Um, and then just one last question on the outreach, and, and then I have one comment. Um, I really appreciate the comprehensive marketing effort. I, I think it's it's great that we're uh, channeling both media, um, but also kind of word of mouth, utilizing our, our parent reps. I think it's it's an exciting idea, and I'd love to join the canvassing efforts, so please call on me. Um, just uh, two thoughts on additional opportunities for outreach. Have we, have we thought about, or are we partnering with um, local community organizations like YMCAs, Boys and Girls Clubs, parks, et cetera, to, to further reach um, our family population? Um, and then also, have we considered direct 
mailing as well. Uh, we have not discussed direct mailing, but that could be a, a great opportunity for us. But I wanted to share uh, partners and outreaching, and I didn't share it earlier, but superintendent has charged us uh, to connect with LA Chamber of Commerce, uh, the ports, uh, LA World Airports, elected officials. Uh, so Martha Alvarez, governmental relations, in fact, we were texting today about her support, but um, our, the president of the LA Chamber of Commerce, uh, President Salinas, she's already shared that your messaging, in fact, we emailed her the flyer and a little script. She said, I will share this with our membership and that I'll really advocate so that our LA Chamber members share with their employees. And it's all around in our early ed centers, in our early ed centers, you can have your child there from seven in the morning till six at night for working families. I mean, there's a lot of great opportunities. And for the UTK schools, uh, those are regular hours, but our UTK students are now gonna be able to be part of, of uh, the Beyond the Bell program into the late afternoon. So for working families, not only is it great academically, but it's also supportive there. Uh, we've reached out to uh, point folks for LA World Airport, so I'm assuming they'll come in. And we kind of piloted, just in the last couple of days, reaching out uh, to local elected officials. And I'll give you an example. Uh, our, con our new councilman, Tim McOsker, representing the south end of LA Unified, he says, you got it, Mike. Uh, this in the flyers, I'm putting it up on my website. We'll have copies in our office. So there's more to come on that question and how we take advantage of partners. Scott? Oh, oh I'm sorry, I, I thought you were done. No, just one comment. I'm sorry. That's all um, right. No apologies. Thank, thank you so much. Um, that's great. That's great to hear. Um, the, the one piece I just wanted to add, you know, in terms of thinking about the resolution and um, where to go next, obviously the expansion of, of TK is, is a huge piece of this, maybe the crown, uh, the crown jewel of our, of our efforts and it's exciting to think about the 24, 25,000 kids being served. But of course the resolution is also focused on our three-year-olds. So I look forward to more opportunities in the future to talk about, you know, how we continue to leverage our early education centers to serve more three-year-olds and, and two and a half year olds since many of our four-year-olds maybe attending elementary school-based programs now, as well as how do we collaborate with family providers, home-based providers, um, other providers of early care, because we know, you know, we can't meet the, the universal need alone. Um, and that's, a, that's another big piece, just to make sure that there's continuity of care and collaboration for our early learners in Los Angeles. Um, but thank you so much. All right, Scott. I will take the magnetic sign for my car. Just make sure you have the right phone number on there, clear, so people can see, and they don't stop me in the car and ask me where. Just make sure you have the right phone number, and I'll be happy, really, to use the magnetic sign on my white fleet car. Who actually thought about that? Actually thought about that? You, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll, I'll do take it. it. I'll You'll do it, it too? Okay. I'll and I'll, I'm going to share again. Our superintendent just the other day said, Mike, think about a bumper sticker that we can put on the back, uh, the bumper of our district vehicles. Right. He said he'll put it on his car, like, you know, calling all four-year-olds. <laughs> and then we thought about something magnetic on the side, too. Mr. Shin, did you want to speak? Just out of curiosity, I was asking Mr. Schmilson whether, like, the UT kids, K kids are, like, potty trained. Like, how many teachers do you need in the class to take care of you know, a class of 20 kids. So, well, they aren't 20 kids. How many? It's 12, isn't it? 12. It's, it's 12 to 1. So there is a, a full-time transitional kindergarten instructional aid and a teacher in there. So, but I will tell you, as a former kindergarten teacher, one of the first things that I made sure that I planned in my schedule were potty breaks. Right. And I think it's really important. And the teachers we talked to, they know that, right? They know that they're going to make sure that they make sure that there are potty breaks built in, especially for our four-year-olds, because some will do a little bit better than others, but um, we, we do know that they need to make sure that that's part of the schedule, for sure. But, yes, yes. Okay, uh, I just would like to say, wonderful, thank you very much, but also that I have been working with a couple of uh, early ed principals in my district that have doubled their enrollment just by walking around their school. So this is something that sells. When I was in the state legislature, I can tell you the biggest complaint we got from people all over the state was how to get 
daycare or child care for four-year-olds, five-year-olds, at any price. And it, they were willing to pay anything they couldn't find it. So to have this, I don't know why the signs don't say free in very large letters. Because when I, when, when I was talking to these two principals and these EECs, they said the two biggest questions they got was, how much do I have to pay? And I don't have documents, can I come? We need to make sure that people know that you don't need documents to come. And we need to make sure that they know that it's free. And I, so whatever you're going to do in publicity, I think we need to make sure that's incorporated. Now, I don't know about you, but in my neighborhood, if you want to find little kids, you go to the park on Sunday. OK. Well, the zoo less, because it's expensive. No, no, the zoo less. The, the, you go to the parks in my neighborhood, in Echo Park on Sunday. You go, you go to the, the, in Highland Park on Sunday morning, sun, around 11 o'clock after church. Everybody there is eating. You can sign up 1,000 kids at most of the parks in my neighborhood on a couple of Sundays. So what I'm saying to you is I think we need to really specifically ask board members and other people, other electeds, where are the children when they're out and around during the summers? A lot fewer go to the beach because a lot of them can't swim. Uh, and then we're never taught to swim and had, never ever had a chance to learn to swim. Are, are we still doing the public, the pool program and teaching swim? Oh, that's great because we got so many kids who can't swim it's in, in, in Los Angeles. Really? My God. Uh, but, but I would say that, that just literally going around the neighborhoods and particularly to parks uh, on Sundays, the, the number of children that I see that are under five is hard to believe. Uh, so they're there, they live, they're, they're around, we just need to get them signed up. But this sounds great, I'm very happy to see this. And, uh, but let's get free for sure on posters. Everything should say free. Okay, or put a sticker on it or something because those, when I talked to those two principals, those were the two things she said she had to explain to people is no, you don't need to have documents and it doesn't cost you anything. Okay, ah, McKenna, Dr. McKenna. Yeah, um, just a couple of suggestions. One is in Scott, uh, we, we, being principals, we know this is true. If you, when you talked about uh, mailing, hard, hard copy mailing, using U.S. mail, a lot of those kids don't live where we think they live, so you're just kind of taking a chance on that. Probably better to do electronic, doesn't cost you anything. Uh, and if you get them, you get them. Another suggestion, when you talked about putting a, poster on your car, and we were talking about board members, we have the company car. I'm not a tax expert, but I used to do taxes. I know that you can deduct the use of your car in business if you have a sign on it that says it's part of your business. So if the teachers, anybody, just puts it in some magnetic, you don't have to stay on there, how many hours a day and how many hours do you spend on it, you put that on your tax and tell, you, tell your CPA or your, if you go, you go to a your tax preparer, they can deduct a portion of that, just like you know, home and business, uh, the use of a room in your house, you, you have to know how to do it, but you can do it. So if you have so many hours a day, you drive around, you say, I'm advertising for the district. I'm shopping, but I'm also advertising. <laughs> and uh, you can deduct that from, I know you can do it, it's legal. Most people don't think about that, but if you're actually using it to, to, to uh, solicit a business for the district, and you can prove you're doing it, and you got the you got the magnet. Take a picture of it. This is what I'm doing. So everything we can do to get people engaged in this, driving around with these signs that don't cost a lot to put on, and it shouldn't be something you can't take off because you don't have to. You know, you can't. Yeah, magnetic, magnetic. You can take it off at night. You don't have to do it. Put it, leave it on as long as you want to. Just a thought. But thank you, thank you guys for the, the, the yeah the creativity. Well, I got a lot of ideas. Some of them are illegal, but <laughs> Dr. McKenna. <clears throat> Dr. McKenna. Thank I'm you very a, much, gentlemen, uh, and have a good evening. What's left of it? I'd like to uh, adjourn this meeting in memory of a dedicated educator who was a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Tony, T-O-N-I, Humber. She and I were friends for over 40 years. Uh, passed away on May 11th at the age of 77. She had been, uh, I went to her ceremony. 
She had been an educator in LA Unified. She attended 96th Street Elementary School, Samuel Gompers Junior High, and graduated from Washington Senior High. Received a Bachelor of Arts degree in Sociology from California State University, a Master's at Loyola from Loyola Marymount, and a Doctorate in School of Sociolinguistics from Howard University. Um, she was a, she previously taught in the LA Unified School District for 18 years and served as an educational advisor for eight years in the proficiency in English program for the black learner who is culturally and linguistically different and nationally recognized program addressing the cultural and linguistic legitimacy and needs of Ebonics, African American vernacular English speakers. That's when the programs were first coming out. She was a pioneer in that. She was not only focused on the African American, she was very interested in um, the, the history of Mexico. So she did, a, she was an, a lifelong adventurer. She traveled extensively throughout Africa, the Caribbean, Brazil, Panama, and Mexico. In 1995, as a Fulbright Hayes scholar, she traveled to South Africa to observe the social and political transition after Nelson Mandela became president. Um, she went to South Africa more than once. The African diaspora in Mexico was also developed from her 2003 sabbatical uh, research and subsequent journeys to Mexico. She designed the, um, it was called the Where Black is Brown. She wrote a paper on that to further the understanding of African influence and contributions in the Americas and foster greater understanding among African American, Chicano, Latina, Latinx, and ind indigenous communities and their historical connections. Uh, she was honored in many ways by many universities and institutions. She passed away from, from cancer. Um, she had been vibrant all her life. She was a surfer. She was active, a fit woman. She, you never know, you know she was older. She was. She was so active. And her students loved her. Um, let me say a final thing about her personally. I knew her. The primary word I guess I could say about her, she was authentic. She didn't tell you his story and pass it off as history. She gave you the real stuff that went on in this country and other countries, the connection between the brown people, the black people, white people, slavery, all of that. She traveled all over the world trying to get information and wrote books about it. She educated me in ways I didn't think I could be educated because uh, I wasn't that interested in it. But when you hear her speak, she was fascinating. She was funny make you laugh, uh, keep you interested. She was dynamic. Sadly, she passed away at the age of 77. I was grateful to have known her, and uh, I'm grateful that I lived in the, in the time of Tony Humber. Nice. Sounds like a remarkable person, really. He was. Now, it, there's like an article in the person. last week's edition of The Sentinel, if you want to, uh, last, last week. It come out on Thursday, and it's uh, the, the uh, July, June 1st, and it, there's a picture of her in it and all of that. And I, I, observe, I uh, excerpted some of the stuff from here. And I could talk about it longer, but I, this, I just wanted to pay tribute to her because she deserved it. And she was one of ours. She was at a unified, educated as a child, came back and taught, and then went into the university. She, she was a professor at Caltech, uh, Caltech uh, uh, Polytechnic University, Cal State Polytechnic. Thank you very much for bringing that forward. Thank you. Okay, let's take a look at the time. It is 8.12 as we adjourn. I want to first thank all of you in the back there for hanging there in there with us all. We appreciate it. I want to thank everybody behind me for hanging here with all of us. And the four of you left out there in the audience, thank you as well. Five, excuse me, five, sorry. Let me remind everybody that we have an 1140-page uh, meeting next week. And so if we end at 8.10 with a, only eight items on our agenda, we're going to have to be very well prepared. We will start, I'm doing this because we are starting the board meeting next week at 11 a.m., not 1 p.m. So I wanted to just say that publicly to anybody who might still be tuned in uh, because uh, they may think that we're starting at 1. Because there's so much on the agenda, we will be starting at 11 a.m. Thank you very much, and this meeting's adjourned.